37205. Jack the Bodiless, The Galactic Milieu Trilogy, Volume 1, by Julian May. Copyright 1991 by Starricon Productions, Incorporated. All rights reserved. Read by Roy Avers. This book was originally created for audio cassette playback. Any announcements concerning cassettes do not apply to this recording. This version contains markers allowing direct access to major portions of the book. Library of Congress Annotation In the 21st century, many of the Remillard family members are self-rejuvenating. The oldest is Uncle Roger, and the others are descendants of Roger's dead twin. After Roger's comatose nephew's death sets in motion horrifying forces, Roger, young Mark, and Mark's baby brother Jack must fight the evil. Although Jack's mind is the most powerful, his body is mysteriously vanishing. Strong Language and Violence, 1991 From the Book Jacket The year is 2051. A lengthy and difficult period of adjustment has finally yielded worldwide peace on Earth, freeing humankind to dedicate itself to nurturing the metapsychic abilities that some among them have begun to develop. Led by the Ramayar family, the people of Earth are about to take a step toward a new golden future as full members of the galactic milieu, a confederation of the astonishingly varied worlds spread across the galaxy. But somebody, or something, has a different future in mind. It calls itself Fury, and it is fiercely determined to stop the Ramayars from carrying out their plan for humanity. Only two people know about Fury, Roger Ramillar, the chosen tool of the most forceful being in the milieu, and Roger's nephew Mark, the greatest metapsychic yet born on earth. But even they are powerless when Fury begins to strike down the members of their family and other metapsychic operants, devising the murders so that the surviving Ramillars appear to be the chief suspects. Death among the Ramillars mounts each murder more shocking and bizarre than the last. But now a new life is added to their ranks, and the birth of Jack Remillard may herald the next step, at once dazzling and terrifying, in human evolution. The powers of Jack's mind are stronger even than those of his brother Mark, but they are equaled in strength by the lethal genes contained in his DNA, genes programmed to destroy his body, cell, by cell. Jack the Bodiless, a novel of grand sweep and imagination, is the first in a brilliant new trilogy. Telling the story of Mark's youth and Jack's childhood, it brings us to the threshold of a new galactic civilization where human beings, struggling to understand and control the superhuman powers that will define their future, find themselves struggling as well to protect the life of a child who may be the only being capable of ensuring the future for them. About the Author Julian May was born in Chicago in 1931. She has written numerous books, including The Many Colored Land, The Golden Torque, The Non-Born King, The Adversary, Intervention, The Surveillance, and The Meta Concert. Julian May lives in the state of Washington. Dedication. Un le bon copain. Enfin. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. My soul knows how marvelous are your works. You were aware when my very bones were formed, growing secretly inside my mother's body as a plant's root grows beneath the earth. You knew me before I was born. The days of my life were all written in your book before they had ever begun. Psalm 139 Whereas in the familiar closed systems of physics, the final state is determined by the initial conditions, in open systems, as far as they attain a steady state, this state can be reached from different initial conditions and in different ways. Ludwig von Bertanafi a system's view of man. God writes straight, with crooked lines. 
Spanish proverb. Prologue. A snow grotto, planetary park. Kananoktok territory. Sector 14, star 14-661-329. Sikrenurk. Planet 6, Denali. Galactic year, La Prime, 1-400-644. 17 May, 2113. It was a dark and stormy night, as so many nights were on Denali, where topography and climate conspired to produce some of the galaxy's worst weather. Worst from a human point of view, of course, unless that human was addicted to Nordic skiing. The mind of the supervising Lylemic entity named Atoning Unifex smiled as its material essence hovered above the blizzard-lashed park. Denali was a rugged planet, wintry throughout most of its year, the veritable haunt of the great white cold celebrated in a certain earth song that was very familiar to the first supervisor. On most of Denali's continents, glaciers and permanent snowfields spread wide amidst a fantastic landscape of dazzling peaks, black precipices, and crags that thrust up like the broken tusks of primordial monsters. Denali had no sapient indigenous life form. No rational creatures had as yet evolved on it when it was assigned to the human polity by the world evaluators of the galactic milieu. Its most famous honorary native son, St. Jack the Bodiless, was conceived before the first Earth settlers arrived. The hardy people who originally colonized Denali in the mid-2000s had hailed from Alaska and other parts of the United States having severe winters. They were quickly joined by Canadians, Siberians, Samoyeds, Laps, and a host of others who craved a life of challenge that could be lived in a setting of wild natural beauty. The world mind those human colonists engendered might have been expected to be as dark and moody as Denali's weather, but for some reason the very opposite mental climate prevailed, and Denali was an invigorating place with an ether that fairly glowed with friendliness and verve. The original rationale for establishing the colony had been the planet's deposits of valuable gallium ore, and this was still a major economic resource. But Denali had also become a popular vacation resort, first appealing mainly to human polity winter sports fans, including the famous Ramayar clan of New Hampshire, and later attracting hordes of like-minded Poltroyans as well. Atoning Unifex let memories crowd to the fore of its consciousness, recollections that had been repressed for eons. This small planet had been loved by both of them. She, of course, had been born here, living and working in the colony's capital city of Iditarod until a fateful tragedy had taken her to Earth, where the two of them had so improbably met. On the very brink of their great adventure, she had spoken casually of her own experiences as a native of Denali, and they had laughed together over the unexpected mutual reminiscences. The shared laughter had come to an end long ago, but the memories remained in a deep level of the Lylemic's ancient mind, guarded and cherished and eventually becoming almost too precious to contemplate. The pain that had once darkened these memories had long since faded, and their scrutiny at this particular time was now actually appropriate. And so atoning Unifex lingered there in the middle of the storm, its mind in a state that a human being would have recognized as part reverie and part prayer thinking of a person who had once been a woman, who had twice loved deeply, and who had mothered unity in countless non-human minds in a distant galaxy. Finally, the Lylemic uttered the mental equivalent of a deep sigh. The epilogue of the comedy was nearly complete, but one waited upon the inimitable Uncle Roger, who kicked at the goad as usual, dawdling while cosmic destiny hung suspended. Unifex focused its mind narrowly on the subsurface snow cavern that sheltered Ragatien Romillard from the raging snowstorm. It saw a hunched, lanky man sitting beside a tiny tent, taking off his ski boots. Like other members of his famous family, Uncle Roger possessed the genes for self-rejuvenation. His face was that of a rattled fifty-year-old, belying his actual age of 167 Earth years. 
His gaunt cheeks were frost-reddened, and his nose and eyes watered a little when he forgot to mop them with a the red bandana handkerchief he carried up the cuff of his old L.L. Bean Penobscot parka. He had tossed aside his knitted toque, and sweaty silver curls straggled over his forehead and ears. He was whistling as he peeled off the archaic twentieth-century ski garb and stripped faded red long johns from a pale and sinewy body. Then he lowered himself with exquisite care into a geothermal pool in the center of the small snow cave. The telepathic emanations from his ever-obstinate and uncoadjunate mind were happy ones. Uncle Roger said to himself, If the storm lasts, I'll forget about the final leg of my trek and call the park's shuttlebug and go wallow for a week in the lodges, apres, ski, entertainments, casino, cabaret, string quartets, the Cullen food, good company, perhaps a new science fiction novel savored in the winter garden while the bar waitrons keep the drinks coming and I check out the snow bunny crop. The old man settled deeper into the steaming water, smiling. Poor Uncle Roger. Unifex had other plans for him, but Roger had had a good enough holiday, ski touring more than 200 kilometers throughout the beautiful park during an unusual three-week spell of calm, bright days. Now the weather pattern had changed, and whether Roger was willing to admit it or not, he was adequately refreshed and recreated after his first stint of journalistic labors. It was time for both of them to get back to work. Unifex descended toward the planetary surface. The negligible physical substance of the Lylmic mind receptacle deflected only the tiniest of the hard-driven snowflakes and easily penetrated a three-meter-thick crust of ice and snow above the grotto where Roger had elected to camp. The place was typical of the subnivian hollows that gave the Denali Planetary Park its name, an irregular cave as big as a good-sized room, melted from the permanent ice field by the heat of a small geothermal spring. The walls and ceiling were ice, but the rocky floor was cushioned with a dense lichenoid carpet of tough gray and lavender saprophytes. Close to the shallow, burbling pool grew larger and more fragile exotic life forms, sessile animals that resembled scarlet onions with peculiar flowers that gave off a pungent, sulfurous scent if they were bruised. As the mildly carnivorous blossoms of the onion creatures bent toward Roger's exposed shoulders, he flicked hot water at them by way of discouragement. The walls of the grotto were cupped and dripping near the ground and glittering with crystals of hoarfrost in the cold upper reaches. There, thin tendrils of vapor coiled golden in the light of Roger's antiquated electric lantern before disappearing into a natural flue. Touring skis were propped against one wall and a backpack lay near the little tent. On the far side of the chamber was the closed entry door, fashioned of harmonious translucent plass that led to the enclosed surface access tunnel and modern latrine. Park visitors were strictly forbidden to dig down into the snow grottos directly, or to camp in undesignated virgin caves except in emergency situations. Here and there on the nacreous walls were circular openings, not quite large enough to admit a human hand. From several of these, and from a larger hole at ground level where runoff water from the spring exited, came a glitter of tiny eyes and an occasional peevish hiss. The natural inhabitants of the grotto, hot-blooded, eight-centimeter ice crabs, temporarily displaced by the human who had come to spend the night, were keeping a close watch on developments. The crabs considered these alien invaders to be a great nuisance, in spite of the fact that they usually brought along something worth stealing. A determined onion flower began to nibble experimentally on Roger's wet shoulder blade. He reached for his backpack, unzipped a compartment, and brought out a battered leather-bound flask. A stiff tot of armagnac and a guided puff of alcoholic breath caused the life form to shrink back from the poisonous exhalation, blanch to a muddy mauve color, and broadcast its disgust on a primitive telepathic mode. The entire plantation of scarlet carnivores desisted from snack attacks forthwith. Roger nodded in satisfaction took another snort, and sank more deeply into the hot spring. Up on the planetary surface, the hurricane wind roared in the darkness, and there was a distant rumble as an avalanche let loose somewhere. The grotto trembled slightly. Ice spicules sifted down toward the bather, glittering until they melted just above his head. 
Roger began to sing softly. For the wolf wind is wailing at the doorways, and the snow drifts deep along the road, and the ice gnomes are marching from their Norways. Unifex joined in. And the great white cold walks abroad. The old man in the pool leapt like a speared sturgeon. Bordel de mad! It's only me, Uncle Roji. Damn it! One of these days you're going to give me cardiac arrest doing that. Laughter. I apologize. It was the old college song. I had been thinking of it myself just as I arrived. It brought back all kinds of memories. Now look what you made me do, Rogi was accusing. His eruption had splashed hot water over the onion animals, and they were flailing in wild distress, the tiny teeth of the flowers chattering like elfin castanets. You know the park rules about disturbing the native life forms. These little chompers are sensitive. If any of them decide to croak, I could be blamed and end up paying a hell of a fine. Calm yourself. Look, I have restored them. Damn good thing, Roger muttered, climbing out onto the not-quite lichens. The clumps of red onions were swaying luxuriously now, and a delicate humming sound filled the grotto. Don't often hear that. It's their full tummy serenade. It was the least I could do. Roger chuckled. Naked and steaming, he retrieved the brandy flask, which fortunately hadn't spilled, and tucked it into a safe place. I'm feeling pretty hungry myself. Want to share some chili cagado with me, mon fantôme? Thank you, but no. Too substantial for your lyomic guts, eh? You used to love it. Unifex's thought was wistful. I don't suppose you brought along any habitant pea soup? Ate the last of it two days ago. The Lylemic's mind sighed. Roger squatted and set up a small microwave camp stove. He dipped a pot of water from the spring, peered into it, and extracted a black gelatinous blob and a glass shrimp that were swimming languidly about the container's bottom. The invertebrates were returned to the pool, and the pot set inside the stove to boil. Roger had tossed in two aquapura tablets for seasoning since Denali bred tough microorganisms as well as tough colonials. So you couldn't resist coming after me. The old man dried himself with a diminutive towel and put his long johns and socks back on. Unifex said, It was a species of sentimental journey. I had felt compelled to avoid Denali during her first cycle sojourn here. Roger hesitated. You want to tell me about the two of you? All I know is the little bit Cloudy and Hagen told me. And they didn't know all that much. Not now. Perhaps later. Hmm. Roger took the seething pot out of the stove and filled two bowls and a large cup, adding a different colored cube to each container of water. After four seconds of effervescence, the highly compressed food reconstituted and the pungent aroma of chili rose from the first bowl and the smell of cinnamon apple cobbler from the second. The cup was full of black coffee. Roger added five lumps of sugar and a shot of armagnac to the latter, and sprinkled almost two hundred grams of grated natural state Tillamook cheddar onto the chili. A sibilant yearning chorus came from the crab holes, and there was a frantic blinking of eyes. Roger chuckled wickedly. Cheeky little bastards. Remember how they used to eat Adidas if you left them outside the tent in these snow caves? Unifex laughed. It said, I note that you wear inedible Solomon ski boots now. Very comfortable looking. I like the new Rossi boards, too. But isn't it rather imprudent of you not to wear an environmental suit? For sissies! I've been skiing my brains out for a hundred fifty years in this outfit, and I haven't froze my bazoon off yet. You'll notice that my wrist calm's modern enough. Keeps me alerted to weather changes. And if I get snowed in, or come a cropper, or even run out of coffee or munchies, the ski patrol or a robot monitor will home in on its transponder locator and take care of me. I knew this storm was on the way. I figured to spend the night here, then call for a shuttle bug to fly me back to the park lodge tomorrow, if she don't blow out as per forecast. 
Wouldn't mind at all spending the last week of my vacation lolling around in style. I'm sorry, Uncle Roger. I've come to collect you. I'm booked for seven more days, damn it! You are well rested and quite able to begin work on your memoirs again, as am I. Take your time finishing your meal, but tonight you'll sleep in your own bed back home in New Hampshire. Back to Earth tonight? That'll mean hopping the hype at maximum displacement factor. I'll be a nervous wreck. I'll take you myself, more gently. Roger's eyes narrowed, and he squinted at the portion of air from which his invisible companion's thoughts appeared to emanate. So, you, Lyle Mick, do have a mitigator for the pain of hyperspatial translation, just like Tijon always said you did. Yes, Jack was perceptive as always, but the device is not yet appropriate for general use among our client races in the galactic milieu. You will make no mention of it. Roger spooned down chili and drank coffee. I wouldn't dream of violating the glorious Lyle McMaster scheme. But what's the damn rush to get me humping again on the memoirs? One has one's reasons. Roger rolled his eyes hopelessly. Then, for some time, he ate in silence, his mind idly recapitulating the things he had already written and shuffling through what would come next in the period following the great intervention. Gonna take another book, big as the last one, to cover the thirty-eight years of the Symbiari proctorship. Be a pain in the ass for me to get all those family shenanigans sorted out, too. Unifex said, I want you to skip over most of that and begin immediately on Jack's early life and disincarnation and the growing threat of human opposition to galactic citizenship. Then you will describe Dorothea's part in the earlier drama and finish up with your view of the Metapsychic Rebellion, making a milieu trilogy. The events of the painful proctorship years, the time before the human polity was admitted to the Galactic Concilium, have been covered well enough by Philip and Lucille in their own autobiographies. But they never knew Jack's full story, or Diamond's. Or yours, mon cher Fontaine, or mine. I'll have to backtrack some to make it hang together, you know. Start out with a kind of retrospective digression. And I'll still need a lot of fill-in help from you to give a proper overall picture. I realize that. Is that why... Roger paused. He swallowed hard, banishing a certain thought before it could be formulated, even sub-vocally. Eh bien, mon fils. I reckon you know what you're doing by now. Beyond a doubt. To paraphrase one of your favorite fantasy writers, even the most modest intellect can hardly help learning a thing or two after six million years. The old man grinned with forced cheerfulness at the vaporous air. Six million? Ah, those self rejuvenating Ramayar genes. A real drag, immortality, eh? Not that I'm ready to knock it myself yet, you understand. Hmm. Do you know, can you foresee when I'm... Not really. Moi, je ne suis pas le bon Dieu. Je t'assure. But I do intend to see to it that you survive at least long enough to finish the family chronicle. Well, thanks all to hell for small favors. Roger licked the last of the apple cobbler from his spoon and drank the dregs of the coffee. Then he switched the stove to the dishwashing mode and thrust the tableware inside. A moment later, he began to pack everything away, singing the chorus of Dartmouth College's winter song under his breath. At length, the Ramayar family ghost said, Are you ready, Uncle Roger? The trip home will take only a moment. There will be none of the usual discomfort of hyperspatial translation experienced in a starship. Not in my underwear, damn it! 
The old man began to throw his clothes back on. He managed his pants and shirt before he disappeared abruptly from the snow grotto and all his gear with him. The lichenoid cast a faint phosphorescent glow about the newly darkened chamber. There was a rustling sound, then a medley of plops as the crab-like exotic animals came rushing from their burrows to scavenge leftover bits of earth cheese. Outside the snow grotto, the Denali blizzard wind howled. Chapter 1 from the memoirs of Rogatien Lemillard. I still have the nightmare sometimes. I had it on the night that I was unceremoniously translated from the planet Denali to Earth at the truncated end of my skiing holiday and commanded to resume writing these memoirs. As always, the dream played itself out in a weird, accelerating time-lapse mode. There is nothing terrifying about the scene at first. A beautiful mother holds an infant, completely wrapped in a blanket, and she looks up from the baby as a fourteen-year-old boy approaches. This older child of hers has a strangely ominous aura about him. He has come hurriedly home from his classes at Dartmouth College on a blustery day, and he wears black turbocycle leathers and carries a much-modified visored helmet tucked under his arm. His eyes are gray and his mind opaque, and his smile is tentative and quirkily one-sided as he accepts his mother's invitation to open the blanket and see his new little brother for the first time in the flesh. The black-gloved hands are trembling slightly with an emotion that the older boy despises and tries vainly to check. And then the baby lies revealed, unclothed, perfect. And the minds of Mark and Teresa mingle in joy. Mama, he's all right. Yes, yes, yes. Papa was wrong. The genetic assay was wrong. Yes, dear, wrong, wrong, wrong. Little Jack's body is normal. And his mind, his mind. Mind? Oh, Mark, dear, his mind. Just speak to him. It's wonderful. Don't be afraid to wake him. The baby's delicate eyelids open. And in my dream, there are no eyes. I hear laughter, and I recognize the voice of Victor. But it can't be Victor, because he died twelve years before Jack was born. And for nearly twenty-seven years before that, he was helpless, disembodied as Jack would be, but unlike Jack, deprived of all metafunction, all physical and mental contact with the world outside himself. In my dream, the devilish laughter fades in a smell of pine and a cataract of pain. Tears pour down Mark's face for the first time in his austere young life. The eyeless infant smiles at us. And suddenly the real nightmare takes charge. No eyes. Only a void, a starless darkness that is somehow alive with fearsome knowledge. My dream races on, and Teresa and young Mark are gone. There's only a pathetic little child shackled to complex life-supportive equipment, and while I watch in horror, his human form begins to disintegrate. I try to tear my gaze away from the awful sight, but I cannot. Faster and faster, the self-destructive process programmed by his own body proceeds. The child's despairing mother blames her own hubris for his suffering, his father, Paul, countering his own pain with clinical detachment, finds the disincarnation bleakly fascinating. Mark sees his first glimpse of mental man. Dennis from Ayar and Colette Roy and other scientists of the human polity call the child a prochronistic mutant, an anomaly born out of proper time, too early in the scheme of biological evolution, a throw forward in the pattern of orderly human development. Four of the exotic races of the galactic milieu, pitying, call the little boy pathetic and doomed. The enigmatic Lylmic refused to discuss his case at all, except for flatly prohibiting his euthanasia. In the dream, my mind is shrieking, No, no, Tijon, no, God, no, how can you let his body die while his brain lives, the brain, the wonderful, potent, super-brain, God, why, why? Then I see the brain naked. 
I plead, let it die too. Let the poor thing die. Stop the machines, the genetic engineering attempts, the futile meddling. Let him go in peace. Let him go. A monster that does not know itself sees the brain as the great enemy. And in a cataract of flame, the machines are stopped. I hear the laughter of the dead fiend again as Victor savors the hideous irony of the situation. For the brain that is Jack the bodiless does not die, but lives. Impossibly, it lives, impervious, sustaining itself in some arcane, psychoredactive fashion, nourished by the atmosphere and by photons, enduring and adapting and learning and growing in wisdom and grace and dear, dear, dear I am so afraid of it, paralyzed with dread, even as it tries to reassure me, and in my dream I call its name. Tijon! Jack! This horrifying mutant, this thing, is still my dear little great-grand-nephew, John Ramillard, a brilliant and vibrant little human person only three years old, trapped in 1.7 kilograms of unsupported humanoid encephalic protoplasm. None of Jack's eventual triumph penetrates my nightmare. I know only my own fear and revulsion and a demonic whisper. Who will be the next to disincarnate? Perhaps you, Roji? Then Mark is at my side again, much older, this time his dark armor is the glistening, wet body monitoring coverall of a cerebro-energetic enhancer, the perilous mind-boosting device outlawed by the galactic milieu. Mark studies the bodiless thing that is his mutant brother with open admiration and a paradoxical envy. I see a warning reflected from eyeless depths, and Mark sees it too. Jack's mind tells us. No, human is better. For you, Mark. For all of you. Mark smiles and shakes his head, denying, Mental man is the inevitable, the culmination of all rational being, and there is no need to wait upon evolution's laggard pace for his coming. He can be summoned. Suddenly I see three persons suspended in interstellar space, a faceless woman clad in a suit of diamonds, a blazing plasma that enfolds the first mental man, and a black armored shape leading an interstellar armada in opposition to the other two. The metapsychic rebellion of humanity against the galactic milieu has begun. At my dream's climax, a blue and white planet explodes, haloed by a mass death shout, and in that terrible moment, the galactic milieu, the benevolent confederation that saved the human race from its own folly and gave us the stars as a playground, itself begins to die. The dream always ends at this point, before the final resolution, and I return to consciousness freezing and paralyzed with a half-strangled scream caught in my throat. Peace. T'en fais pas, Roger. Calm yourself and relax. It all happened long ago, and now, at last, in the writing of this personal chronicle, you have a way of exorcising the nightmare once and for all. Perhaps you already know me from the introductory volume of these memoirs. If you do not, let me introduce myself briefly. My name is Rogatien Romillard and I am sometimes called Roger, but more often simply Uncle Rogi, pronounced appropriately enough as Rogi, by those who find my Christian name impossibly ethnic. It is of French origin, and the Remillards are a sizable family who originally were colonists in Quebec, and later migrated to the northeastern United States, where there was a large but unobtrusive Franco-American population. I have, for most of my life, been a bookseller in the college town of Hanover, New Hampshire. I have a small antiquarian bookshop, the Eloquent Page, where rare old 20th century fantasy and science fiction books, printed on carefully conserved paper, are offered to connoisseurs at atrocious prices. Although I belong to a family of acknowledged mental giants, my own intellectual and metapsychic functions are meager. 
This has not prevented me from being caught up in the checkered careers of my more illustrious relatives. On the contrary, I have played at times a rather significant role in the family's machinations, something that milieu historians have seen fit to ignore, and I have witnessed from my worm's eye view the rise and fall of many a galactic worthy and villain, including two saints and one notorious individual whose misdeeds were so appalling that he was known as the Angel of the Abyss. I have never married, but I have loved unwisely several times. I have faced imminent death on quite a few occasions and survived through improbable happenstance. I have killed three persons in cold blood, even though I am the most easy-going and peaceable of men, and one of them was a person I loved deeply. My fraternal twin brother, Donatien, and I were born in the year 1945 in the New England mill town of Berlin, New Hampshire. Our young father had already been killed during World War II, and our mother died giving birth to us. So we orphans were raised by our kindly aunt and uncle, who had six children of their own. But no members of the Ramayar clan, except my brother and I, had the immortality genes, whose existence was not confirmed until after the intervention, nor did they possess the genes for higher mind powers. It was many years before my twin brother and I discovered that we were not unique in our metapsychic operancy. How we two responded to our more frightening metafunctions is a story that I have already related at some length. In brief, I learned to live with such powers as telepathy, psychokinesis, and metacoercion, while Don was ultimately destroyed by them, tragically killed when he was only forty-four. I was rendered sterile by a childhood illness. Don had ten offspring, and all of them inherited the genes for high metafunction and self-rejuvenation. But only the two oldest children were able to utilize their extraordinary mind powers. Circumstances made Don's oldest child, Dennis, become a foster son to me, and it was he who founded with his operant wife, Lucille Cartier, the so-called Ramayar dynasty which eventually included many of the most powerful minds the human race has ever known. Don's second son, Victor, was not as intellectually brilliant as his older brother, but his metapsychic mind powers were probably even more formidable, and he used them ruthlessly for his own self-aggrandizement until he was finally struck down, immediately prior to the great intervention, either by me or by the mysterious being I had learned to call the family ghost. From time to time, especially when I am drunk and morose and seized with that melancholy feeling of inescapable doom that francophones call malheur, I have been tempted to believe that the family ghost is nothing more than a construct of my own imagination. But if that is true, then by default I am responsible not only for the great intervention, but for the metapsychic rebellion as well and ultimately for the even more momentous events that came afterward, bringing the long story full cycle. But that would be too far-fetched a practical joke, even for Le Bon Dieu, who is so full of them. So let me begin this galactic milieu trilogy without further maunderings. First, with a retrospective. Chapter 2 A Retrospective Digression, Berlin, New Hampshire, Earth, 30 March, 2040 Roger drove into the town of his birth late on a dreary spring afternoon, bringing Teresa and little Mark with him from Hanover, as he had been instructed to. Wrathful and profane protests to the contrary had got Roger nowhere. Paul had been adamant. This time, Roger, too, would come to Berlin and participate in the annual ritual because Dennis had insisted upon it. And that was that. It always seemed to rain on Good Friday, but at least this year the rain was warm, and it was making short work of the remnant patches of street ice and the old gray mounds of snow that still lay about in the sun-starved nooks of town. By Easter, Roger told himself subvocally. Berlin would be nearly washed clean. 
the pussy willows in the gardens along the Androscoggin River, where the smoke-belching paper mills once stood, would have snowdrops and blue Siberian squill and pink hellebore blooming beneath them, and the first robins would sing in the budding sugar maples, and the townsfolk in their Easter finery would stroll the riverside paths. And with luck, before next Easter, Vic would be dead. Why will that be good? Mark piped up. Who is Vic, Uncle Roji? And why will it be a good thing for him to die? Oh, mad et puis mad, Roji muttered. Teresa said, Roji, for heaven's sake. Secure in his little car seat in the back of the big Lincoln ground car, the child turned from his interested scrutiny of the town to attack his great-granduncle with a precocious mental probe that made Roji yelp with sudden pain. Mark's chubby face, reflected in the rearview mirror, revealed nothing but solemn curiosity, and his own mind was guarded with its usual indomitable screen. He was two years old. Mark, stop that, Teresa said. Yes, Mama, said the boy. The probe withdrew almost as quickly as it had penetrated, leaving only a lingering ache behind Roger's eyes. But the cute little tyke had nearly mind-sucked him like a plas pouch of orange juice. Shame on you for invading Uncle Roger. I want you to apologize. Teresa's uneasiness, which she had carefully concealed during the hour-long drive from Hanover, now tinged the exasperation that she projected to the old man on his intimate mode. For the love of God, Roger, can't you control yourself for my sake and Mark's, if not for common decency? The two-year-old said, I'm sorry, Uncle Roji. You're forgiven, the old man said. And then to Teresa, Once we get to Vic's house, the kid will read the whole family like billboards, no matter how they try to screen. Dennis is an integral idiot, asking you to bring Mark along to this damned charade. Does he actually intend to use this baby in a meta-concert, for Christ's sake? And what the hell good is a low-watt mind like mine? The whole goddamn thing is a farce, a sop to Dennis's guilt. The lot of you should have put an end to it years ago, and Paul should have more sense than to upset you in your condition. Mark asked, Does Uncle Roger think making this Vic dead will hurt you and Maddie, Mama? No, dear, not at all. I'm fine, and so is Maddie, safe inside me. Roger, try to stay more securely on the intimate mode. Better yet, think of something else like watching where you're going if you insist on driving manually. Look, isn't this high street where we turn? Mark, dear, you've misunderstood Uncle Roger's thought. The Vic he was thinking about is Victor Remillard, who is Grandpère's brother. We're going to see him and pray for him. Victor is very, very sick. He's been sick for nearly twenty-seven years, ever since the Great Intervention. The small boy was prodding and thrusting now at his mother's metal shield as a frustrated kitten scratches at a closed door. But there was no easy way through the maternal barricade. Nature, compassionate of metaphysically operant parents, had rendered most of them proof against the onslaughts of their loving offspring. But why should Vic be made dead? Open to me, Mama, so I can understand better. I want to understand. Being dead is bad, isn't it? How can it be good for Vic? Dear, stop poking at me. How many times must I tell you to respect the integrity of other minds? And you must call him... Grand Uncle Victor, not Vic. Politesse, dear, always. When a person is very sick and unable to get well, it's usually better for him to die and go to heaven, rather than live on and suffer. Roger uttered a short explosive laugh. Heaven, that's rich. Teresa said calmly to the child, Uncle Roger is being ironic, Mark. Do you remember what irony is? Yes, Mama. But I'd rather discuss death with you now, please. There isn't much time, but I'll do my best, dear. Roger had slowed the car as they drove through the central district of Berlin. The town had undergone great change since the last time he had been here, and now seemed gussied up and gentrified almost beyond recognition. The older buildings that were worth rehabilitating had been expertly restored and framed in plantings, and the new structures looked as though they had stood there from time immemorial, mellowing gracefully. There were small parks at every other block, quaint wrought-iron street lamps already glowing against the early dusk, even though it was still two hours until sunset, and not a trace of shabbiness was anywhere to be seen. 
Even in the pouring rain, the old cottages and frame apartments of the core residential area seemed to glow in their coats of fresh paint, many done in classic New England white with dark shutters, while others sported the cheerful ice cream colors traditional to southern Quebec. Teresa continued in her attempt to explain mortality to the child. The tiny head with its thick mass of black ringlets had lowered as she spoke, apparently in obedient concentration. But all at once, Roger felt Mark renewing his quest for more interesting data, drilling into his own all-too-vulnerable cortex. Roger exerted all of his adult coercion to fend off the infantile probing, addressing the boy with considerable precision on the intimate mode, so that Teresa would have no hint of what he said. Stop the digging, you snoopy little foutre Damn it all, I'll tell you if you stop pestering me. Vic is a bad man, or at least he was bad before he got sick, the baddest man that I ever knew, and the sooner he's dead, the better off for all of us. Now is that plain enough for you? Yes, Uncle Roshi. You'll find out pretty soon what this Good Friday thing the family does with Vic every year is all about. Just keep quiet and watch and listen, and it'll sort itself out. Afterward, if you still have questions, ask Grandpère Dennis. I... I don't want to. I don't like Grandpère. I'll ask you. On the way back home, will that be all right? I suppose so. Now let me alone while I try to find this place. I haven't been here in twenty-four years. Damn, everything looks different up here. I guess I'll have to turn on the computer. And so the elements of our bodies that were formed ages and ages ago in the hearts of giant exploding stars, elements that we only borrowed for a little while, must be returned to the galaxy for reuse, Teresa was saying. But even if our bodies die, our minds will live on in the mind of the universe and be happy with God and all our friends and loved ones in eternal light. That's what heaven is. Will I die? Mark asked her. She grasped his tiny hands and kissed the top of his curly head. Not for a long, long time. You have, you have a very special body to go along with your special mind. Will you die? And Uncle Roger? Your Uncle Roger has the same kind of special body that you have. He won't die for a long time either, and neither will Papa. I don't have the same kind of body you all have, but if I get old or sick, I'll have myself regenerated so that I can stay with you. Do you remember what regeneration means? Like Grand Mare, in the regen tank. Exactly. When I get old, I'll go to a place that fixes me just like Grand Mare Lucille did, and I'll be made young and strong again. She'll be coming back to us very soon now. You'll hardly recognize her. She'll look as young as Aunt Cat. The car's guidance system, having digested the code designation for the Victor Remillard estate on Upper Hillside Drive that Roger called up, now switched on the vehicle's autopilot. Roger sighed and sat back in his seat while the car drove itself, using satellite reference points. In his reactionary heart of hearts, Roger considered such refinements obscene, even worse than the now obsolete computerized highway speed strips. They took all the fun out of driving. A man might as well take the bus, or one of those bloody flying eggs that wafted around on preset flight paths set up by air traffic control. Up until now, Roger had refused even to consider learning to fly, but he was weakening. One had to move with the times. Even these days, when the damned times seemed almost to zip along at the square of the speed of light. The dashboard chimed, and a robot voice spoke. You will arrive at your destination in approximately three minutes. Prepare to resume manual control of the vehicle. Roger mumbled under his breath. Mark asked his mother, Will we meet Papa and Uncle Philip and the others at Grand Uncle Victor's house? Yes, they're all flying in. The car had turned off Hillside Drive, following a narrow lane shaded by massive white pines and hemlocks. This manicured imitation of the primeval forest of New England opened at length into an expanse of lawn, sere with winter, and a magnificent vista of the Androscoggin River beyond. Parked near the house were five egg-shaped rowcraft, three Wolf Mercedeses, a Mitsubishi, and a sporty green de Havilland kestrel belonging to Severin Ramillar. Paul's scarlet Maserati was nowhere in evidence. 
The house from which Victor had directed his commercial empire prior to the great intervention was fully as ugly as Roger had remembered it. A looming pseudo-baronial pile of brick stucco and false timbering built in the 1930s for some satrap of the extinct paper mills. It had leaded glass windows, pointed gables, and a slate roof that gleamed oily in the rain. Rambling, decayed extensions with fanciful cupolas mounted upon them had once been stables, garages, and servants' quarters. Inside the main building were ten huge bedrooms, an oak-paneled library, a pretentious drawing-room with an attached conservatory, the latter devoid of vegetation, a vast, echoing ballroom, drafty hallways paved in marble, a modern kitchen and formal dining-room that would have done credit to a small hotel, an empty indoor swimming pool, and a superlative state-of-the-art security system. Victor Remillard had lived in this house since 2009, from the time of Remco Industries' first great prosperity. With him were his younger twin brothers, Louis and Leon, and his widowed sister, Yvonne Fortier, all of whom he had rendered non-operant in early childhood, turning them into his creatures. In 2013, when Victor's criminal schemes were thwarted and he was reduced to a sense-deprived, helpless vegetable, the house became his place of exile. Louis, Leon, and Yvonne were promised immunity from prosecution by Dennis and his politically influential friends, provided they lived quietly in the old place, caring for Victor, supervising the small staff of domestics and nursing attendants, and staying out of the public eye. Beginning in 2016, when his youngest son, Paul, was two years old, Denis Remillard and his wife, Lucille Cartier, and their seven powerfully operant children had come once each year on Good Friday to visit Victor. Denis explained to Yvonne, Louis, and Leon that he and his family were praying for Victor's spiritual recovery. Yvonne, Louis, and Leon never really understood what Denis meant by that but they were grateful that they had escaped federal prison after aiding and abetting Victor in his crimes, and they willingly performed their assigned duties according to Dennis's instructions. Since they were virtual normals, they did not take part in the annual meta-concerted prayer ritual, except to see to the needs of the operant visitors, who eventually came to include the spouses of Dennis and Lucille's adult children. Without Dennis's knowledge, Yvonne, Louis, and Leon themselves prayed every day of their lives that Victor and Iyar would never awaken from his mysterious coma to reassume his domination over them. In point of fact, the trio prayed that Victor and Iyar would die. And finally, this year, it looked as though their petition might be granted. Orly D'Alembert stood at the casement windows of the library, looking out at the rain and sipping sherry. In spite of the roaring fire in the big fireplace, the room was chilly. Cecilia, Maeve, and Sherry sat in uncomfortable damask chairs as close to the hearth as they could get, fortifying themselves with hot tea. Any sign of the prima donna yet? Maeve O'Neill asked sharply. No, Orly replied. Roger's bringing her and Mark in a car. Sherry Lozier Drake, the youngest of the Remillard spouses at twenty-three, suppressed a tendency to shiver and reached for the silver teapot. Every year this damned prayer vigil gets weirder. My nerves are a wreck. If only I could have a drink. Seely, you're a doctor. Surely a single brandy couldn't hurt. Cecilia Ash gently laid a hand on her sister-in-law's arm. A surge of calming redaction flowed from her brain to that of the other woman. You know we mustn't. Did that zap help a little? Sherry sighed. Must have. Parney gave a happy kick. It'll all be over soon. Orly's voice was soothing. Can't be soon enough, snapped Maeve. She downed the last of her tea in a gulp, plunked the fine china cup and saucer down on the table with a rattling crash, and went to get another birch log from the cradle. I find the notion of an annual prayer ritual fascinating, Cecilia said. It's touching, this concern for the family black sheep. It's easy to tell that it's your first go-around, Maeve said, tossing the log onto the blaze. A shower of sparks fled up the chimney. I don't know how much Maury told you about it, but we don't actually pray, you know. 
Dennis links all of our minds in a coercive meta-concert, and he does the praying. Or whatever. It's Seve's opinion that the whole thing is nothing more than a colossal guilt compensation on the part of Dennis, because he's refused to pull the plug on Vic for all these years. Cecilia, who had married the widowed Maurice Remillard seven months earlier, assumed a professionally bland expression. That might be one explanation, but there are others. I think we're coercing Vic to die, Sherry said tersely, and a consummation devoutly to be wished. Amen, said Maeve. She had thrown still another piece of wood on the conflagration and now dusted her hands and plopped back into her chair. And if Paul's right, and the infamous invalid is finally sinking, this might be the last year we'll have to put up with Dennis's obsession. From the window, Aurelie said, I see car lights. It's Roger and Teresa. And I've far spoken Paul. He and Dennis will be here soon. The express V route from Baltimore to Boston was OS, and they lost time in a holding pattern. It's a scandal the way the traffic jams keep getting worse and worse. She came to the fire and poured herself a cup of tea before sitting down with the others. Cecilia said, as a neurosurgeon, I find the whole matter of Victor Remillard's mysterious coma fascinating. Is it true that his body has remained in perfect condition up until just recently? He's got the immortality gene complex, like all the rest of these lucky sods, Maeve said with a bitter laugh. Thank God the regen tank therapy is perfected at last. Can you imagine how poor old Lucille must have felt? turning into a decrepit old crone of seventy-two in spite of the best that cosmetic surgery could do, while her husband, who's only a year older, still looks like a graduate student. This will be the first Good Friday that Lucille has missed, Sherry said. Probably planned it, Maeve decided. Nine months in the tank, then, ta-da, reborn, young and gorgeous. She patted her thickening midsection. It's a crock that we still have to do babies the old-fashioned way. Look at us. Aside from Orly and Anne, the virgin martyr, we're a bloody maternity ward. That's all these dynastic Ramiyars seem to want out of us women, babies. Sometimes Sevi seems positively irrational on the subject. I wonder if that's why Jenny and Galia divorced him. Teresa's nearly due, isn't she? Orly remarked, changing the subject abruptly. And Cat has only another month to go. No, seriously, Maeve persisted to Cecilia. They're planning to use artificial gestation to help populate some of the ethnic planets. Why not make it a general thing? I don't mind being pregnant twice, but I'll be damned if I'll go through it again and again just to help fill the human polity with superior Remillard minds. But if we could pop the fertilized eggs into incubators... We've had the technical capability for a long time, Cecilia admitted, and it is useful under certain circumstances but it's far better for the baby to grow inside its mother naturally. There are both physical and psychological factors involved. That's why the reproductive statutes restrict artificial gestation so drastically. What do the Symbiari proctors know about it? May have fled. Damned egg-laying salamandroids. They don't risk their lives having babies. She sprang to her feet and strode over to the window. The car had pulled up to the porte cochere at the entrance to the mansion, and the obsequious Louis and Leon were hurrying to greet the arrivals. This pregnancy of yours is going much better than the last, Maeve, dear, Aurelie tried to be consoling. If you can just restrain your contraredactive tendencies and avoid stress, Maeve finished in an arch tone, you can talk. Six kids already and ready to keep it up till your ovaries pack it in? You drop babies as easily as an Indian squaw. Sherry said wearily, Try to calm down, Maeve. Give the rest of us a break. The Irish woman said, Oh, I'll simmer down soon enough, just as soon as we finish with this ghoulish wake for the living dead. She stared out at the rain-swept sky. If my feeble foresight's not mistaken... That's Paul's egg coming now. Shall we go find our husbands and get this damned thing over with? Paul used his creativity to shield them from the rain as he and his father hurried from the egg to the house. 
Once Dennis stumbled and would have gone to his knees if Paul hadn't seized his arm. Papa, you're still too weak to be out of the hospital. This was a mistake. Dennis shook his head stubbornly. If anything, he looked even younger than his 26-year-old son, who was nearly 30 cents taller than his father and sported a debonair moustache to enhance his image as a rising planetary statesman. Both men were dressed in sober suits and topcoats, and water from the sodden lawn threatened their highly polished shoes. Lucille had always insisted that the family dress in a semi-formal fashion for the Good Friday ritual, and even in her absence they had automatically complied. I'm quite all right, Dennis insisted. You know very well I was scheduled to leave Johns Hopkins next week. There's nothing whatsoever wrong with me physically. Tucker Barnes was probably right when he diagnosed me as suffering from exhaustion and acute depression aggravated by Lucille's absence. All the more reason for us to postpone Good Friday. No, that's unthinkable, especially under the circumstances. They reached the porte cochere and Paul cancelled the metapsychic umbrella. The entry hall was brightly lit, and Lewis and Leon hastened to open the front door and relieve Paul and Dennis of their coats. The twins were sixty-two years old, stocky and balding and hollow-eyed, for all that they possessed their precious self-rejuvenating heritage. Unfortunately, it tended to express itself differently in different individuals, and the complex interaction of the thousands of genes involved was still poorly understood. Aunt Yvonne, who was a year older than the twins, was still pallidly youthful, but these two poor devils would always look middle-aged, like Uncle Roger. Paul masked his disesteem as he greeted his uncles with cool formality. Would he retain his vitality and good looks as the years passed? Dennis had, but he was a slightly built blond man, while Paul was robust and dark, as Roger had been in his youth. And Victor. How is he? Dennis asked. The nurse had to adjust the machine again, Lewis said. The rate of hemoglobin synthesis continues to decrease, Leon added. Heartbeat and respiration are normal. He assimilates nourishment and excretes. Skin and muscular tone are nearly normal, and the EEG is as usual. Nevertheless, Lewis finished, his voice completely neutral. Unless therapy is started soon to relieve the anemia, he'll eventually die. Dennis was already heading for the red-carpeted central staircase. Paul, get the others together and bring them up at once. Papa, wait! Dennis halted and turned around, one hand on the banister. Paul took a breath, sealed off his inner thoughts with as much strength as he could muster, and readied his coercion. Papa, I've thought the matter over all throughout our flight from Baltimore. I won't let little Mark participate in the meta-concert. We don't know enough about the way mind linkage affects the participants. Dennis's face wore a gentle smile. He did not meet his son's eyes. Victor is failing, Paul. We may not have another chance, and we're lacking your mother's input this year. I assure you that the program I use is entirely benign, and Mark's mind is more powerful than that of many adults far stronger than those of the wives and Brett. Papa, no. Mark's my son. A baby. The rest of us are consenting adults. I've always had reservations about this Good Friday thing, and yet I've gone along with it, because it was so important to you. But I can't put a tiny child at risk. Uncle Roger's agreed to participate. He should help a little. Dennis turned away. Very well. He continued up the stairs, letting his mind rove on ahead of him to the sick room. The non-operant day nurse looked up from her plaque book as he entered Victor's room. Good afternoon, Mrs. Gilbert. We're nearly ready. Oh, Professor Remillard, I have been wanting to talk to you, but Mr. Philip and Dr. Severin said you were too ill. I'm feeling better. He calmed her redactively. Draw the drapes, will you please? I'll just check the machine. He stood at his younger brother's side for a few moments, looking at the pale, tranquil face of the man he was certain had damned himself. Then he went to the console of monitoring and life support equipment set up at the foot of the big canopied bed. The nurse persisted. Dr. Cournoyer was here yesterday. He'd like to discuss Mr. Victor's deteriorating condition with you. The urgent need for therapy if the anemia is to be arrested. Dennis did not reply. 
He finished his inspection of the equipment, drew a chair up to the bedside, and sat down. His extraordinary bright blue eyes now lifted and caught those of Mrs. Gilbert, holding her hypnotized as she stood with a drapery cord in one hand. When my brother's coma was pronounced irreversible many years ago, and the authorities allowed me to take responsibility for his care, they assumed I would do the usual thing, order the cessation of intravenous hydration and gastrostagavage so that he would soon die. For the reasons that seemed valid to me, I did not follow this course of action. Instead, Victor has been given food and water and ordinary nursing care for more than 26 years. Up until two months ago, his body maintained itself in perfectly normal condition through self-redaction. And his mind, although incapable of any external manifestation, apparently continued to function as well. Victor is blind, deaf, and mute, unable to respond to any sensory stimulus, incapable of voluntary movement, incapable of telepathic communication, coercion, or any other external metapsychic manifestation. But he still thinks. A mentality such as his would not have continued to live unless he wanted to. Do you understand, Mrs. Gilbert? I... I think so. Dennis inclined his head so that the terrible eyes were shuttered, and he suddenly seemed to be only a very weary, very frail young man. If Victor is declining now, it's also because he wants to, and we will undertake no special measures to arrest the deterioration. Only carry on as usual. Is that clear? I... Yes. The nurse slowly closed the draperies, then touched a switch that lit two shaded brass sconces on either side of the bed. The only other illumination in the room came from the machine readouts. The small lamp at the nursing station and a single candle in a ruby glass cup mounted beneath a wall crucifix opposite the bed. Please ask my family to come in now. Yes, Professor. She went out, closing the door softly behind her. Dennis lifted the coverlet and took out Victor's arms, folding them across his breast. The comatose man was dressed in gold silk pajamas, and none of the life support of the equipment was visible. His handsome face had lost its usual ruddiness to the anemia, but seemed otherwise normal. With a hint of a smile lingering about the bluish, motionless lips, Victor's crisply curled black hair had no more strands of silver in it now than it had had twenty-six years before, when he was struck down by something on top of Mount Washington at the start of the Great Intervention. Victor Remillard had killed nearly a hundred people, without compunction, including his father and several of his own siblings. He had stolen billions of dollars and violated a bookful of criminal, financial, and commercial regulatory laws. He had conspired with the maniacal Kiran O'Connor to seize control of Earth's satellite laser defense system. And he had very nearly managed to murder the cream of operant humanity, the 3,000 delegates of the last Metapsychic Congress, on the very day of intervention. Victor had also had the opportunity to ruminate over his sins ever since, thanks to his brother Dennis. Vic, Dennis whispered. Vic, have you found the truth? Have you finally discovered where you went wrong? Mind wide open and completely receptive, Dennis listened. Roger was at the tail end of the procession as they trooped up to Vic's bedroom, the seven metapsychic stalwarts of the Remillard dynasty, their brave spouses, and him. Scared, shirtless. At least baby Mark had been spared. The nurse had taken charge of him when Teresa declined to put him into the care of poor Fay Yvonne, who now stood downstairs in the hall with Louis and Leon, the three of them watching with haunted expressions as the others climbed to the stairs. The bedroom furnishings of dark and massive oak were exactly as Roger remembered them from twenty-four years earlier. The life support gadgetry was more compact and sophisticated now, and there were new rugs and draperies and hangings about the bed. But the blackened old crucifix with its red vigil light was the one poor lost Sonny Don's wife had nailed up as a newlywed in a cottage on School Street, 
and the face of the man lying in the bed still struck Roger with a terror so profound that he found himself reeling and had to clutch at the back of a chair to keep from fleeing the room. The participants in the ritual were ranging themselves about the bed in couples. On the left side, nearest to Victor's head, stood Philip Remillard, portly and comfortably homely, oldest of the seven siblings and the shrewd CEO of Remco Industries. With each passing year, he reminded Roger more and more of good old Aunt Louis, the hard-working mill foreman who had raised him. Philip's elegant wife, Aurelie d'Alembert, stood calmly at his side, fingering a crystal rosary. She and her late sister, Jean, who had married the second son of Dennis and Lucille, had made careers of being wives to men destined for greatness and mothers of their children. Maurice Remillard, as fair and mild-looking as Dennis, but more sturdily built, had recently taken an extended leave of absence from the Department of Sociology at Columbia University to join his three younger siblings, Anne, Adrian, and Paul, as an administrator in the human polity of the galactic milieu. His second wife, Dr. Cecilia Ash, wearing country tweeds in contrast to the dark suits and dresses of the other women, was looking down at the comatose man with clinical interest. Next to her stood Severin Remillard, who had been Cecilia's colleague in the Department of Neurology at Dartmouth Medical School, and her unsuccessful wooer. He was a tall, blonde man with a dashing air and an iconoclastic view of the galactic milieu, which Roger tended to sympathize with. Severin's third wife, Maeve O'Neill, formerly a successful Irish horse breeder, was a ravishing redhead, now pale as milk and with her large eyes alight with apprehension, flinching away from her husband's proffered arm. On the right side of the bed's foot, standing hand in hand with their minds entwined in mutual redactive commiseration, were Catherine Remillard and her husband Brett Doyle McAllister, colleagues in a child latency project at the Polity Capital, where both were also intendancy bureaucrats. Next to them were Adrian Ramillard and the wealthy pop sculptor Sherry Lozier Drake. Like Maeve, Sherry looked unhappy and anxious. Her husband, for all his metapsychic talents, was often considered by family detractors to be a rough-hewn, slightly unfinished prototype of the youngest and most famous member of the dynasty, Paul. Paul Ramillard was not only tall, built like an athlete, and endowed with princely good looks, but he also possessed what was perhaps the most powerful set of metafaculties in the entire human race. He had married the acclaimed coloratura soprano, Teresa Kendall. Besides Mark, their eldest, they had an infant daughter named Marie. The unborn child Teresa carried, also a girl, was to be called Madeline. The only unmarried sibling, intendant associate Anne Remillard, came up to Roger with a sardonic twinkle in her ice-blue eyes and coerced him to stand at her side near Catherine and Brett, on the side of the room nearest the door. Dennis himself stood next to them at the very foot of the bed. As always, the Remillards faced the crucifix and recited La Raison Dominicale in the French language of their ancestors. Orly, Cecilia, and Teresa, who were also Catholics, joined in the prayer. Roger was too petrified to utter a sound. Then Dennis spoke softly. Thank you all for coming, especially you, Cecilia, because I realize this family custom must seem bizarre to you this first time. And you, Uncle Roger, for reasons that I know you would rather I didn't discuss. Someone coughed, and there was a general shuffling of feet. For Cecilia's sake, Dennis continued, let me explain what we are about to do. I intend to link all of our minds in a meta-concert and pray in a very special way for my brother Victor. For over twenty-six years he has lain in this room in a deep coma. We know from the monitoring machine that he thinks. Orderly thought patterns that are almost certainly rational are generated by his brain. But he is totally cut off from the world of sensation, receiving no input at all as far as we have been able to ascertain. Victor is alone with his thoughts, alone with his memories, alone with recollections of the terrible crimes he committed. It has always been my personal prayer, my hope, that Victor would ultimately repent of what he had done, 
and when this was accomplished he would either recover or pass peacefully into death. Dennis paused and turned his gaze upon Roger, who was caught by those coercive blue eyes like a jack-lighted deer, too frozen even to feel fear. And then Dennis looked away. Recently, Victor's body has suffered a severe decline in hematopoiesis, the manufacture of blood cells. In a person with a self-rejuvenating gene complex, this signifies a very grave prognosis. My brother is dying, and this is probably our last chance to come together on his behalf. Now let us prepare our minds for the Metaconcert. Cecilia, the process is a very simple one for the participants in the configuration I have designed. Just open your mind wide, with all barriers as low as possible, and trust me. I'll do the linkage very slowly, one of you at a time. When the concert is complete, I'll direct it. You need do nothing except relax. Ready? Roger closed his eyes. Immediately a deluge of memories seemed to engulf him. He seemed to see again his twin brother Donny, whose juvenile assaults on his mind, non-malicious in the beginning, had prompted in Roger the spontaneous development of strong mental shielding. Only once had the two of them conjoined in a self-defensive, triumphant meta-concert. But after that, seeking to renew the experience, Donnie had instead attempted to violate Roger's self, make the two of them into an inseparable whole. When Roger refused, Donnie hated him, and hated himself for the hating, until the day that he died. In the mnemonic flood, Roger also saw Don's son, Baby Dennis, at the baptismal font, felt the new young mind bond to him. Dennis had made Roger his adoptive father, taking the love Roger vouchsafed to him freely after his own father had denied him in favor of Victor. As young Dennis's mind matured and the shy child turned into one of the great minds of the world, Roger had learned to fear him even though the love was still there as well, and especially to fear joining mentally with him in meta-concert. Dennis would never knowingly harm his beloved foster father, but he was so powerful, so different, that Roger could not help being afraid. He was very much afraid now. Roger's mental screens were still up. He had defied Dennis, refused conjunction at the last moment, so that the others had been forced to complete the mind edifice without him. Roger was dimly aware of the meta-concert hovering apart from him, engrossed in whatever esoteric activity Dennis was conjuring. Elsewhere, deep within the ineffable, immense, dynamic field of mental lattices that was called the ether, something without tangible form was looking at Roger. Not Dennis not Victor, not any of the other persons who had gathered around the bed, nor anyone that Roger knew. Something else watched him from deep within a great mental chasm, a thing horrible that encompassed an evil beyond anything he had ever experienced before. Roger had known Kiran O'Connor and Victor Remillard, the two most iniquitous minds that the human race had ever spawned, but this thing was worse and it was beckoning to him. Who are you? Roger asked. And it said, I am Fury. Where did you come from? Roger asked. I am newborn, inevitably. What? What do you want? And it said, all of you. Roger's mind screamed its fear and loathing. He seemed to hear laughter, and this time the voice was recognizably Victor's. Roger cried out again, pleading, begging for Dennis, for anyone, to come to his rescue. But Dennis seemed to be gone. And the minds he had woven so skillfully about him were gone as well. I require assistance, Fury said, reaching out, and I'll take you to start with. Silly, flawed old Roger, but you'll be useful. You can't. You can't. She, I told you so. 
Now Roger was laughing hysterically, and the horror that was fury roared, and the negation of the mental chasm was lit by a crimson radiance that grew brighter and brighter, becoming a red sphere suspended in utter darkness. He is mine, another voice said, a familiar voice. You may not have Roger. Do what you must do, but not with him. The red sphere hovered, seeming to become more solid, a glowing thing that Roger thought he recognized. He took hold of it somehow, and it pulled him away, away out of the depths, away from the mind monster named Fury, and back into ordinary reality. The bedroom. Severin and Cecilia Ash bending over the supine figure, she seeking a wrist pulse, he lifting an eyelid to reveal a dilated, fathomless pupil. Dennis on his knees, head bowed, hands touching the covered feet of the body, weeping. Paul and Adrian at the machine, where the once green telltales now blinked red. And standing apart, her face frozen, Catherine, Teresa, and the other women together in an agitated group, murmuring, Philip, Maurice, and Brett staring at each other helplessly. Suddenly, through the closed door, Roger heard a baby scream. His paralysis evaporated, and he raced to the door, yanked it open. Then he halted, stunned, at the scene in the hall. Three bodies lay on their backs on the oriental runner rug. Yvonne, Louis, and Leon, their faces contorted and their eyes wide open, were stone dead. From the doorway of the bedroom across the hall, Mrs. Gilbert, the nurse, stared down at the bodies in astonishment, while the two-year-old boy in her arms shrieked and struggled like a wild thing. Roger's hand went involuntarily to his pants pocket, to the key ring that he always carried with him, the one with a fob like a red glass marble. His strong fingers tightened around the little caged sphere. It's all right, Roger said to Mark on the intimate mode. He's gone. Abruptly the boy's cries ceased. Flushed and tousled, breathing in noisy gulps, Mark held out his arms to the old man. Roger took him from the nurse, cradled the small head against his chest, and hurried off downstairs. Chapter 3 Okanagan, Earth, 24 August, 2051 He had been summoned. Coerced. He, the uncoercible. It was nothing so concrete as a call on the telepathic intimate mode. It was a compulsion, an aching, cryptesthetic urge having nothing at all to do with the usual workings of his powerful and orderly young mind. It was a feeling, and that, of course, made it totally suspect, that his mother, more than 540 light years away on Earth, was in danger from some purposeful agency that would cause her irreparable harm. And only he, Mark Vimeyar, could save her. But that was counter to all logic, and he had arranged his life so as to subdue in himself the messier, non-intellectual aspects of the human psyche. When eruptions of the feeling function occasionally got the better of him, he counted it a personal defeat, and analyzed the phenomenon rigorously, and strove to bring it under control so as to lessen his susceptibility on the next go-around. But somehow, where his mother was concerned, emotional skewing tended to persist. It was odd that he should continue to love her with such unreasoning ardor, in spite of her benign indifference. No amount of meta-creative sorting and rechanneling on his part had been successful in transmuting the filial bond with Teresa Kendall into something safer. He had dealt with his father more satisfactorily. Paul could no longer hurt him or even shake his composure. Why then, he asked himself, should a son's relationship with a maternal parent be so much less amenable to rationalization? It was annoying, and in the present situation, intuition hinted that it might even be dangerous. But intuition was often illogical, too. When Mark attempted to far-speak his mother, he discovered that she had her impregnable mental barrier up. And so he was forced to place a call to her from Okanagan via a subspace communicator, just as though he were a non-operant or a metapsychic infant. When he reached her, Teresa cheerfully denied that anything at all was wrong. She said she missed him, as she said she missed the other three children off on their various summer jaunts. But they would all be together soon enough, and she was feeling quite well these days, and it was so unlike him to be hyper-imaginative. 
And was he quite sure that he wasn't coming down with some exotic bug? He told her that he would get a scan, and apologized stiffly for his irrational behavior and for disturbing her. She laughed kindly and said it was probably only puberty, which was bound to be unsettling even to a grand master-class young operant like himself. She told him that she loved him and reassured him once again that everything at home on earth was fine and then terminated the communication. Mark had no way of telling whether or not his mother was lying to him again. The notion that puberty was the cause of his malaise he rejected out of hand. His hormonal secretions were normal for a boy of thirteen, and he was confident that they, like the rest of his bodily functions, were at the moment subordinate to his self-redactive metafaculty. But the maddening compulsion was not imaginary. It was undeniably coercive and focused with considerable precision upon him, and it increased in strength every hour that he attempted futile analysis of its source. He far spoke his sensible twelve-year-old sister Marie, who was trying to write her first novel at their grandparents' old summer place on the Atlantic shore. Marie told him she had seen their mother last weekend and things were as normal back at home as they ever were. Teresa was clearly grateful for her time alone. She displayed no overt symptoms of mental dysfunction. She was doing some gardening and was working with every evidence of enthusiasm to transpose an obscure folk song cycle from the archaic Poltroian into modern human notation. In Marie's opinion, Mark's premonitions and uneasiness were nothing more than mental indigestion. His giant brain was doubtless suffering overload from all the weird cerebro-energetic experiments he had inflicted upon himself, and he should slow down and smell the flowers before his synapses snapped. Mark told Marie thanks for nothing. Next he tried to bespeak his great-granduncle Roger, who lived above his bookstore only a block and a half away from the family home. Roger's puny mentality did not respond to Mark's far-spoken hails, and that probably meant that the old man was in one of his downslide phases and stinko again. However, there was only a small chance that Uncle Roger would know the truth about Teresa anyway. He had always been leery of Mark's parents and the other galactic celebrities of the Remillard clan, even as he was surprisingly congenial toward Paul and Teresa's aloof eldest son, Mark. In the end, the boy decided that there was no way to resolve the dilemma but to go home and check things out personally, and at all possible speed. It took three days for the CSS Funakoshi Maru to travel from Okanagan to Earth at the highest displacement factor and durable by master-class humans. Mark Ramayar scarcely felt the pain of the three deep catenary hyperspatial translations at all. Enmeshed in his premonition, he had also neglected to note that the cost of his ticket on the premium-class superluminal transport had eaten up nearly all of his remaining personal credit card allowance. When the starship docked at Calais, Mark discovered that he couldn't afford to travel the rest of the way home from Hawaii via express eggliner and taxi. For emergencies, he carried the family corporation credit card with its unlimited rating, but since he was legally a minor for three more years, no matter how extraordinary his metapsychic quotient, using the card would require parental authorization and thereby alert his father. And the damned premonition seemed to urge that he not let anyone most particularly not Paul, know that he had returned. So Mark took the cheapy local shuttle, which took twice as long as the express to fly from Calais to the North American spaceport on Anticosti Island. It was from there that he had embarked for the planet Okanagan the previous June, leaving his BMW T99RT turbocycle in the long-term parking facility. He considered, but rejected, the idea of sneaking his wheels out without paying. The garage exit was fully automated against that very contingency, and its computer notably sneech-proof, even to the likes of him. And if he blew it and got nailed, he might as well have stayed on Okanagan. There was nothing to do but play it straight. Unhocking the turbocycle reduced the credit on his personal class to just about zero, but fortunately the BMW was fully J-fueled and ready to roll, and the tolls would be automatically debited to the family account. Mark removed the cycle leathers from the machine's boot and put them on. He checked the charge and ran an internal test of the circuitry in the cerebro-energetic guidance helmet, 
then clapped it on, effectively plugging his brain into the pike the moment the hard-hat electrodes came alive at his imperative thought and pricked his scalp. The BMW's instrumentation became part of his own senses, and its operating controls belonged to his voluntary nervous system, answering to his mental commands. There was nothing unique about the cerebro-energetic system except the fact that it was designed to operate a mere turbocycle instead of a starship or another highly sophisticated piece of apparatus. And instead of being manufactured by IBM or Datasys or Toshiba, it had been built by Mark himself. Ordinarily, he drove his overpowered BMW in a scrupulously law-abiding manner except when he was on a race course. But now, in the emergency, he'd crank the bike flat out in the Maxell lanes of the auto routes and screw the scofflaw monitors with his meta-creativity. If a living police officer spotted him, he'd just have to risk brain-wiping the cop. The mind-controlled two-wheeler with a boy aboard rolled out of the spaceport parking garage, adhering to the speed limit all through the Jacques Cartier tunnel, leading to the Labrador auto route on the north shore of the Saint Laurent, once it reached the Maxell lanes of the major groundway, the boy hung out the spoilers and commanded maximum throttle. Luckily, no human traffic police eyeballed him en route, and no busybody civilian drivers happened to be alert enough to note his tag number as he scorched past. He reached Hanover, New Hampshire, shortly after noon, having achieved an average velocity of 282.2 kilometers per hour. The beautiful old college town was swathed in a summer heat wave and seemed nearly deserted. Mark drove the bike in quietly and decided that it would be a good idea to scan things out at close range before going to the house. He went to the empty parking area of the Catholic Church on Sanborn Road, just around the corner from his home. It was so hot that the birds had quit singing and the tarmac that paved the lot was semi-liquid between the bits of gravel. When he unzipped the environmentally controlled leather suit from left shoulder to right ankle and stepped out of it, he felt as if he had stepped into a sauna. He was able to mentally adjust his body thermostat easily enough, but the feeling of impending disaster had now become almost overwhelming. During the shuttle trip and the drive from Anticosti, he had deliberately refrained from any attempt to far-sense Teresa or try to make mental contact with her. The premonition had seemed to warn him that this would be dangerous, that she would inadvertently give away his presence on earth and somehow preclude his helping her. But now, standing in the dusty shade of a gigantic mutant elm with a cooling engine of the beamer ticking gently beside him, the boy reached out with a most heavily shielded far-sensory probe he could manage and entered the old white colonial-style house at 15 East South Street. Neither Herter Schmidt, the operant nanny, nor Jacques de la Rue, the non-operant housekeeper, was anywhere in the place. His mother, Teresa Kaolana Kendall, was in her music studio on the second floor, sitting at a keyboard in front of an open window, playing a soft, guitar-like improvisation. As Mark's ultrasense lingered on her face, which was lightly sheened with perspiration, she brushed a damp lock of dark hair from her eyes with a sharp gesture at odds with her tranquil aspect. Her mind was enveloped in a grand master-class screen that no Remillard, not even her husband or her eldest son, had ever been able to breach. Across the room, sitting stiffly on a ladder-backed chair between the computer desk and a bookcase stuffed with old-fashioned printed musical scores, was Lucille Cartier, Mark's redoubtable grandmother and Therese's mother-in-law. Lucille's rejuvenated beauty was unsullied by sweat, and her dark brown hair, cut in bangs and a classic Chanel bob, was perfectly groomed. Lucille said, Now that we're certain that the prognosis for successful prenatal genetic engineering is negative, you must agree that only one course of action is possible. Teresa said nothing. The music she played was technically brilliant, but completely lacking in depth or nuance. Lucille was reigning in her famous temper admirably projecting regret, sympathy, and feminine solidarity at the same time that her coercion was working overtime. Teresa, dear, there is no other way the family can protect you from the legal consequences of your irresponsible behavior, and the child is doomed, anyhow, Teresa finished, smiling abstractedly. 
Severin himself performed the genetic assay, confirming the presence of at least three intractable lethal traits in the fetal DNA. And I needn't remind you, Lucille's voice hardened, that doing those tests makes Sevi just as much of an accessory to your crime as I am. But he was willing to put himself in jeopardy just to prove to you that the situation is irremediable. And I thank you both for trying and for not reporting me. We never considered reporting you to the magistratum. The smallest movement uplifted Teresa's lips. Of course not. The Remillard family honor, and the honor of the first human magnate-designate, would never recover from the scandal. You don't know what you're saying. Lucille's words were still objective, composed, but her mental substratum, clearly perceptible to Mark's spying ultrasense, smoldered with outrage, any more than you really knew what you were doing when you deliberately flouted the reproductive statutes. Oh, I knew, but I never intended to harm Paul or the rest of the family. I, I only knew that this time the risk was worth taking. How you ever expected to get away with it? I had a plan. Once my condition became obvious, I'd slip away to my family's old beach house on Kauai, where only the native Hawaiian people and a handful of Haoles live now. It would have been easy to make some excuse to Paul. Teresa uttered a small laugh. He certainly would never miss me, what with the hullabaloo of the upcoming ending of the Symbiari proctorship and the formal induction ceremonies for the new earth magnates at Concilium Orb. I thought that afterward, when the human polity finally took its place in the milieu and the dynasty was settled in as magnates, I'd eventually be exonerated. That is by no means a certainty. I'm not the only person who thinks that reproductive statutes are unjust, nor am I the only operant who's attempted to circumvent them. For normals, the penalty is only a fine and sterilization and the loss of a few entitlements. Why the Symbiari decided to deal with us in such a draconian manner— we operants have more privileges, said Lucille gently, and we also have more responsibilities. To hell with them both. Teresa's voice was level. Her musical improvisation became Bachian, faster and almost frenzied in its intricacy. To hell with a whole ungodly proctorship scheme. To hell with the exotics in their milieu. What fools we all were to think it would be so wonderful to become a part of a galactic civilization. There are some normals who would agree with you, and a few operants, but most of humanity believes that the intervention saved our planet from catastrophe. The price in human freedom and dignity has been too high. Lucille Cartier's mental veneer of sympathy thinned momentarily to reveal the thought, poor neurotic fool. And if any love or pity for Teresa tinged this stark judgment, it was imperceptible to Mark. Teresa seemed to notice nothing, and continued equably. But all this is quite beside the point. My little scheme failed to reckon with your own maternal astuteness, Lucille. You found me out. Her playing slowed, and the music passed into a minor mode. Almost as an afterthought, she said, If you and Severin are prepared to perform the procedure, we'd best do it early tomorrow, before Paul comes back from Concord. Thank God you finally come to your senses. Lucille sprang up from the chair and came swiftly to her daughter-in-law, taking Teresa's hands from the keyboard and drawing her to her feet. Darling, I know how terrible this is for you, and I'm so sorry it has to be this way. We should have realized what emotional turmoil you were suffering. Paul should have known. Teresa freed her hands. Not Paul, she said very quietly. There were tears in her eyes now, but the mental facade that she displayed to her mother-in-law was suddenly casual, uncaring, almost as though the secret once discovered was no longer worth agonizing over. Paul never would have known. It took another woman to find out the truth. Well, it will all be over tomorrow. Lucille, you mustn't worry about me any more. You're quite right, and I am a fool, and that's an end to it. I think you'd better go now and arrange things. I'd like to be alone for a while, to do my vocal exercises. You know how I am about letting anyone hear how awful I've become. That's nonsense, said Lucille stoutly. Your voice is as fine as ever. How many times must we tell you that your singing difficulties are entirely psychosomatic? And this other, this obsession of yours, 
would also respond to therapy if you'd only— Please. Pain flashed briefly from Teresa's eyes. Just let us be alone together for these last few hours. It's not sapient. Not at five months. Lucille's voice was shrill and her eyes blazed. It's only your sick imagination hearing it. Yes, of course. Teresa turned her back on Lucille, took her seat again at the keyboard, and toggled a forte piano patch. She began to play Chopin's Bersus. I'll be ready tomorrow. Just call me. Tell me where and when. Lucille's mouth tightened as she recognized the lullaby. But she only nodded and left the room, hurrying down the staircase and out of the house to her waiting ground car. Mark waited until his grandmother drove off and turned away on Main Street, before starting to walk his bike toward the house, bespeaking his mother on the way. Mark. Mama, I've come. Teresa. Mark? It's you? But why, dear? What about the little holiday you were supposed to take with your friends after finishing the undergrad seminar on Okanagan? The trip to the singing jungle? I know you were looking forward to a break before beginning at Dartmouth this fall. Mark, I've come to help you. Teresa, I told you there was nothing wrong, nothing that need concern you. Detachment. Mark, I know better. I felt your need, your danger. There was an irresistible compulsion. You coerced me, and I came. Teresa, oh, no, Mark. You know my mind, you of all people. I am weak in the coercive faculty, unable to project a compulsion into the next room, much less five hundred light-years to Okanagan. Mark, unconsciously you could do it, under the circumstances. It had to be you. It certainly wasn't him. Theresa, oh, Jesus, you can't mean— Mark, do you know? Mark, not all of it, but enough. I can read your subliminal thoughts now, Mama. Your barrier is down, and you're thinking so loudly that I can hardly avoid it. Does—does does he really speak to you? Teresa, Lucille insists it's impossible. He's only five months alive, and his brain hasn't developed far enough. Even an eight-month fetus is barely able to conceptualize, much less achieve the bilateral cerebration necessary for even the most primitive form of self-awareness or communication. It's not anything I can understand. I only know it. No, he is the one, not you, not the others. My poor, wonderful babies, forgive me, forgive me. I had to do it. He must live, mutant or not. He is the one. Mark, can you help us? How can you possibly help? You're only thirteen. Lucille and Severin will kill him to save me, but I won't let it happen. I'll run away. I'll do away with both of us before— Mark, Teresa, be still. Teresa, yes. Mark, I'm here, in the house, coming upstairs. I know what to do, how to save both of you. Your unconscious mind was right to call me. Trust me. Teresa. Yes. Teresa did not look up as Mark entered. She stared at her hand, silent on the electronic keyboard. You're only a boy. A boy with an amazing mind, but hardly powerful enough to counter the law enforcement authorities of the galactic milieu. What I've done is a serious crime, and if you help me, you'll be an accessory and liable to the same penalty as mine. As Grandma and Uncle Sevy will be, too, if they do the abortion. The danger of their being found out is infinitesimal, whereas you would almost certainly be caught if you tried to help me escape. I won't be caught. I've already worked it out. Look. Image. I see, Teresa whispered. I see. She reached out to him mentally, to this oldest child who had distanced himself from his parents in the earliest years of life, keeping himself to himself, apparently rejecting love as a needless distraction, as he cultivated the awesome metafaculties that might some day make him the leading human operant of the new galactic age. Teresa seemed genuinely astonished that it should be Mark who would try to save her, save both of them. He had shown no particular affection for his other siblings, and seemed to have only an Olympian regard for his mother and father. Even now he instinctively froze at her attempted mental caress, as though he knew that love's interface would breach his precious self-sufficiency and render him vulnerable. As it had. "'Mark, are you sure?' she asked, taking his hand. 
It was warm, unlike the ramparts guarding his soul's core. Yes, he said. Teresa kissed the young hand, then smiled as she guided it to her belly, which had hardly begun to swell. Mark's muscles tensed, and she feared he would pull away, but then— There, she said reassuringly, and the boy relaxed. You must listen very carefully. His— his thought mode is like nothing I've ever experienced before, human or exotic. It's rather frightening until you get used to it. At least it was for me. Probe deep. Be open for something quite different. And be gentle, because he feels he must hide sometimes like a little frightened animal. Mark knelt beside Teresa, placed both hands on his mother's abdomen, and closed his eyes. Transfixed, he hardly seemed to breathe for many minutes. Finally he gave a low, inarticulate cry. He opened his eyes and regarded his mother with mingled elation and fear. "'It's all right,' Teresa said, smiling. "'He's really very happy to meet you. And, yes, it seems that he was expecting you after all.'" Chapter 4 Hanover, New Hampshire, Earth, 24 August, 2051 The antique bell on the front door of the eloquent page tinkled, and the teenaged boy came inside. Even before she looked up from her computer inventory check, Perdita Mannion was aware that a metapsychic operant of exceptional stature had come into the bookshop. The mind signature was not only unreadable, it was encrypted to the point of non-existence. It could belong to only one person. She smiled a greeting both with her lips and with her mind. Well, hello, Mark. So you're back home in time to enjoy the last days of this beautiful New Hampshire summer, are you? I thought you were going to be off-world until the start of the Dartmouth fall term. The undergraduate seminar on psychocreative ambivalence at the Okanagan Institute ended earlier than I expected. The Symbiari prof came down with some kind of exotic allergy and couldn't stop dripping green. Good heavens! And then there was the big news about the selection of the first human magnates of the Concilium. Anybody named Rumiyar was fair game for the local media. So I caught the next chip for Earth. But it was your first star trip all alone. Didn't you want to stay on and explore for a bit? Okanagan is such a gorgeous world. All those flowering trees and the singing fire moths in the jungle gardens? Lindsay and I seriously considered settling there in 2020, when the first colonial planets were opened. Mark's response was edgy and formal. The planet is certainly very attractive physically, but I found it mentally unsettling. It has such a large cosmopolitan population of non-operants. Their excessively mercantile mindset has generated a very anharmonic planetary aura. Oh. I suppose I'm oversensitive, but there's no place like home. Well, of course. Perdita Mannion offered him maternal sympathy, well-flavored with humor. Master-class adolescents had such a difficult time coping, poor things. The brighter they were, the harder it was for them to adapt when they were first cut loose from the hothouse of operant training they had known since early childhood, and were forced to swim in the perverse mainstream of normal humanity. Her own brilliant son, Alexis, who, like Mark, had recently graduated from Brebeuf Academy, was a sore trial himself these days, an idealistic champion of the altruism ethic one moment, and a power-tripping little fascist the next, in spite of the best efforts of the school's operant Jesuit preceptors. It was high time that both boys were off to college, where their psychosocial adjustment to non-operant people and to members of the five exotic races would be even more closely monitored than their academic progress. Perdita said, Alexis will be very glad to see you, Mark. He and Boom Boom LaRoche and Pete D'Alembert are planning a fishing trip to Maine next week. I know they'll want you to go along. That might help calm your nerves. I'll catch Alex later, Miss Mannion, but I'm afraid I may be too tied up with other business to go on the trip. Mark spoke casually, but for the briefest instant Perdita caught a hint of anxiety, flashing involuntarily from the expertly shielded young mind. "'There's nothing wrong, is there?' she asked. "'Nothing you want to worry about. Just personal stuff. And here I am keeping you when you want to talk things over with your Uncle Roger. 
Well, go right on back to his lair. You'll probably find him up to his neck in buyer want lists. He'll be happy to have a visitor. She returned to her own work, her subliminal thoughts radiating unqualified love for her own recalcitrant offspring and tolerant goodwill toward Alexis's outre best friend. Perdita Mannion did not know that most of her mind was as transparent as glass to Mark's scrutiny. She thought, thank God Alexis is only an ordinary genius. Since Lindsay's death, he's been a handful. But what if I'd had to raise a child like Mark, the poor boy? Mark Mine smiled a salute to her kind heart, ignoring the implication of her other thoughts. Like so many other low-level operants, Perdita had no notion at all of the way higher minds like his functioned. She persisted in judging the personality integration of master-class persons according to her own, nearly normal, standards. No wonder she failed to understand Alex, much less him. Mark made his way through the close-standing shelves of old-fashioned paged books, fantasy titles, science fiction, and horror novels that were the stock in trade of his great-granduncle. The business catered exclusively to collectors, selling mostly by mail order. The only modern liquid crystal plaque books in the eloquent page were reference volumes or scholarly studies of the good old stuff. The bookshop took up the corner premises in the venerable Gates House building on Main Street, and had been a landmark in Hanover since before the Great Intervention. Its proprietor, who was called Uncle Roger by most of the town, as well as by the numerous members of the Remillard clan, lived in an apartment on the third floor. Suites of professional offices took up the second floor, and the building also housed a coffee shop and an insurance office in the annex out back, where there was a garage that Roger used for his personal ground car. Mark and his two younger sisters, Marie and Madeleine, and kid brother Luke, had practically grown up in the bookshop, as had their father Paul and their six paternal uncles and aunts before them. The shop was a refuge from the overstimulating ambience of the Remillard family home just around the corner and down the block, where the elite of Earth's metapsychic operant community, as well as members of the non-human races of the galactic milieu, were apt to drop in without ceremony and stay for days on end. A shaggy gray animal strolled out from among the bookshelves and eyed Mark with benignant tolerance. Meow. Greeting, friend of master. Hey, hello yourself, cat. Food. Don't you ever think of anything else, fatso? The boy bent to scratch behind the ears of Roger's big Maine Coon cat, Marcel La Plume. The animal stretched his ten-kilo body and yawned, then gathered his muscles to spring as Mark reached for the doorknob of the back room where Roger usually worked. The door opened and Marcel streaked inside, muttering telepathic feline complaints against the masters who shut out their beloved pets. The back room was sultry with summer heat, in spite of the laboring of the antique air conditioner in the window. The unmistakable scent of fine bourbon whiskey mingled with the musty smell of preserved pulp paper. Uncle Roger, dressed in his usual summertime costume of faded Levi's and a bean seersucker shirt, was asleep in his ratty old leather-covered recliner rocker. A half-empty bottle of wild turkey and a ham and cheese sandwich with two bites out of it sat in front of him in the midst of a pile of videograms and tattered printouts. The cat, Marcel, seemed to levitate onto the desk, landing his great bulk without disturbing a single item. He grabbed the sandwich, and his grey-green eyes regarded Mark with sly mockery before he took to the air again. A three-meter leap gained him the sanctuary of a high storage shelf, where he settled down to enjoy his purloined lunch among the piles of century-old pulp magazines shrouded in transparent plas. Mark came in and shut the door behind him. Uncle Roger, wake up! As the boy spoke, his powerful redactive faculty performed a drastic therapeutic maneuver, cancelling the alcoholic torpor. The sleeping bookseller's brain waves jumped into abrupt and highly unwelcome wakefulness. Rogatien Remillard snorted and hauled himself up, muttering curses in the Kunaqua French of Upper New England that was his natal tongue. His eyes snapped fully open when Mark sent a terse telepathic message arrowing into his mind. My help! Bartege! What kind of trouble have you gotten yourself into this time? And what are you doing back home so early? 
Don't tell me you've been thrown out of another school workshop for gross insubordination. The old man broke off, coerced firmly into silence. Mark said on the intimate mode, It's not that at all, Uncle Roger. This is serious business. A family emergency. You've got to come home with me right away, and for God's sake put a lid on it while we're in range of Perdita Manion. Do you still have your old canoe and camping gear stashed in your garage? Yes, but... Good. We'll be needing them, and your ground car, too. Do you have any cash available? You know damn well I do, and I always will, until the Futu credit cards conquer the universe. Suspicion. How much cash? Three or four K? Grand Dieu! What kind of trouble have you— Get it, and let's go. Without any further mental exchange, the bookseller rose and put the bottle of whiskey away in a file cabinet. He took a filthy old book-shipping jiffy bag from the shelves of packing materials, extracted a wad of durofilm bills from it, and stuffed the money into his pants pocket. Then, with a the boy following, he went into the front of the store. Mark and I will be going out for a while, Perdita. If Professor D'Alembert comes for his copy of Murray's Mamelon and Ungava, be sure to point out the cracked hinges. But it's still a steal at three hundred. You two run along, and I'll hold the fort, Perdita said comfortably. Nothing's happening at all on a lazy summer afternoon like this. Mark's laugh was strained. That's nice to know. Uncle Roger and I just may take the rest of the day off and go canoeing. Good to see you again, Miss Mannion. The old man and the boy exited into brazen sunshine. High in the buttermilk sky, a single egg-shaped row craft soared westward over the Connecticut River Valley, seeming to waft as slowly as a toy balloon, even though it must have been traveling at several hundred kilometers per hour. There was no other aerial traffic. A sporty black ground car drove slowly past the post office, where on twin poles the flags of the United States of America and the human polity of the galactic milieu hung limp. Across Main Street, at the BP Energy Station, Wally Van Zant was squirting the petunias in the bed next to the egg-charging pad with dewater, following the common folkloric belief that it would make the flowers more spectacular. Mark noticed that the cost of J-fuel had risen five pence since he'd gone off-world. The damned energy companies seemed to do that every summer. It was high time the manufacturers converted turbocycles and private ground cars to fusion, just like commercial vehicles and eggs. More expensive in the short run for the power plant, but cheaper in the long run for the fuel. Roger and Mark went around the corner onto East South Street, to Roger's garage. It was nearly three months since the bookseller had last seen his great-grandnephew, and even in that short period of time Mark seemed to have grown... The top of his black curls was above Roger's shoulder level now. The young jaw, with its deeply cleft chin, was more angular, and the profile was fast losing its childish contour and taking on the distinctive Remillard aquilinity that made Mark's father's face so striking. But the boy's eyes weren't blue like Paul's. They were gray, with a startling luminosity set deeply in shadowed sockets and topped by oddly shaped brows that were thickest at the temple ends, giving them a resemblance to dark wings. On the rare occasions when Mark neglected to maintain his social mental screening, those eyes could flash with a power that was almost heart-stopping. Roger, whose own operant mind powers were unexceptional, was the oldest surviving member of the family. He had experienced the metapsychic usage and abusage of every one of the Remillard stalwarts, and he had no doubt that Mark was the most highly endowed of the lot. He also suspected that the boy might be the most marginally human. For that very reason, Roger had taken special pains to reach out to him, not always with success. From infancy, Mark had contrived to hide behind a barrier of nearly perfect control and self-containment. More unfortunately, there was something about the boy's mindset that reminded the old man of his late nemesis, Victor Remillard, the brother of Mark's grandfather, Dennis. Like Victor, Mark was emotionally cold and prideful, determined to do things his own way while letting the rest of the world go hang. 
On the other hand, the boy's arrogance seemed not to be malicious, as Victor's had been, but rather the almost inevitable consequent of having a skull crammed with more metafaculties than the human soul could safely support. Mark had badly needed an adult friend. His father, Paul, a fiery politician busy about many things, was undeniably proud of his son's brilliance and his preeminent metapsychic powers. But Paul Remillard seemed to have given up years before trying to establish an intimate rapport with his remote eldest child. Mark's mother, Teresa, distracted in his early childhood by her operatic career and her artistic temperament, and later traumatized by personal tragedy, loved Mark with the same vague affection she bestowed upon her other three children. But she, like her husband, had failed in her half-hearted attempts to penetrate the boy's personal shell. Roger had never quite managed to break through that wall of mental armor plate either, but he wasn't about to stop trying. They went into the garage, and Mark put Roger to work gathering equipment, while the boy himself installed the ancient canoe rack atop the old Volvo ground car. There was no verbal conversation, and Roger was patient as he tossed tent, cooking gear, tarpaulins, and nearly all the rest of the camping equipment he owned into the car's trunk and back seat. Mark finished with the rack and revealed how agitated he really was by using his PK to loft the canoe into place, psychokinesis being considered a déclassé metafunction among most operants of stature. Finally, while the two of them clamped the canoe down, Mark came out with an edited version of the emergency in formally cadenced mental speech. My seminar on Okanagan ended early. I thought I'd surprise Mama and didn't tell of you or far speak her. Just grabbed the first flight to Earth and shuttled from Calais to Anticosti, then drove my bike home. When I got into Hanover, I didn't see a soul I knew. I think the whole town is on vacation break. I figured nobody would be at our place except Mama, since Papa's not due back from Concord until the weekend, and the three pipsqueaks are still at the beach at Grand Père's place. I sent my mind on ahead to the house and up to Mama's music studio. I discovered that Grand Mère Lucille was there. I listened to what they said. You're too damned good at eavesdropping, my lad. It'll get you in a peck of trouble one day. Impatience. Never mind that. How much do you know about the genetic heritage of the Remillard family? Confusion. You mean the immortality thing? Not the multifactorial self-rejuvenation trait. The lethal equivalence. Aside from knowing the hell our weird family genes have put Teresa and Paul through, I have only an incompetent layman's knowledge of the matter. All four of us children inherit from the Ramiyara side of the family a dominant polygenic mutant complex. We're smart, we have extremely high metafunctions, and our bodies age up to a certain point and then persistently rejuvenate. The traits have a reduced penetrance and exhibit variable expressivity. You know what that means? Girl, Shani, don't be so damned patronizing. It means some Remillards get a little sum, get a lot, and I'm on the short end of the stick, while you're up to your young stuck-up piff in the good stuff, just like your siblings and cousins and father and uncles and aunts and grandpere Dennis. Exactly. Now, because of Mama's consanguineous relationship through Anarita Latimer, her offspring have an enhanced chance of manifesting one or another of the good traits. Unfortunately, Mama has also contributed a deleterious gene complex to some of us kids. She herself doesn't display any harmful traits, and neither do Marie and I, so it's been assumed that Mama was subjected to a mutagenic factor at some point in her life after Marie's birth in 2039. The deleterious mutagenes appear to be sex-linked, and they have lethal expression in male offspring most of the time. Because Maddie's female, she escaped, but she's a carrier. Luke inherited the harmful mutation, but at least he could be pasted back together into a semblance of the normality. Mama's stillborn babies and the aborted ones inherited intractable lethal traits that defied all attempts at genetic engineering. Hence the revocation of your parents' repro license. But should it have been revoked? Mark, what the hell are you driving at? It's the law. But is the law just? The galactic milieu thinks so. The reproductive statutes are intended to purge the human gene pool of the milieu is a non-human organization. How can it know what's best for our race, what genes are good and bad in the long run? Study after study has shown that the human brain is not susceptible to genetic tinkering. The hereditary factors are too complex and interlinked for any eugenic manipulation. 
What gives those exotics the right to tamper with physical aspects of our human genetic heritage that may harm our mental evolution as an unintended side effect? That's a question without an answer, Mark. And it's been knocking around ever since the intervention, and there's no use at all you stewing over it. The milieu took over the right to control reproduction as a condition of admitting humanity to the galactic civilization, and we accepted it, and that's that. How come you've all of a sudden got your ass in an uproar about this? Damn you, boy, let me see what's really on your mind, instead of beating around the bush like this. The Remyar family includes the most powerful metapsychic practitioners on earth. Who's to say in a crazy, mixed-up genetic complex like ours what is an unacceptable heritage and what isn't? The genetic assay of Mama's five dead babies showed nothing about their mental potential. So what? Physically, the poor little things were losers. The genetic engineering attempts on them failed. The stillborn ones never saw the light of day, and the aborted ones would have been horribly deformed and dysfunctional and destined to die before reproducing. But the minds of the aborted babies might have contributed something invaluable to the earth mind before their disabilities killed them. Mark, I don't understand what you're driving at. Do you mean to say that the brain genes of the babies should have been evaluated along with those for the rest of their bodies? Even I know that it can't be done. Human genetic science has come a long way under milieu guidance, but it can't assay the mind from examining brain tissues any more than it can engineer the mind by tinkering with the brain's DNA. Ordinary evolution is doing just fine transforming our race into metapsychic operants, and the earth mind is coming along well enough toward coagulation under the milieu's reproductive statutes, and I can't see that it matters a hoot whether or not a few poor little crippled babies get to make their contribution. What does matter is that Mama is pregnant again. Impossible. I heard her tell Grandmère. Jesus, God. Teresa can't be pregnant now. She is. Practically on Eve, Earth, Inauguration Concilium? And with Paul heading list of newly announced human magnates? Quelle catastrophe! Your father, rest of family, put in impossible position. How could she? How could she? Mama extracted the contraceptive implant herself. It was no trick at all for a person with her creative talents. She feels that she has a solemn obligation, an obligation to the entire human race, to have this child, even if it means violating the statutes of the Symbiari Proctorship. Sacre nom de Dieu! We all knew that she was tottering on the brink after the loss of her last baby, but she seemed to have snapped out of it. Now this... Your poor mama! All that talent, all that beauty... And it's plain what the source of her madness is. She and your father have always had that idiotic, dynastic obsession about surpassing Dennis and Lucille. This fetus is five months old. Mama says it speaks to her telepathically in a post-infantile mode. Mad, mad! Roger exclaimed out loud. Cette pauvre petite! She's gone over the edge completely! The canoe was now fixed firmly on top of the old Volvo, and all the equipment was stowed. As the two of them got into the car, the boy seemed gripped by an inappropriate excitement. Grandmère Lucille scanned the fetal mind with her redactive deep sense. She heard nothing but the usual chaotic psychoembryonic cycling one would expect from such a young fetus. She had a discussion with Mama and then went away. Of course, she didn't detect my presence. I went in and spoke to Mama, clarifying the situation, and after that I came immediately to the bookshop to get you. But I still don't understand... Grandmère has gone to get Uncle Severin. They'll do an abortion before Papa or anyone else finds out. Maybe tomorrow. Eh, hey, alors? It's the only sensible course. Roger tapped the garage door opener, backed the car out, then closed the overhead door. Slowly they drove up the street. No, it's not. You have moral scruples? It's understandable. You're young and fresh from the Jebbies at Brebeuf, and they filled your mind with idealistic notions of human dignity and worth. But this is the real world, Mark. Not even the Church opposes the reproductive statutes. If a fetus shows intractable lethal genes, it may be aborted. Your poor mamma is deluded sick. She needs treatment. Mark, you're thirteen, but you're a mature person. You know what this illegal pregnancy could mean, not only to the family, but also to the whole human polity. Your parents aren't just private citizens. Paul will surely be nominated first magnate when humanity is admitted to the Concilium in January. If it's admitted. Good God, boy, don't you understand how serious an offense this is? 
Not even your mother's mental lapse can excuse— Mama is quite sane, Uncle Roger. I heard the fetus, too. You— What? It's a boy. What I heard— I can't describe it, and I certainly can't transmit an image of it to a mentality as limited as yours. You'll have to take my word for it, that this baby is something extraordinary. I've listened to unborn babies before, but this one is unlike anything I've ever experienced. God only knows what his metabilities will be. And what about his body? Roger was bleak. If he's carrying lethals, odds are strong that he'll be a physical basket case. But not certain. Luke's disabilities were modifiable. Regen tank therapy and genetic engineering for humans become more sophisticated every day. My unborn little brother deserves his chance. I'm not the only one who would say so, either. There are hundreds of millions of humans who believe that the repro statutes are unjust and should be changed. Roger could think of nothing to say. His deepest, most secret mind level was saying it all. The law still stood. "'accepted by earth as part of the price of the new golden age. "'And in conceiving this child, who might or might not be mentally exceptional, "'Teresa had committed a Class I felony. "'They had driven the short block and a half from the bookshop "'and now stood in front of the Remillard House at 15 East South Street, "'just beyond the public database, which everybody still called the library. "'Roger turned into the driveway, and the two of them got out. Mark's home was a classic New England white clabbered building, with dark shutters, a small porch, and dormers on the third story. One of the windows of Teresa's studio was open, and operatic music poured into the humid green shade surrounding the big old place. A soprano, accompanied by a full orchestra, was singing, in some language other than standard English, a plaintive song of such thrilling intensity and richness that the old man and the boy were forced to stop at the base of the porch steps and listen, enthralled. The voice of Teresa Kaolana Kendall always had that effect, even on family members who had heard her recordings countless times. Roger found that his eyes were filling with tears, that marvelous coloratura, entombed on laser-red record flex, was preserved forever while the singer herself was silenced, sacrificed along with so many other things for the alleged greater good of the human polity of the galactic milieu. And now this new disaster perhaps presaging a final descent into madness and degradation, if not summary punishment by the magistratum, had come about because Teresa, like Paul and so many other ambitious human operants, had believed the Lylmic mentors when they said that human beings would some day possess the most powerful mentalities of any race in the universe. What can we possibly do to help her? Roger whispered. Help the baby. Mark's correction was chilling. A mind like that, of such unbelievable potential, must live. The aria soared to a crescendo, then ended with a soft question that melted unanswered into silence. Roger said, Perhaps, if we could prove to the Symbiari proctors and the magistratum, Mama hears the baby and so do I, Mark said. No one else will. Not yet. And no mechanical scanner has the sensitivity to confirm his mental superiority. His mind is completely anomalous. Then there isn't a chance. The forensic redactors will say Teresa's crazy, and your testimony will be discounted as unverifiable because of your relationship to her and your damned super-screening ability that balks mind-reaming. The thing's hopeless. Mark said quietly, Not if we get Mama away from here. Hide her until the baby is born naturally. He'll be safe then. A legal entity with full rights to life-sustaining care, no matter what his disabilities. The law is clear on that point. Mama will still be culpable, but she can stay out of sight until after the human magnates take control of polity affairs. Then there's bound to be some way to exonerate her. But it's impossible. There's no place on earth where someone like Teresa, with a registered operant metapsychic identity, can hide from the magistratum enforcers, from the Symbiare and Krondaku. I think there is. A hiding place where no one will think to look for an operant. And even if they do a quick scan of the place, they won't think to zero in and identify Mama. Mark projected a mental image that made the old man gasp. You've been there, Uncle Roji, with the connivance of that book-buying friend of yours. You told me all about it, and that's one reason why I need your help now. The boy opened the front screen door of his home and looked over his shoulder. 
You are going to help, aren't you? Sweat had broken out on Roger's brow. His emotional tone was one of sheer panic, even though the boy was making no attempt to coerce him. You know what happens if we're caught? Roger asked. To us and to her? Maybe to the whole damn human polity if your father doesn't denounce his own wife for violating the statutes? The risk is worth it. Papa can do what he has to do to save his precious reputation if the fact of her illegal pregnancy comes out. Distance himself from Mama's action. Even cooperate fully if there's a search. But no one will even know she's alive if this plan of mine works. And they won't be able to prove we're accessories either. I can put a block in your mind, and they'll never be able to probe deep enough into mine to get the truth. Later, Mama's bound to be vindicated in the court of public opinion for carrying an exceptional metapsychic to term. The repro statutes will be modified. You can't be sure of that. On January 6th, the human polity will be admitted to the Galactic Concilium, to full voting membership in the milieu. The Symbiari proctorship will finally be over, and the green leaky freakies won't rule us like children any more. We humans will finally be able to control our own destiny, our own reproduction, as well as everything else. And when we do, we'll show these exotics what real mind power is. Roger regarded the thirteen-year-old with consternation. If this unborn little brother turns out to be anything like you, the exotic races may wish they had never intervened. Mark uttered a short laugh. Then he said softly, Somehow Mama's unconscious mind reached out all the way to Okanagan, to me, the only one who would be able to save her. In the normal course of things, she lacks anything like the mental power needed to span such a distance. But this time, I think she was helped by a meta-concert with that unborn baby. A mind like that must not be lost to humanity. I'll do anything to save him. Anything. Roger felt his heart contract. And what about your mother, for God's sake? Both of them, Mark said, smiling. Of course, both of them. The smile vanished like a brief ripple in deep water. There's not much time. I told Mama to pack some things. We've got to get her out of here right away. I ordered a Hertz egg for us. It'll be here in half an hour. Now I want you to come upstairs and help me reassure Mama. Mark opened the screen door and went into the house, leaving Roger standing on the porch. The bookseller said to himself, This is lunacy. Mark doesn't understand the implications. With Paul's wife, a fugitive from justice, the Symbiari proctors might decide to delay the concilium inauguration. They'd love an excuse. Would Paul even be able to prove he didn't conspire with Teresa? His mind is almost as ream-proof as Mark's, and they'd suspect he was hiding the truth. Jesus Christ, what a mess! Operant fetuses! Debetees! And all we need is another damned super-minded Rumiar! Aren't there enough of them throwing their weight around and making things tough for us poor lame-brains? Both Mark and Teresa could even be imagining the baby's telepathy. It could be some neurotic thing, some weird psychic guilt transference between mother and son, and me caught in the middle of it. Mark can't really force me to go along with this plot. He can't coerce me from a distance, and he certainly can't coerce me close up indefinitely, and even if he tries it, the fact of his coercion could be dug out of me by any one of the family grandmasters as easy as cracking peanuts. The kid'll realize that, too. All I have to do is point this out to him calmly and tell him that his loyalty to his mother is commendable, but the scheme to hide her is impossible. I could sneak back to the bookshop right now and call Severin. No. Mark, damn it, listen to reason. Roger, listen to me. Mark and Teresa are telling the truth. You're not the kid? No. You know who I am. Ah, oh, no. Oh, shit. Roger, mon cher fils, tu me fais mal non noir. God damn it, I don't feel so jerky myself. You must help Teresa and her unborn. It is necessary. Ghost, we're talking class one felony. Pour la mot de Dieu. Exasperation. No more vacillating. There is no time to waste. Do exactly as young Mark tells you. The hazards increase for every moment that you delay. You lilmic bastard! Roger hissed, shaking his fist at the sultry air. 
The reproductive statutes are part of your own galactic milieu. Why don't you simply tell your symbiari minions to make the exception? Why do we have to play these games? The screen door opened by itself. Roger felt a none too gentle nudge. Mad a contre mad. I'm going, I'm going. The old man hurried into the house and up the inside staircase to the second floor, continuing to mutter Franco obscenities. Two flies that had managed to sneak into the house along with Roger fell out of the air, and the little bodies lay kicking on the rag rug in the entry hall. Then the screen door opened again, the flies were propelled outside, and the door swung slowly shut. The insects crawled groggily about the porch floor for a moment, then spread their wings and flew away. Chapter 5 From the Memoirs of Rogatien Romillard a digression. The metapsychic pioneers, Denis Remillard and Lucille Cartier, had lived in the old house on South Street for more than thirty years, while raising their seven amazing children. Paul, the youngest and most mentally formidable of the brood, was born in 2014, the year after the intervention. He was the only one of his siblings to be educated in utero by means of the new milieu preceptorial techniques and by the time he grew to adolescence he was acknowledged as the first human Grand Master Metapsychic, with powers that were so overwhelming that he was virtually guaranteed a concilium seat at such time as humanity's long probationary period ended. In 2036, when Paul was 22, and already media conspicuous for political maneuvering, read circumventing the Symbiari Proctorship's more inconvenient restrictive ordinances, as well as being the most brilliant scion of Earth's first family of metapsychology, he met Teresa Kaolana Kendall, a young woman of a Hawaiian extraction who was a celebrity in her own right. She was a musical prodigy who had made her debut at the Metropolitan Opera in New York the previous season, singing the fiendishly difficult roles of the Queen of the Night and Lucia de Lammermoor. She was barely nineteen, and the storm of critical and popular acclaim greeting her had been colossal. The New York Times had called hers the voice of the century, a rare, exquisitely high sopra acutissima that is perfectly controlled and full of ravishing color. Teresa Kendall was also beautiful, and a natural actress, and her stage presence, even at that early age, had a magical quality that differentiates a talent from a superstar. The rather inhibited young Paul Remillard found her singing to be an unfailing aphrodisiac. Even people who ordinarily did not care for operatic music idolized the glamorous young performer. She was also metapsychically operant, although her higher mental faculties were by no means as spectacular as her vocal abilities. The modern-day disparagers of her legend like to hint that the voice's effect was a mere psycho-creative illusion a mesmerizing of the audience by the mind power of the singer. But this is patently ridiculous. While it is true that Teresa's popularity owed something to her coercivity and charm, as is true even of non-operant divas, the voice stood on its own merits, unique and phenomenal, as her recordings prove. Less than five months after Teresa and Paul's first meeting, they were married on the Met stage at the close of the 2036-37 to season, the set was from the last act of a Russian fantasy opera that had been revived especially for her, which she had sung to tumultuous acclaim. The bride was attended by the production's principals, all still in gorgeous Slavic costume. The groom wore conventional black tie. The Archbishop of Manchester in New Hampshire, a noted opera buff and a close friend of the groom's distinguished parents, performed the ceremony. It was witnessed by a mob of singers, stagehands, supers, technicians, musicians, and most of the rest of the opera company, and as the bride and groom kissed, the Met Chorus made the chandeliers shiver with a recessional version of the hymn to love from Turandot. Sundry Ramillars were in attendance, including a certain elderly bookseller. So were Teresa's mother, the noted actress Anarita Latimer, her father, the distinguished astrophysicist Bernard Kane Kendall, and her lovely and spectacularly rejuvenated grandmother, Elaine Donovan. The collateral consanguinity of the couple, even had it been acknowledged, would have been no real obstacle to this marriage under milieu law. 
It would be another matter altogether when Mark and Cynthia Muldowney determined to marry many years later and their true relationship came to light. The production that Teresa had starred in on her wedding night was, portentously enough, The Snow Maiden by Rimsky Korsakoff, a dark fairy tale with a disturbing ending. But no one thought about omens at the time. Teresa was captivated by the dashing Paul, eager to have his children, who would certainly be metapsychic giants, and confident that she could continue her singing career with a few minor adjustments to her schedule. Lucille and Dennis turned their big old home on South Street over to the newlyweds and moved to an elegantly refurbished farmhouse on Trescott Road, east of Hanover. By then, Dennis was Emeritus Professor of Metapsychology at Dartmouth College's Metapsychic Institute, and the rejuvenated Lucille was the doyen of faculty society. At first, Paul and Teresa seemed to share a union written in the stars— Three mental prodigies were born to them in quick succession, Mark, Marie, and Madeline. The family was saddened when Mark's twin, Matthew, actually the firstborn, died at birth, but the small tragedy was quickly forgotten and its import quite unappreciated at the time. Like most opera singers, Teresa had the physique of an athlete, and she had her first three babies easily, retiring from the stage only during the final month of each pregnancy. The precocious infants were nursed backstage, in rehearsal halls and dressing rooms, and even in the cabin of the luxurious Remco Rowcraft that the family corporation provided to shuttle the prima donna between her home base in New Hampshire and opera houses in New York, London, Milan, Tokyo, Moscow, and a dozen other Earth metro regions. She also sang on the populous colonial worlds of Asawampset, Atarashii Sakai, Chernozum, Londinium, Etruscia, and Elysium on the exotic planet Sponsor Brevin, the Poltroian Artistic Center, and on Zugmeipel, where adoring Guy packed the house to the rafters for her week-long engagement in La Traviata. In an ultimate tribute, sixteen particularly keen Guy opera aficionados expired in aesthetic ecstasy at the climax of her final performance. Paul was tolerant of his wife's professional absences, at that time he was deeply involved in the burgeoning new bureaucracy of the human polity of the galactic milieu. This organization had operated in the beginning as an apprentice metapsychic government, under the stern guidance of the Symbiari Proctorship, and independent of non-meta-earth governing bodies. But by the time Paul came on to the political scene, twenty years after the intervention, the pupils were clamoring ever more vociferously to take over the whole school. Pre-intervention modes of Earth government had by that time been almost completely metamorphosed into the peculiar Republican setup that the Lylemic overlords had deemed most suitable for the human polity. This combined the intimate citizen involvement of New Hampshire town meetings on the lowest civic levels with a kind of operant oligarchy in the highest judicial and executive branches. The whole was a tiny representational tree structure, providing a voice in government for each citizen via precinct or township, for each corporation or cooperative enterprise involving more than a thousand persons, for each metro region or city, for each zone, a region often encompassing a former small nation or state, and for each quasi-continental area called an intendancy. The highest level of public office, that of intendant associate, included both operant and normal humans. Non-metas tended to greatly outnumber persons with higher mind powers in the lower levels of government, but in the judicial system the opposite situation prevailed. By and large the human polity shaped up pretty well. Most vestiges of old-fashioned human bloody-mindedness, stubborn nationalism, and fanatical religious opposition to milieu precepts had melted away on earth by the fourth decade of the twenty-first century. The infamous Sons of Earth and their anti-exotic transmogrification were one of the few dangerous exceptions to this general rule. Mind-reading, exotic overseers, and ombudsmen made most forms of political dishonesty obsolete. There was still a certain amount of traditional crime and chicanery and prejudice and injustice, but it was no longer flagrant. Law enforcement was administered by both operant and normal human officers, supervised by the magistratum of the Symbiari proctorship. 
The meeting out of condign punishment for legal transgressions was swift, and recidivist criminals were dealt with very severely. Members of the metapsychic elite who were convicted of high felonies usually faced the death penalty. The great majority of normal humanity was afire with enthusiasm for the brave new world under the aegis of the galactic milieu. It was, of course, somewhat humiliating for the prouder earthlings to be governed by the humorless Symbiari race, who had been assigned to accelerate our psychosocial maturation. The exotic proctors, after all, were green. Their physiology made them the inevitable butt of cruel human humor, and their severity and jaundiced view of human weakness sometimes provoked hatred and even outright rebellion. On the other hand, poverty and other kinds of deprivation were now obsolete on earth. The educational system ensured that most people fulfilled their potential. Virtue and hard work were rewarded. There was ample leisure, and if one felt hemmed in, there were challenging new worlds to conquer on the colonial planets set aside by the milieu for humanity's surplus population. The normal, overt, conscientious objectors to milieu policies although never coerced or directly punished for resisting the galactic social revolution, were denied positions of power, deprived of media publicity, and eventually consigned to the ZPG reproductive class. After 2040, they were also forbidden access to the coveted rejuvenation technology, and sequestered from participation in the milieu's garden of advanced socio-economic and technical delights. Some of these recalcitrants managed to escape the milieu via Madame Guderian's notorious time-gate to the Pliocene epoch. But for the most part, non-operant misfits, such as the religious fundamentalists and other square-peg individuals, lived and died embittered and ostracized. Almost inevitably, their children became estranged, even those who were educated outside the milieu-controlled public school system and when the children reached their majority, they almost always rejected the reactionary values of their elders and opted instead for the mental testing and intensive higher education that would prepare them for life in the human polity. The operant conscientious objectors to milieu policy were altogether another kettle of fish, whose adventures will take up a large part of these memoirs of mine. Three of Paul's older operant siblings, Anne, Catherine, and Adrian, had chosen careers in human polity administration, training under the exotic proctors for the day when Earth's growing operant population would form the highest level of human polity government in the Galactic Concilium under an elected first magnate. After Paul joined his sisters and brother as a member of the North American Intendancy, he rose quickly by dint of statecraft and grand masterly mental gamesmanship to the highest rank permitted members of a client race, Intendant Associate. From his eminence, Paul coached his lower echelon sibs, and within two years they were also grand master metapsychics and Intendant Associates. Thus, the first hint of the Rimiar dynasty raised its nose above the horizon of the unsuspecting milieu. With a minimal bit of coercion, Paul prevailed upon his remaining three brothers to jump on their metapolitical bandwagon as well. Severin abandoned neurosurgery, Maurice gave up sociological research, and Philip, the oldest of Dennis and Lucille's children, reluctantly quit as CEO of Remco Industries, the continuing fountainhead of the family fortune. Nepotism being perfectly acceptable to the ethical statutes of the milieu, although some spoil-sport humans cried foul, the seven Remillard siblings linked minds, destinies, and mental constituencies, and soared. Dennis and Lucille preferred the academic world, resisting Paul's attempts to draw them into politics. The parents regarded their ambitious offspring with wary bemusement, but the family nonetheless remained very close. In time, all seven siblings achieved grand masterly status and were elected intendant associates. While Teresa's musical career continued to flourish, Paul devoted himself to the lobbying effort that would culminate in the selection of Concord, New Hampshire, as the capital of Earth and the human polity in 2040. This feat earned him the media sobriquet of the man who sold New Hampshire. 
Paul acquired a smartly trimmed beard to enhance his image as a senior legislator, published several books extolling his vision of galactic humanity, and became a fixture on the Tri-D Talking Heads circuit. His wit, physical attractiveness, and reassuring, to normal humanity, image as a spokesman for the conservative, metapsychic viewpoint, made him appealing to a wide spectrum of human factions, as well as to the urbane Poltroian auxiliaries within the proctorship, who dearly loved watching an earthling outwit the earnest, efficient, scientifically advanced, but undeniably cloddish and doer Symbiari overlords. Paul and Teresa's fourth child, Luke, was born epileptic, blind, and with severe bodily deformities. The baby's metapsychic armamentarium was enormous, but nearly latent. By 2041, the year of his birth, genetic engineering techniques were able to restore Luke's twisted little innards and useless eyes to the human norm. Complete restoration of his body would have to await the advent of puberty when it would be possible to use regeneration tank therapy. Redactors had less success alleviating Luke's epilepsy, which was of a puzzling etiology. However, a device implanted in the child's brain eventually prevented the worst of his seizures. Luke's travails were a source of anxiety and severe nervous strain for Teresa. It became more and more necessary for her to pamper her voice, and she cut back drastically on the number of her operatic and concert engagements. Nevertheless, her repertoire of personal triumphs expanded to include roles such as Manon, the long-neglected Lachmé, Juliet, and the Queen of Shamaka in Rimsky-Korsakov's Le Coq d'Or, which had not been mounted by a major opera company since the heyday of Beverly Sills. Therese's signature role, however, remained the title character of Snyegurichka in The Snow Maiden, another of Rimsky's gorgeous but psychologically murky fantasies that was scarcely ever performed outside the Soviet Union until Therese's electrifying portrayal popularized it overnight. Teresa's personal and professional decline began when her next baby was stillborn in 2043. A comprehensive genetic assay of the tangled Remillard Kendall heritage was still many years in the future, but a number of lethal genes were identified in Teresa's germplasm, and both she and Paul were found to carry the so-called immortality gene of the Remillards, actually a unique polygenic inheritance that augmented the self-rejuvenation capacity present in every human being. In spite of the genetic problems, both Teresa and Paul were determined to have many more children, just as brilliant as the first four. Their efforts resulted in two additional stillbirths, followed by two lethal trait bearers confirmed by prenatal testing. The most advanced techniques of genetic engineering, having failed to ameliorate the stigmata of the defective fetuses, they were aborted according to the guidelines established by the reproductive statutes of the Symbiari Proctorship. Teresa was tormented by depression during this period, suffered two brief mental breakdowns, and little by little began to lose her glorious voice. The final blow came when, in spite of all Paul's efforts, the couple had their reproductive license revoked. Teresa was pinpointed as the founder of the mutagene complex and received a contraceptive implant. She retired to the house in Hanover, where she clung to sanity by doing vocal exercises in futile hopes of a comeback, and dreamed of outwitting the exotic puppet masters who had imposed their benevolent despotism on virtually all facets of human life, even motherhood. Paul was bereaved by the tragedy, but more philosophical. Of course, his own seed was untainted, and he might have divorced his wife and married again. However, he was still devoted to Teresa, even though the intense passion of the early years had cooled, and he was immensely proud of the surviving children. Divorce was a distasteful option, given the climate of the times and the old-fashioned brand of Roman Catholicism espoused by most of the Remillards. Paul might have followed the example of his close friend and rival European intendant associate, Davy McGregor, who, like many persons of superior genetic heritage, had contributed sperm to the gene pool that would help populate the colonial planets with non-borns conceived in vitro. But the strict anonymity of the banked sperm setup clashed with Paul's sense of procreative pride. He wanted to know his children. And where there was a will... There was also a way.
He had never lacked for feminine admirers, and now that Teresa, although still beautiful, had lost her unique libidinous appeal, Paul put aside his religious scruples and set about to maximize his own genetic potential with discreet and dedicated fervor, and a good deal of willing cooperation from ladies of preeminent chromosomal content. He and Teresa still shared a bed, but as metasensitive spouses do, she knew that her husband was unfaithful. She never stopped loving him, and never reproached him. Nevertheless, it was undoubtedly Paul's continuing betrayal of their marriage that gave a dark impetus to Teresa's determination to have one last, supremely endowed child. Chapter 6 From the Memoirs of Rogatien Remillard Teresa had obeyed her eldest son, and packed. When I came into her music room, she was showing the contents of her soft-sided carryall to Mark. It contained a portable tri-D, a plaque reader, an audio player, a rolled-up Yamaha Scrollo keyboard, two Bose Dinky Boom amps, a Fleck Library boîte, a power supply for the above gadgetry, a little toilet kit, a dozen cotton baby nappies, plas overpants, two terry cloth infant suits, a swan's down bunting that had been a shower gift for her firstborn before the twins were diagnosed, a rain poncho, a ball of twine, a perma match, a split of Dom Perignon, and a Swiss Army champ knife with every kind of thingummy on it but micro manipulators. Mark was looking over this collection with frozen incredulity. She, sweetly reasonable, was explaining to her son that the twine was for tying the baby's umbilical cord and hanging up laundry, while the champagne would celebrate Jack's birth. Jack, Mark said faintly, his name will be John, J-O-N. That's the spelling I prefer. I've explained to him already about nicknames. She acknowledged my entrance with a blithe nod. Your Uncle Roger may call him Tijon, of course, in the Franco-American tradition. Mama, all this musical stuff, Mark protested. I told you to pack only the essentials for survival. These are the essentials, darling. I couldn't possibly endure four long months in some dreary rustic backwater without my music. But you've no clothes. She waved this off with an airy gesture. I can buy those at the local shopping mall when I get there, wherever there is. Meanwhile, this ensemble would be smart as well as serviceable en route. Don't you think so, Roger? Teresa was not a tall woman, but she gave that impression larger than life. She wore a stylish, polished cotton jogging suit of her favorite Kendall green, and had tied back her shining black hair with a matching green silk scarf. Flung over her shoulders was a hooded sweater of fauve cashmere. She wore medium-weight, rightly hiking boots on her feet. It was a fine outfit for a jaunt up Mount Musalok with a Dartmouth outing club, but for wintering in the depths of the B.C. mountains. My gaze slid away from hers, and I kept my thoughts hidden. Uh, Teresa, didn't Mark explain that this place you're going to is a howling wilderness? No malls, no stores at all, not even a trading post within a hundred qualms. She shrugged. Then I shall simply have to throw myself upon the charity of the local inhabitants. She flashed that brilliant smile of hers. Perhaps I can give little concerts or music lessons in exchange for warm clothes and such. Mark almost shouted, Mama, the only local inhabitants in the Megapod Reserve are them. Oh, said Teresa her exquisite brow knit in a frown of resolute determination. Well, I'll get along somehow. I was a Girl Scout, you know. She held up a boîte the size of a deck of playing cards. My Fleck library has some excellent references. Along with my opera videos and music recordings and vocal scores, I have duplicated all the books and movies in our family collection downstairs and called up some more from the public library that I thought might be useful. Camping in Woodcraft by Horace Kephart sounded wonderfully pioneering from the catalog synopsis, and I couldn't resist some survival books by Bill Riviere and Bradford Angers that I remember reading when I was little and went to stay at Grand Alain's summer cottage in Maine. Such wonderful Franco-American names those authors have. 
and for literary atmosphere I have Walden and The Call of the Wild and the complete poems of Robert Service. Mon Dieu, I muttered. Teresa didn't even hear me. She sailed serenely on. The matter of the birth should be easy enough to manage with my training in Lamar's and the obstetrics book I processed into the flex. Jack says he'll be born easily. He's going to be a small baby. He doesn't quite understand my explanation about the diaper thing yet, but I'm sure it'll sort itself out once he's actually free of the amniotic fluid and experiencing the concept of dryness. And he won't really need many clothes inside the house if I keep the heater turned up high, will he? What heater? I barked. I had been listening to her idiotic prattle with open-mouthed horror. What house? The place is nothing but a broken-down log cabin with a rusty old iron stove, for God's sake, and it's been disused for nigh on to forty years. You'll have to cut wood. Teresa flourished her Swiss army knife. Fortunately, it has a very sharp saw blade. Of course, I have never had to use it yet, but I expect I'll learn how very quickly. And there would be lots of dry branches just lying about, wouldn't there? Plenty, I said gently. Only thing is, by the time winter comes, which will happen around the beginning of November at that latitude, the wood will be under three or four meters of snow. Mark was even more mentally opaque than usual. Maybe the enormity of what he contemplated had finally penetrated that supremely self-confident young ego. He turned to me, a sudden awful decision, making his mind blaze. I thought you'd just help me take Mama there, Uncle Roger. She assured me that she'd be able to cope if I fixed her up with plenty of supplies. But I realize now that we'll have to work things out another way. You're going to have to stay in the cabin with her. You know all about wilderness survival and that stuff. I simply stood there stunned, with my mind bleeding dismay and pollulating blue funk, while the two of them exchanged nods of agreement. Mark said to me, We can pack a few more clothes for her at least. As for you, I'd planned a provisioning and equipment buying stop. We're using your camping gear as a basis, and you can make a list of the other stuff you'll need. Teresa said, If I'm allowed to take more of my own things, I want my nightgown and a robe and slippers. And if it's really going to be cold, the big down comforter. You'll love that, Roger, for long nights sitting in front of the fire. We can squish it into a tiny bundle, and it won't take up any room at all in the luggage. I finally managed to overcome my vocal paralysis and blurted, Now just a damn minute! We're talking four months in the wilds? What's going to happen to my bookshop? Miss Mannion will take care of the shop, Mark said, just as she always does when you're out of town. With my initial shock slowly receding, I realized the bookstore should be the least of my worries. I whimpered, We'll be tracked down and arrested before we ever get out of New England. Not if I toss a few blivets into the system, Mark said. Uncle Roger, don't worry. I'll see that you get to the reserve safe and undetected. I've got everything worked out. Well, that's just friggin' dandy, I said. And I suppose when Teresa and me are all settled in and comfy in the cabin, with the critters gathering outside licking their chops, you'll just fly back home and pretend that nothing's happened. And no one will suspect a thing. Not your father, not Dennis or Lucille, or your gung-ho intendant uncles or aunts. Not Enforcer Chief Malatarsis and her squad of magistrate and mind-fuckers, when the family's forced to drag you down to Concord and get your young brain peeled like a hard-boiled egg? Nobody, said Mark calmly, messes with my mind. And I told you I have a plan all worked out. Teresa smiled, stood on tiptoe, and kissed my cheek. I'm so glad you're going to stand by me, Roger. You know, I was just the least bit apprehensive about having to cut the wood. Her charm melted me like a popsicle on a griddle. She whirled away into her adjacent bedroom to secure the additional items, and I flung up my arms in surrender. Oh, hell! The three of you have got me backed into a corner, and you know it. Mark had the grace to grin. Ace coercers. Me and Mama and Jack. The young devil was so confident he had me buffaloed that he didn't even probe my mind. And a damn good thing, too, because I wasn't thinking of the baby at all as... Coercer number three. 
I turned away from Mark and stared out the street-side window of the studio, letting my wits freewheel in total discombobulation. Suddenly I spotted a small white ovoid and a larger scarlet one drifting past the tower of the Catholic Church. "'Here comes the Hertz service egg towing that runner row you ordered,' I observed. "'I suppose I'd better go down and sign it out.' "'I'll come with you,' Mark said, "'to help with the details.' I might have known he had some fairly unusual details in mind. The Hertz agent waiting for us outside was a pretty young thing in her twenties, normal-minded as they come, and the name tag on her uniform blazer said Siri Olofsdotter. Mark's coercion turned Siri's smile to stone and her lushly fringed eyes into green glass. She stood in the driveway between the two parked eggs and my old Volvo with a canoe on the roof, a credit card machine in one outstretched hand and a dangling set of Plas Rowcraft keys in the other, as motionless as a stop-frame hologram image in a Tri-D commercial. Mark had not only paralyzed her, but also erased her memory of coming to Hanover, and he later extended the amnesia to include subsequent events involving law-breaking Remillards. Little pearls of sweat formed on Ceres' downy upper lip, while she waited in the summer heat, oblivious to any skullduggery. My terrible young relative sat himself down in the driver's seat of the woman's service egg, getting ready to bamboozle the Hertz firm's computer. We tell it she never came here. We tell it that the red 2051 Nissan Peregrine GXX with New Hampshire tag BWS229 is in the shop for regular maintenance and will stay there for 24 hours, he began to mutter into the command mic. Resigned to my fate, I detached the keys gently from poor Siri's fingers and opened the red egg. It was a luxury model with an oversized boot. We were going to travel in style. I wondered how Mark planned to fudge North American air traffic control and the ever-vigilant sky troopers, to say nothing of the row field neutralizers, the warm body detectors, and the other alarm systems that guarded the perimeter of the reserve itself. Patience, the juvenile delinquent said. First we send this good woman on her way. He climbed out of the service craft and said to the Hertz agent, Into your egg. She obeyed like a lovely robot. Now start up and fly back to Burlington International. You have been out for coffee. You never came here. You never saw us. The vehicle's door rolled shut. We stepped back as Siri lit the thing up. The faintly glowing purplish net of the safety-jacketed row field clothed the egg's outer surface. The machine retracted its pads and hovered half a meter above the ground for a moment. The woman inside now acted perfectly normal, and paid no attention whatsoever to us. She jockeyed neatly out of the driveway, floated to the middle of the street, signaled properly, and swooshed straight up out of sight. A few dry yellow elm leaves swirled in the vortex, then settled back onto the pavement. Mark checked his wrist chronograph. Nearly 14.30. You go get Mama, Uncle Roji, while I do a few little modifications on our egg's electronic ident system. Now you listen here, I protested. Even though I do have a license, I'm not all that much of a hot dogger flying these things, especially cross-country and vector-free. Usually, when I rent one, I just plug into a canned routing and put the thing on auto and take a nap or read until I get to my destination. But there are no V-routes up in the B.C. boonies where we're heading. The last time I went to this place, I got picked up at the Bella Coola Skyport by my friend Bill. I haven't the least idea how to find the reserve. Mark had the eggs tool kit out and was removing the panel of the navigation unit. Don't sweat it. I'll be doing the flying. I might have known. Oh, well, what's one more crime added to the stack? Get Mama, Mark repeated. You'll be driving her in your car to the fairgrounds down on River Road. Stop at a convenience store along the way for a few picnic supplies. Make certain somebody in the store remembers seeing you. Park in the fairgrounds lot down in the grove of trees near the riverbank. I'll meet the two of you there with the egg, and we'll transfer the equipment and be off. But how do you intend to... That's enough, Uncle Roger. His coercion rocked me back on my heels, but an instant later he was radiating soothing vibes and I was climbing the steps. 
No one will see the egg here in our driveway, he assured me. No one will see it at the fairgrounds. Trust me. Now get upstairs and tell Mama she has three minutes to get down here. We've got a long way to go in a very short time. The first thing Mark had done in his scheme to foil the bloodhounds was to change the transponder identification code of the Hertz egg, a mere class four felony, so that its license tag now became Vermont WRT-661, as far as the sensors of Area 603 Air Traffic Control Syscom were concerned. He flew the thing on manual to our rendezvous beside the Connecticut River and was there long before Teresa and I arrived in the ground car, which gave him time to program a few more illegalities into assorted computer systems scattered across North America. His creativity blurred the row craft so that it blended into the scenery and remained unnoticeable to non-operant observers, a virtuoso upgrade of an old trick long cherished by operant children. After the camping gear was loaded in the egg and the canoe hidden in some brush down by the river, we left my car parked in plain sight. The row craft, still screened from casual detection, took off at barely subsonic speed from the deserted lot, rose to the local programmed airway entry altitude, 1,120 meters, and hovered. Mark let out a great exhalation of relief as he ceased the meta-creative camouflaging of the vehicle, which was a bit of a mental strain for him at that age. Then he filed a perfectly ordinary flight plan that allegedly originated in our small local airfield a couple of qualms west of the fairgrounds. We filed for Boston Metro, just as though we were taking an ordinary jaunt to the big city. The display of the navigation unit came up with a menu of optional routes based upon the heaviness of the traffic patterns at the moment and invited the driver to make a selection. Mark chose one of them, saying, Express, into the mic. The unit said, Traffic control regrets that express service to Boston on V2A36 is unavailable at this time due to a minor system malfunction. We apologize for the inconvenience. Service is due to be restored within approximately two hours. Fastest alternate, Mark said, unperturbed. Thank you. We are programming. Your preset average velocity on the route displayed will be 1,000 kilometers per hour. Your estimated travel time to Boston Metro periphery is 10 minutes, 12 pip, 2 seconds. Please confirm V route and destination. Confirm, said Mark. Go. The unit said, entering controlled airspace and the autopilot took over. The red egg went full inertialess and ascended to a cruising altitude of 12,300 meters before we could blink. The half-dome polarized, dimming the high-altitude sunlight, and the landscape of New Hampshire began to roll beneath us as we zoomed southeastward. Within a few moments, we were part of a stream of ever-increasing numbers of row craft that shared our airway. Mark and Teresa were blasé in the face of this spectacle, the boy was now studying a display of aeronautical charts, and Teresa, sprawled elegantly on the rear banquette, told us she was going to take a nap. But I was still unsophisticated enough about egg travel to stare at the swarm of different-sized aircraft flowing along in orderly lines on all sides, the position of each monitored and controlled by faraway computers. We were spaced ten meters apart, private vehicles of every sort, many decorated with spots, stripes, swirls, or other idiosyncratic ornamentation, taxis and other commercial transports, and large and small haulers and service craft with company logos emblazoned on their skins. The odd Symbiari saucer or Poltroyan cigar-shaped orbiter stood out in the mass of multicolored ovoids like an exotic toy in the midst of a flight of gaudy Easter eggs. Up here in the bright stratosphere, where the sky was always clear, the faint reticulation of the vehicular row fields was invisible. In inertialess flight, there was no sound of wind or mechanism, not even a sensation of movement unless one looked down or watched individual eggs glide toward the outer edge of the procession as the traffic computers shunted them to some new vector. Gradually, I began to relax, and even managed to drink a Pepsi from the sack of picnic food. When we were within a few minutes of Boston, our vicinity display showed a blue police cruiser blip hard charging up from behind us in free flight. 
I was aware of Mark tensing, his mind poised to exert coercion, but no official notification came up on our display or blared from the speaker, and no Sigma tractor beam laid hold of us. The cruiser, beacons scintillating, shot past us on the left like a cobalt meteor and disappeared. The navigator said, ETA Boston Metro, three minutes. Please indicate new V route or give alternative command. Failure to exercise navigation decision will result in your vehicle being inserted into a holding pattern. Mark said, Destination Logan International Airport departures. Departure for which carrier? The unit inquired. United, said Mark. Your estimated travel time to Logan International Airport United Departures via controlled airspace is 4 minutes 7 pip 2 seconds. Please confirm destination. Confirm. Go. Along with hundreds of other aircraft, we began to descend through a lumpy overcast and decelerate. In an orderly aerial promenade, the streams of eggs separated and went their individual ways, moving neatly through other columns of vehicles, traveling in other directions at other preset altitudes and velocities. It was raining in Boston, but traffic control routed the road craft around potentially dangerous cumulonimbus cells, and of course no other aspect of the stormy weather had any effect on the vehicles. There were plenty of private eggs heading for the airport, and several dozen accompanied us on our intricate course to the United Underwater Embarkation Area. Teresa woke up as we landed on the shower-lashed entry pad and were diverted onto the conveyor that would carry us beneath Boston Harbor. She looked around at the familiar skyline in puzzlement. But what are we doing here? Relax, Mama, Mark said. We're only going to stay long enough for the sensors of the airport to log the fake identification of this egg in short-term memory. When we stop at the departure platform, I'll change the egg's transponder code again. After we exit, we'll fly V-free away from the airport into Boston itself, then re-enter controlled airspace from the MIT interchange in Cambridge across the river. But why? Teresa asked. My plan should preclude anybody's realizing that we left home by air. They're all going to think that the three of us stayed in New Hampshire and went canoeing. But in case anyone should see through my scheme and try to trace our route out of state, I'm covering our tracks. You see, the authorities have a short-term record of every vehicle using the V-routes. Three days from now, the record will be purged. If somebody thinks to sift traffic's memory before that, there's a remote chance they may spot the fact that the Vermont registration of this row craft is fake thus fingering it as our getaway vehicle to Logan Airport. Once we arrive here, however, the bogus egg effectively disappears when I change its transponder code, and so do its passengers. You can fly almost anywhere on Earth from Logan, and if the gate attendant is suitably coerced, you can even do it without a ticket. I never would have thought of that, she said. But Paul would have... We were now gliding down a ceramental gullet in the wake of a little yellow sob that had elaborate rosamalling motifs ringing its full dome canopy. The young couple inside it were locked in a passionate public embrace, having neglected to turn on the privacy screening. Mark was scowling at them. But then what do we do? Teresa asked him. How will we get to British Columbia? From Cambridge we set a new controlled express course to Montreal, filing our flight plan under the new license code. It's very unlikely that we'll be traced to Montreal, but just to be safe, we pull the same registration switch at Dorval Airport, where huge numbers of road craft move in and out every day. Then we hopscotch to Chicago and pull the stunt again at O'Hare. We V to Denver and switch, then on up to Vancouver and switch, and finally go to Williams Lake, British Columbia, where we change registration for the last time. Then it's XV to the hideout and dump you two off, and I return via a completely different routing. If everything works as I've planned, I'll be home in the wee hours tomorrow, and the plan will be working before anyone can sort out exactly what happened. Good heavens, Teresa murmured. How very complicated it all sounds. She had never learned to fly. She thought navigation was a bore, and there were so many tedious rules you had to follow if you wanted to travel at usefully high speeds on the V-routes. Mark continued, All of those traffic control zones except Williams Lake are very large metros, with hundreds of thousands of eggs flying on the computerized airways every day. 
I think the chances of the magistratum seeing through my scheme and tracing us to the Williams Lake end of the sequence before the three days are up are nil. But even if they do, from there we're going to free fly the final distance. So theoretically, you and Uncle Roger could be hiding anywhere from the Arctic shore to the Queen Charlotte Islands. Not even the Krondaku would try to comb an area that size with a rough body scan. And I've got a way to foil the operant signature far scanners that I'll explain later. How long will the entire trip take? If we luck out and express all the jumps from Boston, it would take about three hours to get to Williams Lake. Another half hour or so at XV Max will get us to Uncle Roger's friend's place out in the bush at Nimpo Lake. We'll probably kill another couple of hours en route getting the food and equipment, but we also gain three hours due to the time zone differential. That far north, there should still be plenty of daylight left to fly into the reserve, and the weather up there is good. I just checked. Teresa was mystified. But, darling, what difference does it make whether we land in the reserve in daytime or at night? And why worry about the weather? I knew the answer to that, and so did Mark. He told her soothingly, Don't be concerned about it, Mama. Just relax. We were coming into the brightly lit airport departure gate where there was the usual jam-up of private eggs and taxis and limos discharging travelers onto the platform. People were lined up at standby counters looking depressed the way they always do. Piles of tagged luggage awaited the attention of overworked porter robots. Babies cried, business travelers slouched, outbound vacationers bounced about excitedly, and the airport police strolled around, keeping an eye on things and muttering into their wrist comms. The two people in the yellow egg ahead of us were mushing it up again. Like other private vehicle arrivals, they would have five minutes of authorized parking before the Port Authority took note of their tag number and required a very good explanation for the prolonged stay. Cautionary signs were everywhere, reminding drivers to tell their guidance systems to exit when the warning flashed on the dashboard. Oh, dear, Teresa said as we came to a stop. I really think I ought to visit the loo. Mark had the privacy screening up and was already tinkering feverishly with the transponder. If you must, he said evenly, but if you take longer than the allotted five minutes, our ident gets logged in long-term memory and a human cop comes over to scope us out. The cop could decide to cite us, and then he'd notice that the external license number of our egg and its transponder code don't match, and we could all be dead. She blinked. I believe I can wait. Mark finished his fiddling and slammed the panel back into place. The warning light had not even come on when he told the command to Mike, Exit! Smoothly, the conveyor took hold of our egg and sent it back toward the surface. A few minutes later, we had re-entered controlled airspace at Cambridge under the cloak of our new registration and were hurtling toward Montreal at 2,000 kph. Chapter 7. From the Memoirs of Rogatien Remillard. We could all be dead. There were a fairish number of Class I death penalty felonies on the books of the Symbiare Magistratum, and an operant's deliberate contravention of the reproductive statutes was one of them. So was aiding and abetting. Mark might escape capital punishment because of his youth, Teresa on grounds of insanity, but for me, and for Jack, there'd be no tomorrow if we were caught. But somehow I had a feeling we wouldn't be. The mysterious, exotic presence that I called the family ghost had ordered me to undertake the trip, and it wouldn't send me to my death, not unless it no longer needed a human cat's paw to further its inscrutable designs, a contingency I very much doubted. The last time the ghost had actively meddled with my life was a rather innocuous incident in 2029, when I had been commanded to attend a fantasy convention in London. There the ghost told me to summon Ilya and Katie Gorry's daughter, Mary, up from their home in Oxford. The girl was simply to be introduced to a science fiction writer acquaintance of mine named Kyle MacDonald. I would not comprehend the logic behind that little transaction for another forty-eight years. I did my best to put aside all worry, settled back in my comfortable banquette, 
ate potato chips and tried to relax as our red egg raced through the ionosphere. Following Mark's orders, I compiled a list, or rather three lists, clothing, equipment, and provisions of the things we were going to need for the four months or so of our stay in the Canadian wilderness. I hardly noticed when we touched down briefly at Montreal and Chicago, but when we reached Denver, Mark decided it would be safe enough to do some shopping. We traveled X-Vector to the big REI outdoor store at Alameda Square, and Teresa and I engaged in a tornadic shopping spree. We didn't get everything on my lists, but we made a respectable dent in all except the food. An hour later, we were on our way again, with most of the back seat jammed with plunder. Teresa and I began organizing things and packing them into duffel sacks, while Mark engaged in some heavy, far-sensing, staying in a trance throughout most of the flight to Vancouver Metro. When he finally snapped out of it, he told us that Lucille had discovered Teresa's disappearance and drawn the worst possible conclusions. She had informed Paul of her suspicions, and he was so shocked by the double whammy of learning that his wife was both illegally pregnant and possibly scarpered that he was still in his conquered office, vacillating about what to do. He'll figure something out soon enough, I opined grimly. Call a family council of war, most like. I wonder how long it'll take them to think of me. Perdita Mannion will tell them that you and I went off canoeing together, Mark said, and they know I could screen us from far sensing if I wanted to. They can't automatically assume we're with Mama, or even that Mama has run away. They certainly won't do anything to precipitate an official hue and cry. And when I return tomorrow and tell them my story... What story is that, dear? Teresa asked. She was examining a compact Matsushita wood zapper and its instruction manual with fascination. The ionospheric stars shown above our egg's dome and the vicinity display showed no other aircraft closer than tin cloms. It was such a hot afternoon, the boy said, a dreamy expression coming over his face. Uncle Roger and I decided to go canoeing on the Connecticut River below Wilder Dam, and we took you along, Mama. Somehow we capsized in the Heartland Rapids. I got a knock on the head. I clung to the overturned canoe, all woozy and witless, while Uncle Roger tried to save you. He was very brave. I think I remember both of you saying telepathic prayers at the end. Oh, how sad, Teresa exclaimed. And how clever of you, darling. My jaw dropped. Good God, was this Mark's foolproof scheme? Somebody will find me in the canoe washed up on the shore down around Escutney early tomorrow morning, Mark went on. Too bad they won't find you two, except one of Uncle Roger's shoes and Mama's green scarf. Do you really think Paul and Dennis are going to fall for this fish story? I inquired, oozing skepticism. You won't be able to coerce them like you did that poor girl from Hertz. No, Mark conceded. But neither Papa nor Grandpere will be able to prove I'm lying, and my tale will serve as a plausible diplomatic fiction for the family to use, one that will be impossible for any officials of the magistratum to refute, unless they trace this flight. The fact of Mama's illicit pregnancy will probably come out. If only Grandmere hadn't told Papa about it. But she did, and he'll have to satisfy his precious sense of duty. Still, I'm virtually certain that Mama's supposed death will get Papa and the family off the hook until after the inauguration of the magnate designates in January. But everything really depends on you, doesn't it? I pointed out to Mark. Whether or not you'll be able to resist the mind probing of the most powerful human and exotic redactors trying to get at the truth. He looked sidelong at me with that strange smile of his. I'll resist, he said. Count on it. We made very good time flying in Canada with nary a sighting of the air patrol. Additional far-sensing by Mark of the Ramayars back home revealed a good deal of backing and filling going on among Paul and his powerful siblings and the latter's spouses. There was no firm consensus on whether Teresa had decamped or simply gone off innocently for the day. 
None of the items Teresa had taken with her were likely to be counted missing by Lucille, so the formidable family matriarch really had only her suspicions to guide her. Dennis, with characteristic intelligence, had undertaken a methodical, seeker-sense dousing of Hanover and vicinity, searching for the missing woman. I thought this was rather bad news with respect to the canoe disaster scenario Mark planned to use, since his grandfather was probably the premier aura scanner of the human polity. But the boy only shrugged off my apprehensions. If I'm presumably lying unconscious on the banks of the Connecticut while Mama and you have drowned, he said, my aura would be diminished to the point of undetectability, and yours would be extinct. It doesn't matter if Grandpère fails to scan any of us. The Vancouver Williams Lake V route took us almost due north along the valley of the great Fraser River, through a landscape that was, during those years, still fairly well settled by farmers and ranchers. The profligate lumbering operations that had stripped away so much of the Canadian forest earlier in the century were now at an end, and nature was fast reclaiming the remoter parts of the Caribou and Chilcotin country. As in other marginal parts of the world, many of the people who had struggled here for generations to earn a hard scrabble living had gone away, electing to migrate to the new colonial planets of the galactic milieu. Williams Lake, the terminus of our vectored flight, was then a bush metropolis of 10,000 souls. Here we went first to a hardware store and, using my diminished pocket full of cash, bought items such as wire, nails, spikes, heavy plas sheeting, a couple of lamps that would run off Teresa's little sealed fusion power supply, lots of heavy-duty rope and cord, duct tape, a portable block and tackle thingy called a come-along. The cabin was going to need repairs. Your average log weighs upward of 150 kilos, and my PK is weak in the extreme. A Swedish saw as back up to the wood zapper and my two axes. I had neglected to sharpen my own camping saw as usual, so we had left it behind. Three metal buckets, a basin, a chisel, and some wedges. Then we went to a drugstore and got vitamins and chapstick and lotion and first aid supplies and pads for Teresa's postpartum needs. At the bay, Hudson's Bay Company, that is, which Mark was surprised to find looked just like a regular department store, we got ten meters of thick wool duffel cloth, a bolt of white cotton flannelette for baby things and miscellany, some needles and thread, a big pot, a Dutch oven, and a tea kettle. At the liquor store, we got six bottles of Lamb's Navy Rum, 151 proof, for the comfort of the poor bastard, c'est moi, who would have to do the hewing of wood and drawing of water. That pretty well wound up the equipment list. We had obtained some freeze-squeeze camping rations at the Denver REI, most notably hamburger, tomato flakes, carrots, green beans, and ten kilos of dried eggs. But the rest of our food was to be purchased at the Williams Lake hypermarket. Our red row craft was now pretty well jammed with stuff, and my money was running low, so we were obliged to have the quantities of staples on my list. I managed to talk Teresa out of necessities, such as extra virgin olive oil, canned liver pâté, smoked char, red wine, and chocolate-covered liqueur cranberries. We did get flour, margarine, lard, dried milk, dried peas and beans, white and brown sugar, pasta, oatmeal, dried fruits and mushrooms, instant potatoes, coffee, tea, instant orange juice, and soup mix. We got salt and baking powder and yeast and dried garlic and onions, as well as peppercorns, bay leaves, chili powder, oregano, and a few other herbs and spices. To Teresa's horror, for she fancied herself a gourmet cook, we got ten kilos of non-perishable Velveeta cheese ragunas and a half case of Spam. We got five kilos of bacon. We got canned Norwegian sardines. We got twelve big Hershey chocolate bars. We got Adolph's meat tenderizer for which I would later thank the saints. We got broiler foil and giant degradable plas gar bags and soap and toilet paper and four liters of chlorine bleach. Mark said he would bring more food and supplies to us once the excitement died down, positively before the middle of November, when winter would really begin to set in in our refuge. I told him he damn well better not forget, since the food we had would only feed Teresa and me for about three months. I had insisted upon one last piece of equipment, and left Mark and Teresa to wait for me in the egg while I went into a sporting goods store to get me a gun. 
Mind you, I wasn't really afraid of the mild-mannered denizens of the reserve, but I was damn near petrified of grizzly bears, the only kind of wildlife in North America that seems constitutionally unwilling to share the landscape with humanity. I'd read plenty of horror stories about these gigantic brutes, who were mercifully not very common in the lower United States, and I knew that the Canadian coast range was crawling with them. I didn't want any modern photon weapon either. No, sir. The best of zappers available to the earthling general public at that time were apt to be unreliable in foul weather, going plasmatic even in drizzle or ground mist. So I picked out a Winchester Model 70, 30-06 bolt-action rifle with a hooded front bead and adjustable rear sights, and a couple of boxes of ammo, paying for them with almost the last of my human polity dollars. In a place like Williams Lake, in those days, nobody thought it was unusual for a person to use cash instead of a credit card for such a purchase, nor was there any kind of a rigmarole about registration or a waiting period. A rifle was just another workaday tool in the Canadian boondocks. The only firearm I had ever used was Cousin Gerard's old twenty-two Mossberg, which my brother Donnie and I had plinked beer cans with when we were eleven. Don had gone on to become an enthusiastic hunter, but I had never killed an animal in my life. We will draw a veil over my three homicides. All the same, just hefting that good old classic piece and sighting down the Winchester's dark steel barrel made me feel all macho and self-confident about surviving winter with a pregnant woman in the midst of a subarctic mountain wilderness. What a flaming idiot I was! When we left the town for Nimpo Lake, a tiny resort settlement located just outside the reserve, it was around 1800 PDT, more than an hour and a half before sunset. The area we flew over now was a high plateau sliced by canyons and dry seasonal watercourses. As we flew west, the rangeland turned into scrubby evergreen forest, and this thickened to clothe low mountains dotted with countless lakes and bogs. On our left hand, Rising ever higher toward the south was the rugged spine of the coast range, where many of the peaks topped 3,000 meters, and one, Mount Waddington, exceeded 4,000. Some of the wildest and most spectacular scenery in North America was to be found in the part of British Columbia we were heading into. The Megapod Reserve itself had an area of nearly two million hectares and extended from the rain-forested Pacific fjords to the eastern slopes of the coast range. There were no towns within its boundaries, no tourist facilities or campsites, no roads or trails. Row craft were prohibited from overflying it below an altitude of 20,000 meters. The entire reserve was ringed with row field neutralizing generators that would first give warning, then cause trespassing eggs to be shunted into the arms of the law at Bella Coola. Assorted alarm systems around the Megapod reserve perimeter were designed to betray unauthorized persons afoot or using ground transport who might disturb the rare creatures for whom the reserve had been dedicated. Gigantopithecus megapodes, called Tokimusi, Sokuyam, Sosquatl, and Sasquatch by Native Americans, known to the Tibetans as Migu and to other peoples of the Himalaya as Yeti, named Junxian in China, Almas in Mongolia, Bonmunus in northern India, Abana Ayu in the Abkhazian Caucasus, and Gulbi Yavan in the Pamir Range, the animals had long been considered to be legendary. The scientists of the Soviet Union who captured the first living specimen in the high Tian Shan called it Snezny Cherovyak, the snowman. The Canadian biologists who discovered a relict North American breeding band of the huge Pongids in a remote valley west of Mount Jacobson in British Columbia referred to them by the traditional name of Bigfoot, and established the first refuge. After the intervention, the entire surviving world population of Gigantopithecus, 38 males and 26 females, was tracked down by metapsychic means and resettled in the expanded B.C. Megapod Reserve. By 2043, the year of my own clandestine visit, the number of big feet had increased to nearly 200, and they were designated as a galactic treasure. The giant apes throve in the remote wilderness of the reserve with the barest minimum of human contact. According to law, 
Only scientists and the trained foresters who tended to the propagation of the native flora and the regulation of other animals indigenous to the reserve were permitted access. Casual entry by the vulgar citizenry was strictly prohibited. But there were ways. I had become interested in the Bigfoot a decade or so before as a result of acquiring an estate collection of books on the subject. In the course of my advertising the collection for sale, I corresponded with a man named Bill Parmentier, a devoted Bigfoot buff who operated a little fishing and hunting resort on Nimpo Lake. The countryside thereabouts had been reputed to be the stamping grounds of the fabulous Sasquatch since before the arrival of the white man. Bill Parmentier's forebears had claimed many times to have sighted the elusive giant apes, only to be derided as superstitious stump jumpers by more sophisticated British Columbians. But eventually vindication came. In his videograms to me, Bill displayed interesting family relics, underexposed old photos of strange footprints, people posed beside trees, indicating just how tall a big foot they were sure they'd seen, and even a picture of a tuft of reddish hair, allegedly from a Sasquatch, that had been handed down from a relative who had had the shit scared out of him one day in 1936 while logging in the Bella Coola River Valley. Parmentier also hinted that he'd seen the creatures himself. Fairly often. Fairly recently. It wasn't tough to manage if you were a local, he said, and knew the ropes. I let him have the collection of books at a bargain price. And one dull, rainy September Sunday, after I'd indulged in a few too many highballs, I called him, old-fashioned phone system up there, no teleview, and talked to him in French. Hey, us Canucks have to stick together, eh? I begged him to let me see the wonderful living fossil monsters, too. He said, hell, why not? Work season for the wardens is over the last of August. Been thinking of going in myself to fish. A week later, I was up there, peeking out the broken window of the abandoned forester's cabin on Ape Lake that he'd stashed me in, trying not to wet my pants as a Bigfoot family eyeballed me from less than five meters away. The father and mother looked like King and Queen Kong, dressed in odoriferous auburn fur. Junior was about my height, 185 cents. They ate the fresh peaches I'd set out for bait according to Parmentier's instructions, and then, when I indicated mentally that the fruit was all gone, they threw the pits at me and took off. I tell you, it was an experience. Then, one day, years later, I told a certain weird kid about my adventure. I also mentioned that the mental aura of the telepathic Gigantopithecus was spookily similar to that of operant humankind. Mark figured out by himself that the steep mountains surrounding Little Ape Lake would tend to foil all but a close-up, far-scan scrutiny, even when the object of the search had a registered mental signature. There were a few fishermen having supper at the Nimpo Lake Resort when we arrived. In the manner of their kind, they paid absolutely no attention to us when we came into the lobby, cum dining room, of the quaintly rustic main building, looking for Parmentier. The proprietor remembered me well, whacking me on the back and greeting me in effusive Canuckqua. He offered sotto voce congratulations on my having acquired a lovely new young wife and a strapping stepson. Briefed by Mark, I had the story all ready. First, we would all have a quick meal. Rare steaks would be just dandy. Then we wanted good old Bill to take us to one of the fishing camps he managed on isolated Kidney Lake in Tweedsmuir Park, just east of the reserve boundary. We realized it was a little late in the day and kind of short notice. But a problem. All I had to do was fly that fancy egg of mine over to the dock bed and dump out the gear. Bill would get the beef loaded, cranked up and ready to go while we ate. Later, when the steaks and delicious garden salad and baked potatoes with sour cream and chives and the blueberry pie with vanilla ice cream were only a memory, the three of us strolled down to the dock. Teresa took one look at our upcoming mode of transport and gave a terrified squeal. We're not going in that. Of course we are, said I haughtily. But does it really fly? Teresa asked. Parmentier was just a tad miffed. Madam, she's flown for sixty years and may well go another sixty. 
The de Havilland Beaver is the workhorse of the North. She's reliable and cheap and goddamn indestructible, and I wouldn't have one of them finicky Rowcraft eggs in trade if you paid me. The 20th century aeroplane rode on the glassy water atop two floats. It was vaguely dented and patched, and the windscreen plass was age yellowed and etched with a patina of fine scratches. But the beaver's saucy orange and white paint job was fresh, and the single propeller was a truly beautiful artifact of varnished laminated wood, without a nick or chip. The aircraft looked elderly but businesslike, and so did its pilot. Our bags and boxes of supplies and equipment filled the entire open tail compartment and most of the area behind the pilot and co-pilot seats, leaving a minimal amount of space on the bare metal floor. Roger, you and your boy just crawl in there and squat, Bill directed. Your lady can ride first class up beside me. No seat belts for us? Mark was aghast. But this aircraft has an inertial propulsion system. Parmentier guffawed merrily. Don't hardly need seat belts when you got no seats. Just hang on to that side strap if you feel scared, Sonny. We all climbed aboard. Our pilot began throwing switches, and a minute or so later, the big radial engine burst noisily into life. Bill warmed her up. Then he advanced the throttle, and the beaver roared across the lake toward the setting sun, climbing rapidly and making a deafening noise. Teresa was terrified and gripped the edge of her tattered seat. I was aware of Mark flooding her mind with calming redactive impulses, and I could have used a few myself. The aeroplane circled steeply to give us a nice view of the idyllic resort scene below, tumbling Mark on top of me, then came around to a southwesterly heading. Next stop, Kidney Lake, Parmentier shouted. But it wouldn't be. At an appropriate moment, Mark would seize the pilot's mind with his coercion and compel a course change to another destination, thirty kilometers deeper into the precipitous, glacier-draped mountains. After Teresa and I were dropped off, Mark and Parmentier would fly back to Nimpo Lake. A post-hypnotic suggestion would convince Bill that the Rimiar family had decided not to fish at Kidney Lake after all. Mark would fly away in the Red Egg, privacy screens up, and return to New Hampshire by another circuitous route. He would return the Hertz Egg to Burlington International Airport in Vermont and take a bus home, fuzzing his identity psycho-creatively. And then the charade would begin. Mark said to me on the intimate mode, You're certain that this aircraft can fly through the road trap barrier? Sure as hell did before. That's an internal combustion engine. Runs on J-fuel. No dynamic field technology at all. As I understand it, all of the reserve personnel use antiques like these, or old-time helicopters, when they fly into their work sites. But they only go to work during June, July, and August. Rest of the year, the place is officially closed. Deep snow. And the alarm systems? Parmentier's got a black box stashed in the beaver's instrumentation that cancels the alarms. A lot of the locals do. Some of them work in the reserve part-time or ferry and supplies. They also fly into the reserve during the off-season when they get a hankering for some really spectacular fishing. The wardens wink at it so long as it doesn't happen very often. You saw that rainbow trout lunker mounted above the fireplace back at the lodge? Bill caught that years ago in one of the reserve lakes. Gosh, lust. But fishermen never go to Ape Lake. It's all milky with glacial silt. No fish. Bill told me there are critters, though. Grizzlies and wolves and cats and lots of mountain sheep and goats. A few moose down in the lower end of Ape Creek Valley. And, of course, the big feet themselves. It's really a gorgeous spot. Very dramatic, that remote basin with Mount Jacobson hanging right over the cabin site and the glaciers calving into the far end of the little lake. Of course, I wasn't there in winter. Mark said, You'll manage, Uncle Roger. I mind nattered on. Teresa and I will have to lie low for another week until September, and then we won't have to worry about having our chimney smoke spotted by anything human. Say, remind me to steal Bill's map of the area so I have a better idea of the lay of the land. I didn't bother to get a compass because Jacobson is such a blatant landmark. Only an imbecile could get lost. Christa Tabernacle. I forgot snowshoes. Well, I suppose I can make some. I wonder what else I forgot. 
Why don't we set up a head scared, and if I think up anything important, you can bring it. Mark said, I won't try to far speak you from home. It would be too dangerous even on intimate mode when the investigation is on and I'm under suspicion. I'm bound to be under surveillance for a while. But I'll be back sometime between the 1st and the 15th of November with plenty of food, and I'll try to think about the stuff you might also need to last you until the baby is born. I said, we'll be watching for you very eagerly. He said, thank you for everything, Uncle Roger. Then his coercion reached out and took control of Bill Parmentier's mind, and the last leg of our strange journey really began. Chapter 8. Rye, New Hampshire. Earth. 24 to 25 August, 2051. The Hydra hung high in the sky and looked into flames. They flashed yellow from the sea salt on the burning driftwood and blue around the crackling, chewed-over spare rib bones that Audrienne had made them toss in. Silly Audrienne, prancing busily around among the kids and adults, checking to make sure everybody threw napkins and paper plates and potato skins and other barbecue leftovers into the fire. Bossy Audrienne. She was even worse than her mother, Sherry always hassling the family with Mickey Mousery when all a person wanted to do was relax on the beach and go switch off. The Hydra considered the tyrannical eldest daughter of Sherry Logier Drake and Adrian Rumiar through the flames leaping and decided that one day it would certainly take care of her. Hello, Hydra. Thinking the best kind of thoughts, I see. God, it's fury. Christ Almighty Fury, I'm so glad. It's been so long, so long. I began to think you witch of the West melted. Lately all this milieu mind love shit crowding out good stuff. Just biding my time, Hydra. All things have proper season. Turn, turn, turn. Waiting for our turn. Chuckle. And here you are at last. Does it mean... Yes. Tonight's the night. Yearning, eagerness, sex, excitement, fear. You don't have to be afraid, Hydra, never afraid. I'll guide you, show you how. Trust me, it's going to be cosmic. Better than the nerve bomb? Light years. Taking life force this way is the ultimate high trip. Cunning old fury. Who? Look out there on the water. You see? Him. Hydra, don't tell me you are afraid. Goddamn fuck shit, no! Just show me how. He really does deserve it, you know. What a prick. So does she, the silly superior bitch, but I understand why he's the one, and it's going to be all right, it really is. I'll do it. It's just after midnight now. You'll have to wait a bit. Right. Thrill. Act natural. Go to bed like everyone else after the last swim. But no sleeping. If you fall asleep, you'll screw me up. I'll tell you when it's time to start and everything else you have to know, sweet Hydra, darling Hydra. Nerve bomb. Nerve bomb. Please, God, God, God. Nerve bomb. Nerve bomb. Give it to me. Give it. Ah. <sighs> oh, Fury, how I love you. The little white trawler rocked making concentric vermilion rings on the black bonfire-painted Atlantic. Then after a time the boat floated level and quiet again, and the water smoothed. They lay flat on their backs on the deck, hands joined, coming back, watching motionless stars and speeding satellites and listening to the faint laughing and shrieking from the rest of the family on the beach. His wrist calm, which was all he wore, tapped twice on his carpal tendons. Midnight, my lovely cat. Happy birthday. She uttered a mock moan. Brat, you beast. Do you really have to remind me? Forty-two. Immortal hypocrite. You know very well that you look like a twenty-year-old. You're glorious and irresistible, and I'm mad for you, and tonight I need you once again, my comfort, my love, my joy, my wife. We need each other. Come, banish the last doubts. This time rise to me. Reassure us both. He levitated slightly, turned over, and drifted open-armed above her. She raised her own arms to him and whispered, I wouldn't abandon you and our work for the world, Brett. Not for the whole milieu. No one can make me. No one. 
Her long blonde hair lay in shining coils on the deck matting and all over her nude body, veiling it from throat to knees. She framed his face with her hands while he kissed her mouth and eyelids and pressed his lips to her warm palms before guiding them to his already awakened sex. His mind said, They're going to insist, tempt you with a power, appeal to your family pride, jocosity, urge you not to break up the set, laughter. You and the children are my family. My pride is in our work, and it will continue as our love continues. Cat, my dearest darling, steadfast cat. He parted the thick tresses above her breasts and tongued the nipples, increasing the feedback of psycho-creative energy that had begun once again to flow between them. She caressed him, deepening the erotic current, intensifying its neural rhythm through the magic that only operant minds possessed. Their bodies closed slowly. Tendrils of her hair rippled and wafted into the air, undulating and questing, stroking his shoulders and flanks, twining with soft strength about his arms and between his legs, drawing her up to him, enfolding both of them in a silken, fluid medium that shimmered in the starlight. They floated, coupled but now motionless, and let the metapsychic tension build, then held themselves on the brink until neither could resist letting their minds ignite the discharge. The wave crested, broke, subsided slowly into a tide of warmth and peace. Its ebb carried away the last vestiges of irrational anger and guilt from his heart and the lingering temptation from hers. Together, he whispered, we'll live and work together, always. Even though the galactic milieu had demanded otherwise. The exotic legislators in the orb world, acting within the mystery they called coagulate unity, had weighed the merits of every adult human operate. By means of unfathomable criteria, they had selected only one hundred, out of hundreds of thousands, to be inaugurated as the first human magnates of the concilium. No one was surprised that all seven members of the so-called Ramayar dynasty were included on the roster. But Catherine Remillard, alone of the family, had not sought the honor, had made her disinterest emphatic. As a member of the milieu's governing body, she would be required to give up the child latency project, the work in the polity education ministry that she and her husband, Brett Doyle McAllister, had devoted the past seventeen years of their lives to. The program had borne prodigious fruit. More than 50,000 latent children between the ages of five and nine raised to operancy by means of the subtle, creative, redactive regimen that Cat and Brett had developed together, working in painstaking meta-concert. But their work was not finished. The program was still too primary-oriented to help the majority of latent youngsters, those over the age of nine, but lately there had been hints of a potential breakthrough. The exotics in Concilium Orb were apparently willing to sacrifice the McAllister Remillard Research Partnership for some nebulous greater good. But Cat was not. Late yesterday afternoon, she had notified both the Intendant Assembly in Concord and the Concilium that she was turning down the magnate ship. Her decision had caused a sensation. There was going to be a high old family row, of course. To postpone it, and to shore up resolution, and ostensibly to celebrate her birthday, Cat and Brett had fled their research establishment in the capital of Earth and egged to the beachfront mansion in Rye that was the summer home of Cat's younger brother, Adrian, and his wife, the sculptor, Sherry Lozier Drake. This grandiose old place, which was only half a climb down the beach from the more modest summer home of Denis Remillard and Lucille Cartier, had been in the Drake family for generations, its twenty rooms rendering it a conspicuous white elephant. But all that had changed when Sherry married one of the distinguished offspring of Dennis and Lucille. She and Adrian had six children, and Sherry would eventually acquire a horde of operant nieces and nephews that numbered more than thirty. Fortunately, she was a warm-hearted child nurturer and an enthusiastic hostess who championed tribal conviviality, with the result that from late May until September, the enormous carpenter gothic house on the beach was almost always full of youthful guests, and Sherry got very little sculpting done. 
professional parents would show up when their work permitted, and other relatives were encouraged to join the mob scene for parties, particularly the annual Fourth of July beach picnic and the Labor Day crab and lobster feast that traditionally closed the summer season. Cat and Brett, whose four children were close in age to those of Adrian and Cherry, kept a modified Dutch trawler named Doolittle at the Rye Harbor Yacht Club, less than a kilometer south of the big beach house. Other family boaters, especially Paul with his splendid Nicholson catch, and Anne, who had spent the day racing in her swan, sneered the modest McAllister stink pot. But Brett and Cat had no love for the hard physical labor of sailboating. Putting about in Doolittle was soothing. The fact that the trawler had lately become too small to accommodate their four growing children also suited Brett and Cat just fine. When they were gravity-bound on the deck again, he gently untangled himself from her hair. There's sure to be a certain amount of family hell to pay over your decision, Cat, but eventually they'll come around, even Paul. Every operant educator in the polity appreciates the importance of our work, and no one but you is even remotely competent to evaluate the configurations of our pilot secondary level project. She nuzzled his ear. There's no one else who can make sense of your redactive programming gestalts, you mean. My genius lies in converting yours to practical application. We're still more than a year away from getting the ultimate refinements really nailed down. But when it's finally ready, millions of kids with latent metapsychic talents will be unblocked and freed to use their higher mind powers, kids who would otherwise have been condemned to a lifetime of normalcy. Abruptly, she sat up. Brett, you know we mustn't speak of it like that. Mustn't even think about it that way, even though we true people know we are the chosen, the elite, the future, the heirs and successors to poor normal humanity. God, maybe that's why I feel our project is so urgent, even more urgent than finally admitting humanity to the galactic concilium. The division, the gulf between operant and non, must be bridged, and as soon as possible, for our sakes as well as theirs. It will be, he soothed her, speaking aloud. I didn't tell you because there were so many other things on my mind, but that wretched Gordo still has the meta-bigot complex insisted. I didn't excise it after all. The miserable boy simply pulled the wool over the mind of his own shrink mother. Brett laughed. He got up and began pulling on his dungarees. A chill breeze had sprung up, and he handed Cat a velour robe. Gordo's eleven. Perhaps it's time for old Dad to take over his civilizing, with sterner therapy measures. Well, we might do well to consider it. Lately, I just can't seem to get through to the child, Brett said. Don't fret. Not about the world's kids. Not about ours. For now, just think of the loving. She began braiding the extraordinary hair into a single thick plait. Her voice was low, her thought flavor bittersweet. I do think of it, of you and me together, always. And I wanted to go on forever and to hell with our responsibilities to operant humanity, to hell with the aspiring normals and the arrogant exotics and everything and everyone except you and me and the sea and stars that are nothing but little lights in the sky. Shush. You know you don't mean that. He swept her into his arms and kissed her one last time, and then they went into the pilot house and started the engine of the white trawler and headed back to the harbor. The Hydra skulked among the mooring slips of the yacht club, hiding behind a big garbage dumpster until Doolittle was finally docked among the gaggle of Vermeer sailboats, a sturdy snow goose awkward in the company of sleek terns and frigate birds. Waiting. Waiting. Then it was time. Nobody awake on any of the other boats, and the watchman safe in his cubicle, watching a porno video and beating off. Be very quiet. Use your coercion at max on both of them. Yes, Fury. Stumble. Shit! Terror exasperation. Damn you, quiet! If they far-scan you, it's over. Forever! No, please, no. Look, nobody noticed. It's all right. Very well. Carry on. Easy. Now, hit her first. You'll need all your power just to sink her in REM sleep. Yes, that's fine. Now, get on board quickly. Drag her back to the cabin. Good. Now, him. Ready, Hydra? Ready, at last, my sweet Hydra? Really ready? Yes? Begin at the top of the head. 
Catherine Lemillard awoke at dawn, cold and aching and faintly nauseated, hearing the gentle slap of wavelets against the trawler's hull and the voices of three fishermen up on the dock quarreling about the quality of the day's bait. She was lying uncovered on one of the bunks. Her skull was splitting. How very odd! In the way of metapsychic spouses, she cast about for her husband's aura, but he was apparently nowhere nearby. She swore mildly, got up, and secured warmer clothing from a locker. After she had dressed, she went forward to the potted house and found Brett lying there and screamed. He was face down, and his dungarees and jersey had been burned from his body. Most of the skin was charred and cracked, revealing a terrible red moistness beneath. Along the spine and the back of his neck and head, the burning had been deeper, blacker. But along his body's dorsal midline, there were seven curious white areas, patches of ash about the size of a palm print, each one having the distinct outline of a different, intricately drawn, multi-petaled flower. Catherine Remillard's mind was lost to rational thought, and she did not really notice the patterns. She only screamed again and again and again, and the three fishermen came running, and the watchmen, and eventually the Rye Township police. The Hydra was back in bed long before then, sleeping and sated and out of fury's reach. Chapter 9 From the Memoirs of Rogatien Remillard Teresa and I stood on the tiny rocky beach of Ape Lake, surrounded by our collection of duffel bags and boxes, which now seemed very meager indeed. We watched the de Havilland beaver disappear behind a wooded slope above Ape Creek, which drained the lake at its eastern end. When the buzz of the aeroplane engine finally cut off, I had to bolster my emotional screen to prevent Teresa from detecting the sudden panic that washed over me. I was no longer concerned about Paul or the Magistratum tracking us down. What frightened me was the isolation of this place, and the responsibility I had assumed by agreeing to hide here in the wilderness with an inexperienced, mentally unstable woman, who harbored in her womb a child marked for some awful galactic destiny. Forcing myself to concentrate on practicalities, I began to move our supplies off the exposed beach and into a patch of shrubbery where they would be hidden from aerial observation. The sky was indigo, except for a residual carmine radiance at the opposite end of the four-kilometer lake, where the sun had gone down behind the heavily glaciated crags of what would one day be called Mount Ramiyar. A single bright planet hung above the mountain's shoulder, the lake waters were pale opal blue, ruffled by the float plane's dissipating wake. Across the water was a steep, 1,800-meter ridge that connected two anonymous peaks that I later christened Mount Mutt and Mount Jeff. This precipitous opposite shore was thickly forested with spruce and white bark pine in its lower reaches, and had sparse patches of dwarfed and battered Krumholtz trees and tundra vegetation at the higher elevations. Tree level at this latitude was about 1,500 meters, but much of the lake shore at the western end was barren moraine or ice-scoured rock. An arm of the huge Files Glacier formed a natural dam at that end of the basin, and small icebergs that had calved off its face were white specks on the distant waters. Behind us, Little Megapod Creek chuckled as it flowed down from another ominous hanging glacier that nearly hid Mount Jacobson, only the hulking summit of this peak, more than 3,000 meters high, was visible. To the south, a delicate pink afterglow tinged snowfields covering Talchaco Mountain, which was even higher than Jacobson. We seemed completely hemmed by ramparts of rock and ice, alone in a secret oasis of alpine forest and high meadows, where the last flowers of summer still bloomed, and milky water lapped the lichen-crusted boulders at our feet. Teresa said, how lovely. Her mind was smiling. It is that. I was casting about with my inefficient seeker sense. Uh, do you detect any critters? She sat down on one of the supply boxes, eyes shut and concentrated. Birds, she whispered. Something small up the slope among the trees. It may be a hare or a marmot. No big feet? No bears? No. Oh, she... May I just sit here for a moment? 
I want to describe the place to Jack. He's very interested. And something seemed to say, yes. I felt the hairs creep at the back of my neck and ventured a telepathic query. Baby? Jack? Is that you? There was no response. Teresa had become pensive and inaccessible, and the baby's thoughts, if I hadn't imagined them, were doubtless linked to hers. I picked up the duffel that held our sleeping bags, my little old dome tent, and the necessities I had set aside for our first night in the wilds. It was going to be dark soon, and the beach was too narrow and rocky to camp on. I decided to take a look at the cabin site, which was up the slope. From the air, the log structure had seemed much more dilapidated than I had remembered from my visit of eight years earlier. I thought I might as well find out the bad news right away. I climbed up a dim trail that angled off to the right of the creek through a tangle of stunted mountain hemlock and Engelmann spruce. The way was steep but short, and I came almost at once to a reasonably level little bowl-shaped clearing where the log cabin stood. The structure had originally been erected on a 4.5 meter square foundation of cemented field stones, with a small set of concrete steps leading to the east-facing front door. The four walls remained more or less intact, although in places the cement chinking between the logs had fallen out. The north side window from which I had watched the Sasquatch family still had glass. The pole roof had collapsed from the weight of too many winter snows, scattering nearly indestructible silvery cedar shakes all over the rotted wood plank floor. The cabin interior was a jumble of moss-clad poles and broken rusty stovepipe sections. The crumbling bunks and other rustic furnishings, I remembered, had mostly biodegraded into nature's green maw, but I did spot one corner of the iron stove peeping coyly from beneath the growth of scrubby willow that had made itself at home among the moldering floorboards. I took a deep breath and told myself there was no reason to panic. I was simply going to have to repair the cabin before the snow flew, using our small stock of tools and whatever information on the subject might be found in our Fleck library. I had never constructed anything more elaborate than a pre-drilled bookcase in my life, but in my veins flowed the blood of voyageurs, coureurs de bois, and ten generations of bushwhacking Franco-Canadians. There was also, in a pinch, the family ghost. I would manage. I found a suitable spot for the tent and wasted no time setting it up and camouflaging it lightly with evergreen branches. Mosquitoes and other biting insects were beginning to home in on me, in spite of my meta-coercion, and pretty soon it would be impossible even for an operant to move around outdoors without a head net or plenty of insect repellent. There was just room inside the tent for two people to sit and heat tea water in my little portable microwave, and then doss down sleeping bags atop inflated mylar mats. We would have to leave the rest of the equipment down on the beach for the night, since there was no time to build the cache. But none of the food was open and attractively odoriferous, and the local wildlife would probably take a day or two to move in and check us out. I figured the stuff would probably be safe. I would drape the more brightly colored bundles with my old camouflage tarps, on the off chance that personnel of the Megapod Reserve would fly over. Only one other necessity required investigation. When I had arranged everything neatly inside the tent, I emerged and prowled slowly along the edge of the clearing farthest from Megapod Creek, looking for another trail that I remembered was somewhere in the vicinity. Sure enough, I found it, partially obscured by a fallen snag, which I moved aside. The path wound through the thick growth of crumholtz and shrubbery to another tiny clearing. And there fortune or a certain Lylemick, smiled, and I discovered a roofless but otherwise intact little portable fiberglass latrine hut of the type used in campgrounds all over North America during the late 20th century. All I would have to do to put it into operation was dig a fresh pit near the cabin, drag it over, and stretch some plass on top to keep out the elements and the bugs. I was whistling as I made my way back to the cabin site in the fast-fading twilight, heading for the shore trail to call Teresa. I could see her down below, and I thought, Tonnerre de Dieu, the dear girl has actually thought to do something useful. She had gone a few meters to the outflow of Megapod Creek, where there was a clear, dark pool uncontaminated by the flowery glacial silt, and was kneeling there, filling one of our collapsible 19-liter water containers. 
Teresa stood up and turned again toward Mount Rumiyar, now a black silhouette against the purplish western sky. A light breeze had begun to blow, and there was a scent of evergreen resin and distant snow. The evening star planets shone with uncanny brilliance in the pure cold air. And Teresa sang to it. I stood rooted to the spot unbelieving. The voice that had supposedly been lost forever soared once again with the old magical richness that had enchanted audiences across the inhabited galaxy. She sang to the star and to her child, and a flash of premonition chilled me at the same time that the beauty of the music wrung my heart. Oh, Teresa, let me be able to save you, save both of you. The cold wind strengthened, and the song soon came to an end. She began to look about anxiously, and so I hurried down to her, sending on my far-spoken reassurance that everything was ready for the night. Chapter 10 From the Memoirs of Rogatien Romillard A Digression The conspiracy that eventually led to humanity's metapsychic rebellion was a long time germinating. For more than thirty Earth years there were only two rebels, the Soviet-born Anna Goris Sakhvadze, a professor of physics at the Institute for Dynamic Field Studies at Cambridge, and her sometime lover and colleague, Owen Blanchard, an American who eventually emigrated to the planet Asawamset and became the first president of its renowned Academy of Commercial Astrogation. In the twenty years that Anna and Owen were together at Cambridge, the inevitable subject of their pillow talk concerned the cowardly way in which their fellow earthlings had surrendered their birthright of freedom to the benevolent despotism of the galactic milieu. Throughout many a long English night, after they had satisfied the demands of their bodies, the couple debated, analyzed, and ultimately condemned the great intervention of the galactic milieu as an immoral piece of meddling in the evolution of a sovereign race. By invading our planet in 2013 and thrusting Earth compulsively into their advanced civilization, the milieu had violated some of the most fundamental tenets of human freedom. The Symbiari proctors, who acted as agents of the other four non-human races during the long educational years that preceded our attainment of full milieu citizenship, had severely restricted humanity's intellectual freedom, religious freedom, reproductive freedom, media freedom, educational freedom, and freedom of choice in matters of lifestyle and domicile. They had made a mockery of habeas corpus and the right to mental privacy. They had seduced human youth with visions of high technology and new worlds to win. They had virtually enslaved human metapsychic operants. Anna and Owen both had exceptionally high mind powers by limiting their career choices and by attempting to manipulate their motivation and loyalty. And always lurking in the future when the number of living human minds attained a certain mystical coadjunate number was the inevitable time when all human operants would be inducted into a mysterious mental state called the unity, which a good many psychologists and theologians feared would submerge human individuality in a cosmic overmind. I myself still shrink away from unity four decades after the fact, but I am the perennial outsider, the last of the metapsychic rebels, too feeble a mentality to threaten the milieu. And so I have been left in peace, granted immunity by the capricious lyelmic I call le fantôme familier, as a reward for serving as a cat's paw. From the earliest years of her academic career, Anna Goris Sakhvadze had been happy enough studying the permutations of sigma fields at Cambridge, which probably boasted more operants on its faculty than any other human university. But Owen Blanchard had been a promising concert violinist at the time of the intervention, and the Symbiari testing program that had uncovered his coercive and creative metafunctions also decreed that he renounce music in favor of dynamic field physics, a science vital to the entry of the human polity into full citizenship in the milieu. In those early proctorship days, Earth needed all the high wattage brain power that it could get. So Owen bowed to the inevitable and even came to enjoy designing hyperspatial drive mechanisms and then supervising the Department of Upsilon Studies. But when he played his violin for Anna, his resentment of the milieu and especially of the non-human Symbiari proctors who had denied him the life he had chosen, 
gave his performance a fire that was almost diabolical. At the time when circumstances eventually parted the couple, they knew that their treasonous opinions were held by few other metapsychic operants of importance. Open opposition to the galactic milieu was futile. Operants did not even have the dubious option of escaping the 21st century through the time gate invented by the eccentric Frenchman Théo Guderian, as normal humans did. If operants bowed to the milieu's yoke, they might prosper and ascend to positions of honor and responsibility, while resistance to the dictates of the Symbiari proctors brought professional disgrace, the ignominy of open incarceration, or even the death penalty for sedition. We are two lonely rebels, Anna whispered when she kissed Owen goodbye at the Unst spaceport. But let us not give up hope completely. As the end of the proctorship nears, humans may once again remember the nobility of self-determination. I shall keep a cautious eye out for other operants who share our beliefs, and you must do the same. Humanity can be free again, and it may be that you and I are destined to play a role in bringing about that freedom. Deep in his heart, Owen Blanchard thought her dream of rebellion was hopeless. Once he reached the exuberant new planet he had been assigned to, and became absorbed in the affairs of the fast-growing academy, he had no time for idealistic brooding. He worked hard building his institution into the best school for superluminal starship personnel in the human polity. He married and fathered two sons, and he nearly forgot Professor Anna Goris Sakvadze of Cambridge University, until he met Ragnar Gothen in 2050. Gothen was a senior captain in the Civil Interstellar Force, the closest thing to a military space fleet that the human polity boasted during the years of the proctorship. Sheer serendipity seated the two men side by side at a performance of William Tao, that operatic tribute to Swiss liberty. Between the acts, over drinks, Blanchard and Rongnar Gothen discovered they were both in their secret hearts rebels against the galactic milieu, both operants with growing political influence and both likely to be nominated magnates of the Concilium in two years, when the hated Symbiari proctors finally stepped down and the human polity took control of its own destiny. After assuring himself of Rangnar's sincerity by means of a mind probe, to which the other man willingly submitted, Owen introduced him to Anna, who also anticipated being nominated as a magnate. Anna saw interesting possibilities in the new recruit, and he visited her often when he was on Earth. Rangnar introduced his sister Oliana, a space liner captain who shared his rebellious sentiments, to Anna's nephew Alan Sakvadze, who was similarly inclined. The young people promptly fell in love and were eventually married. Alan Sakvadze, who also worked at the Institute for Dynamic Field Studies, in a different department from Anna's, was a close friend and colleague of his cousin Will McGregor. Eventually he converted Will to the anti-milieu point of view, bringing a number of rebels to six. Neither young man was magnate material, but Will's father, Davy McGregor, the son of the metapsychic pioneer Jamie McGregor and an administrator of the European Intendancy, was. His metafaculties were so extraordinary that he was considered the only serious rival to Paul Remillard for the post of first magnate. Will was certain that his father entertained serious philosophical doubts about the mysterious concept of unity, which the operants of the human polity would eventually be obliged to embrace. Whether Davy's doubts might lead him to repudiate the milieu was problematical. No member of the cabal possessed the mental firepower to undertake a coercive, redactive mental examination of the great Davy McGregor. If he was to be brought into the group, it would have to be accomplished by more subtle means. Anna nevertheless found the conjecture about Davy very interesting, as did Owen and Ragnar. Three, possibly four, magnate designates were strongly opposed to the exotic domination of humanity. Might there be other potential rebels among the nominees? She herself knew of two possibilities. Jordan Kramer was a stalwart 24-year-old psychophysicist and magnate designate who worked both at Cambridge and at a research facility on Okanagan. Garrett Van Wyck, a year older, was probably the most brilliant cerebro-energetic specialist in the polity. 
Unfortunately, he was also a very low-powered operant and a notorious lush. In addition, he had a face like a frog and possessed a querulous and eccentric personality. The milieu nominated him to the concilium anyhow. After the most delicate kind of backing and filling, the suspect pair were maneuvered into situations where Owen, the most powerful coercer in the group, could forcibly probe their minds. When the indignation of the probees subsided, they allowed themselves to be recruited, and subsequently indicated to the group that they were at work upon a revolutionary kind of psychoassay device that might ultimately be very valuable, or very dangerous, to the cause of human freedom. The mind-reaming of the unlovable von Weich brought unexpected bonuses. He knew of two other highly placed operants with seditious propensities, and suspected that a third might also be a closet rebel. The first was none other than the famous Hiroshi Kodama, intendant associate for Asia. The second was also an associate in the European intendancy. Her name was Cordelia Varshavska, and she was a prominent xenologist at the University of Krakow, as well as a skillful politician and a platonic friend of Davy McGregor's. The third suspect, dredged from Van Wyck's quivering psyche, was so unexpected and outrageous that no member of the little group would have dreamed of attempting to sound him out. His recruitment would have to be postponed until after the magistratum withdrew its surveillance from him, since he was not only a magnate designate, but also a suspect in a murder investigation. His name was Adrian Rumiar. Chapter 11. Nusfjord, Lofoten Islands, Norway, Earth, 27 August, 2051. The intendant associate for Asia looked out over the breathtaking view from the balcony of the summer house. The tray in his hands with its pitcher of beer and earthenware mugs was forgotten. Taihen Utsukushi Dezu, he exclaimed, and Inga Johansen came hurrying out from the kitchen to see what might be wrong. What is it, Mr. I mean, Citizen Kodama? Like most Norwegians of the older generation, she had spoken English as a second language from childhood, so the standard English prescribed by the Simbiari as the official earth tongue had been no hardship for her. Japanese was the second language of thirty seven year old Hiroshi Kodama. Nothing at all. I beg your pardon for startling you, Fru Johansen. Hiroshi set down the tray on the heavily laden dinner table with an apologetic little laugh. It was only this gorgeous vista of the fjord in the harbor below that suddenly struck me. When I arrived yesterday in the rain, I never dreamed that you lived amid such splendor. The awesome gray cliffs so lightly touched with green, the water such an incredibly luminous shade of aquamarine blue, the small white boats dotted about it like gulls, and the exquisite houses so vivid as scarlet with their somber black roofs. They are the roar booer the old fishermen's shanties that are rented out to vacationers. The cheerful color is traditional. Our islands are not always as sunny as you see them today. She carried a bottle of aquavit that had been frozen into a block of ice and set it down beside a salver of tiny glasses. There would be toasts on this very special occasion. When her grandson had called her at her apartment in Trondheim, asking if he might borrow the ancestral home on remote Flockstar Island above the Arctic Circle for a get-together of his friends, the old lady had said, Only if you let me cook you good Norwegian food. Rangnar Gothen had laughed and agreed. She was a non-operant, and all of their discussions would be in mental speech, so why not? He himself had not been to the house in Nusfjord since he was a boy. But when Owen asked him if he knew of an out-of-the-way place for the first official meeting of the rebel group, Bestemore Inga's summer place had come immediately to mind. The abrupt pull of nostalgia for the beautiful old fishing village, which he had not seen in eighteen years, also helped cement Rangnar's decision. He was American-born, and the planet Asawampset, where he had lived most of his life, was a thriving and attractive world. But something deep in his bones insisted that Norway was his true home. Fru Johansen now surveyed the table, hands on hips. She was a round-cheeked woman with white hair, and to honor her grandson and his important guests, she wore the traditional costume of her birthplace in Trunelag, a long dark skirt with a brocaded apron of green and gold, a red brocade bodice with a peplum, held together at the waist with silver clasps, 
and a white embroidered blouse adorned with two large silver rosacilia, brooches with many glittering little concave bangles. Hiroshi wore the sober dark blue suit he had arrived in, a fresh shirt and a bow tie, and the crisply starched white apron his hostess had insisted he don to protect his clothes. There, that looks very nice, I think. Thank you for helping me, Citizen Kodama. Now I shall check the oven, and perhaps you will see if the others are ready for dinner. The intendant bowed and hurried off down a hallway past the kitchen, a place of intriguing smells and considerable clutter, to the sitting room. Its floor and walls were of varnished light wood. Sitting in one corner on a stone slab was an ornate black cast iron stove with a brass finial on top. Rangnar, Owen Blanchard, Will McGregor, Alan Sokvadza, and his wife Oliana Gothen, and Jordan Kramer had been out fishing together. They had changed into clean, casual clothing and now lounged about, discussing the day's sport on the settee and easy chairs, which were covered with well-worn chintz. Cordelia Varshavska, a tiny, sweet-faced woman notorious in the European intendancy for not suffering fools gladly, was standing at a carved pine table in front of the open window, arranging a large bouquet of wildflowers she had picked. Anna Goris Sakvadze had remained in the sitting room most of the day, catching up on the flood of physics literature that sometimes seemed to overwhelm dynamic field studies. She had finally put the plaque reader aside when her fellow conspirators joined her and was now examining Fru Johansson's collection of antique wooden tankards, which stood on a wall shelf. She was seventy-one years old, of medium height and sturdily built. Rejuvenation had restored her thick red-gold hair, which she wore in a severe chignon at the nape of her neck, but it had not completely obliterated the web of tiny lines around her green eyes or refined her typically Slavic snubbed nose. When Hiroshi entered the room, radiating thoughts of their impending meal, Anna projected a mischievous thought at him on the conversational mode. You must forgive me, my friend, for being amazed that a Japanese gentleman of exalted political rank would help in the preparation of dinner. But the apron looks very nice on you. Hiroshi removed it with perfect aplomb as the others chuckled. He replied, For a person of an older generation such a thing would have been unthinkable. We younger men are more flexible. Our women have worked with great zeal to raise our consciousness in such matters. Image of his wife's dauntless fish. And besides, Fru Johansson is a treasure trove of local lore. Do you know that these Arctic islands retain a moderate climate all year round because of the warming Gulf Stream? The Lofotens have been inhabited since immediate pre-glacial times. They were once reputed to be the home of supernatural beings and the fabulous maelstrom, the deadly whirlpool celebrated by Jules Verne and Edgar Allan Poe, is located on the tip of the island just south of here. Cordelia Varshavska said, It doesn't surprise me one bit. The scenery is positively uncanny. Crags and mist on the one hand, and on the other, the sun lighting up the sea until it glows like some fabulous liquid gemstone. I half expected to be jumped by trolls as I hiked among the rocks picking these flowers. Will McGregor spoke out loud. Our troll stayed in bed all morning with a migraine. Poor little sod. Do you suppose he's getting an attack of cold feet as well? And if so, won't it leave the rest of us in a fine bloody mess? Owen Blanchard said, Will, bag it. The younger members of the company laughed uneasily. Alan said, Will was only joking. Will said, But damned if I was. I think, Olyana Gothen said aloud, but we'd better up screens and stick with an old-fashioned tongue-wag. Some of the heads around here could give colanders lessons, leaking their latent hostility, and we wouldn't want to hurt anyone's feelings and have them withdraw in a fit of pique now, would we? All Yana's right, said Alan. Several others agreed with him. Jordan Kramer kept his own mind clammed up, so the very serious doubts he had begun to entertain wouldn't leak out. It was the earnest young American magnate designate's first meeting with the others. Geordi was the youngest of the group. The ideal of human freedom from exotic repression burned as strongly within him as it ever had, but some of his companions had begun to inspire qualms. Not Owen and Anna, of course. Both of them were respected leaders in their fields, richly deserving of their nomination to the concilium. 
Hiroshi and Cordelia also struck Geordie as being rock-solid, fully committed to human liberty, and psychologically mature. On the day's fishing trip, he had also decided that both Rangnar Gothen and his sister Oliana were the kind of people he'd be willing to risk his neck with in a treasonous enterprise. But Alan Sokvadza and Will McGregor, who were in their early thirties, like the Gothens, were another kettle of fish altogether. Jordy wondered why they had been recruited. Both were undoubtedly excellent scientists, who had done good work under Anna at the IDFS, but they had not been nominated magnates, and both were bitter at being passed over, so their motivation might not be completely free of taint. Alan was a quiet, almost colorless man, who usually deferred to his outspoken wife, while Will was flamboyant and often tactless. And then there was the most dubious member of the cabal, ironically the one Geordie knew best, his own professional colleague Garrett Van Wyck. Like all the rest of them, Garrett had submitted to the secret new psychoassay device, which gave a much more accurate mental analysis than redactive probing by human operands. At the time of the testing he was proved loyal to the group. But would he stay that way when the going got tough? Will McGregor evidently had his doubts, and so did Geordie himself. If our enterprise is to succeed, Oliana was saying, we'll need all the heads we can get, especially the magnified kind. I move that we refrain from uncharitable cracks about any member of the group, even those of us that richly deserve being sneered at, unless said member is present and ready to defend his or her honor. Do I have a second? Rangnar Gothen said quietly, Second. Will McGregor uttered an impenitent snort. His hair was a fiery auburn in the sunlight streaming through the window, and his black eyes snapped from beneath thick, tangled brows. Think you've put me in my place, do you? I'll say and think what I please, and the devil with being nice, for I'm only saying aloud what the rest of ye think. He hoisted his rangy frame out from the depths of the overstuffed settee, and pretended to examine the mica windows on the old iron stove in the ensuing silence. Then he looked around and grinned. Ah, well, no harm done, and the atmosphere needs defrosting. So, here's some news I was going to say for dessert. My dad's decided to run against Paul Remillard for first magnate, after all. There were whistles and exclamations. Cordelia asked bluntly, Why? It's a 180-degree flip. Davy McGregor knows Paul has a greater metapsychic armamentarium than he does, to say nothing of charisma enough to blast himself into a solar orbit. Davy is also Dennis Ramayar's bosom charm, isn't he? I thought you told us your father was determined to let Paul take the first magnate chair by acclamation. Ah, but that was before the murder, Will said. Jordy Kramer blinked. I've been busy with a brain booster project in Okanagan. But there was something about a killing in the Remillar family on the Tri-D. It was an atrocity, and it was undoubtedly committed by a Grand Master operant. Will opened the fire door of the old stove and peered inside. It was full of kindling and ready to light. When the news broke about the entire dynasty and young Mark being suspects, my dad far spoke Dennis immediately. You know, say it ain't so, Joe. Dennis pooh-poohed the idea of any of his spawn being responsible for the crime said he knew their minds inside out. But yesterday Dad got word from a source inside the magistratum that the exotic investigators are pretty well convinced that only a Remillard could have done the killing. There's really no solid evidence to back that conclusion, but it was enough to get Dad's knickers all in a twist. Three of Paul's siblings are now supposed to have been completely exonerated, but the other four and Mark are still very much under suspicion. Which four? Owen Blanchard's voice was tense. Catherine, the wife of the murdered man, her older sister Anne, Adrian, and Paul. That's the main reason Dad has decided to run against him. Holy shit, whispered Alan Sokvadze. Does he have a chance? Oliana Gothen asked. Will the suspicions of the magistratum be made public, so the other magnate designates will know? Rongnar said to his sister, that's very unlikely. The exotics want Paul for first magnate. He's a gonzo champion of the galactic milieu, and he favors coagulation of our racial mind, Hiroshi Kodama said in clipped tones. 
Ask anyone who has heard his speeches in the intendant assembly in Concord. The unity is like a holy grail to him. Cordelia Varshavska turned away from her flowers to face the others. Hiroshi is absolutely right. Right about what? inquired a querulous voice. Garrett Van Wyck, alias the Troll, came slouching into the room. His sparse blond hair was disheveled, and there were deep furrows between his eyes with angling beside his wide mouth. His mind tone was that of a man with a skull spun of the most fragile glass filigree. Get it, dear. Anna was solicitous. I see your migraine is better. It would have been such a pity for you to miss Fru Johansen's fine dinner. I might manage a bite, Van Wyck said ungraciously. He assimilated the news that Anna broadcast to him and blinked his slightly protuberant blue eyes. Well, well, well. So the great Paul Remillard is a viable suspect in the murder, is he? And his son, too. He uttered a cynical laugh. I'd say it was to our advantage to make sure that as many magnate designates as possible know about that. If Paul wins, we'll have to unveil the psychoassay device whether we want to or not, and reopen the inquiry into the crime. Can't have a homicidal first magnate, can we? Or even a first magnate with a killer besmirching the family escutcheon. On the other hand, if Davy McGregor wins first, our noble cause gets two significant boosts. We can keep our mechanical mind probe secret for a while longer, ensuring that it doesn't get used on us. And with Davy leading the polity, we can actually have open debate on humanity's subjection by the milieu. That's our best hope, Owen said. As the human polity becomes autonomous, those magnates who hold to our point of view might stand up and be countered under the leadership of a man like Davy McGregor. Under Paul, the political climate would be much less favorable. There are probably plenty of other M.D.s who think that humanity belongs outside the milieu, Garrett sniffed, and even more who think the Remillar gang is a pretentious collection of superior assholes. First family of metapsychology, what a laugh! If those exotic nominators considered nobility of character rather than the mere size of the metaquotient, hardly a one of the Remillars would qualify for a concilium seat. There was an uncomfortable pause in which all mind screens of those around Van Wyck were tightly shut, while at the same time everybody had the identical, reprehensible thought. Finally, Anna sighed. We will have to use every weapon at our command to help bring about Davy McGregor's victory over Paul Remillard. Garrett is right about the family being resented. When the seven of us, who are magnate designates, go to Orb, we must be prepared for action. We will decide upon our strategy here tonight. There were murmurs of agreement. Then Rangnar's urgent thought silenced them. She's coming. Fru Inga Johansen came into the sitting-room, smiling shyly, her hands clasped in front of her apron. She said, "'Where is a god? Dinner is now ready.' And they all followed her out onto the balcony, and for the next hour and a half forgot completely about the galactic milieu. First there were toasts in Aquavit, to a venture carefully left undescribed, to absent colleagues and well-wishers known and unknown, and to David Summerled MacGregor. Intendant Associate for Europe. After the skoll came beer chasers and appetizers in the form of lofot caviar, preserved cod's row, and smoked salmon shaved so thin as to be translucent, and succulent corned trout, all accompanied by rye rounds and local butter. As they wolfed these down, Fru Johansen carried in a tureen of steaming ursuppe, ale soup, which was served garnished with tiny salt twists. Superb! Garrett Van Wyck beamed upon Rangnar's grandmother, demanding a second helping of the soup. He had hogged most of the corned trout, too. And what will be our pièce de résistance, madame? More fish, of course, Rangnar cried, and he leapt from his seat. The pride of the islands. I will help Besta Moringa bring it in. The entree was a deceptively simple dish of breaded baked cod with grated goat cheese called Reinatorsk, served with a sauce of thick sour cream. Garrett went into raptures over it, and all three of the large serving dishes were eventually scraped clean. Then came a raw-cost salat of lettuce, cucumber, tomatoes, and cauliflower lightly tossed with mayonnaise and sprinkled with chopped dill. 
Rangnar refilled the beer pitcher, and Olyana helped serve the fiel dessert, homemade macaroons sprinkled with multa, rare orange cloudberries, something like small raspberries that grew wild in the cold bogs of the islands. Each serving was decorated with whipped cream. As the dessert was devoured, the old lady rose and regarded them all with a smile that mingled fondness and the faintest tinge of reproach. And now I will leave you to your discussions. There will be coffee and cookies in the sitting-room, and the cognac and liqueurs. I am going down the road now to visit an old friend, and I will be gone for quite a long time. Forget about the dishes. I have one of the new ionic cleaners that will make short work of them when I return late this evening. They all sprang to their feet. Rangnar said, Tusen tak for Martin, Bestemore. We will all remember this dinner for the rest of our lives. Yes, Inga Johansen said sadly. I think you will. And then she left them, and they all sat down again. Oyana broke the long, thoughtful silence. Well, I suppose it's only logical that she might sense something of what we're up to. She will not betray us. Anna's face had gone pale in the sunlight. Never, Rangnar exclaimed. But she does not approve, Anna said. Hiroshi Kodama sipped from his mug of beer, then set it down and stared into the foam-streaked depths. She is like so many of the elders, those who remember the political chaos and worldwide privation and fear of the pre-intervention earth. To her, the coming of the galactic milieu was a miracle that saved our world from his own foolish pride and greed, perhaps from nuclear holocaust. Anna, only you and Owen are old enough to remember those times. When operants were persecuted, when energy supplies were dwindling, when the air and the waters and the land were so polluted by the waste of humanity that it seemed they never would be made clean. Think back to that day in 2013, when thousands upon thousands of starships materialized over the great cities of the earth and told us that the nightmare was over, that they had come to intervene and welcome us into their galactic civilization. I remember, Owen whispered. His head was bowed, and now so was Anna's. Through the technology of the regeneration tank, both now looked fully as youthful as their fellow conspirators, but their mental overlay, with its indelible patina of memories and experience, would always mark them as elders. With the intervention, Hiroshi went on, there was immediate peace, immediate solutions to our ecological and economic problems. You too were perhaps among the few to question the coming of the Golden Age in those early years. The smallness of our group here attests that most human beings still feel as Fru Johansen does, that the way of the galactic milieu and its unity are the only hope for us. If we, we rebels, attempt to point our race in another direction, we must think deeply about the opinions of our opponents. Could they be right? Could we possibly be wrong? Is our viewpoint that of a proud elite, and theirs that of the great majority of humanity? I have never had any doubts, Anna said, straightening in her chair and meeting Hiroshi's eyes. But Owen Blanchard looked away over the fjord, to where the small pleasure boats played on deep mirrored waters. I have. Rangnar Gothen said, If we succeed... It will be because the majority agrees with us. Cordelia Varshavska gave a humorless laugh. Thus speaks the bluff and sturdy spaceman. But social change isn't quite as simple as that. Sometimes people don't know what's good for them. They have to be led, educated, even compelled to do the right thing when the mutual good seems to conflict with their selfish interests. We operants are the ones the exotics have chosen to be the leaders, Garrett van Wyck declared. It's a consensus of operants that we have to win, not normals. Only in the short run, Oliana said. Operants are still only a tiny percentage of the human race, even though our ranks are increasing. And all of you know that the coadjunate number, the number of minds needed for unity to be imposed, includes normals as well as us. When we are unified, whatever that means, rebellion will be impossible. We'll somehow be, be engulfed in the exotic mindset, 
at one with the Lyalmic and the Krondaku and the Poltroyans and the G and the Simbiare, Will added. Those fucking self-righteous green bastards. For some time they all sat without speaking. The air was cool for all the brightness of the sun, and when dusk came they would be glad to light the stove. Owen finally rose to his feet. Humanity won't be subjugated to the minds of exotic races. In the beginning, at the intervention, we were overwhelmed by the benevolent aspects of the milieu. It could hardly have been otherwise. But after forty years of the proctorship, a few of us at least have recognized that the price we paid was too high. And for us operants, it will eventually be higher still, unless we do something about it. Come on, let's go find that coffee, and get down to serious business. Chapter 12 Conquered Human Polity Capital Earth, 28 August, 2051 they could have taken the subway tram and covered the distance in less than five minutes, but Paul suggested that the two of them walk through the rain-freshened capital gardens. There were things that needed to be said now, not later, and neither one of them wanted to sit around Paul's office until the time of the appointment, accepting commiserations from Tucker Barnes and Colette Roy on the family's double tragedy. Triple, when you counted Brett's weird demise. Paul asked, are you comfortable in the hotel? As comfortable as any prisoner could ask? Mark was expressionless. It was kind of the magistratum to allow me to have family friends for custodians. A professional courtesy. And Dr. Roy and Professor Barnes were glad to take the responsibility to spare you being confined in an exotic detention facility. But such courtesies can extend only so far. I understand, Papa. They descended the shallow steps of North America Tower and started across Canada Plaza. I am sorry I was unable to have breakfast with you. There was an early vote on the new American planet proposal, and I have been scheduled for two weeks to do the summing up speech in favor. That's all right. The young man's adamant screening was unperturbed. If Mark was apprehensive about the upcoming interrogation, no mental or physical clue betrayed his emotional state. He wore white slacks and a white rugby shirt with green navy and gold stripes. His hair, which usually stood out in a careless halo of dark curls, was neatly combed and sprayed. He asked casually, How did the vote go? The eyes had it by a landslide. The new world will be called Denali, after the highest mountain in Alaska, and a precedent-setting compromise amendment will allow unlimited immigration from Canada and Greenland and the Arctic areas of Europe and Asia, after the initial wave of Yank settlers takes first dibs. So it's going to be a kind of bastard ethnic world, rather than a true cosmop? Looks like it, and that's just what the sponsors were hoping for. Aside from the rich mineral deposits, the place is more marginal in human preferenda than the typical cosmop planet. The land masses are mostly polar, and the climate is severe. It's unlikely that Denali will ever attract a large enough population to warrant true cosmopolitan status. It certainly wouldn't repay any milieu, subsidization, or an immigrant incentive bonus plan. So it falls into the ethnic class by default. The American ethnic label is broad enough to embrace the hodgepodge of settlers the planet will no doubt attract. Yukon Gold Rush adventurer types? Those and deep-sea fishermen. Its oceans are incredibly well populated with gourmet class pseudo crustaceans. There's a certain je ne sais quoi romantic charm to the planetary landscape, too, if you enjoy Old Man Winter wearing his wildest, most majestic face. Lots of neg irons in the air and superb mountains. I liked the place myself when the committee checked it out. You may remember that survey junket your mother and I took in March? I remember. Mama said it was the best holiday you two had had in ages and very romantic. Paul's mental aspect remained bland in spite of the unsubtle provocation. The illicit child had undoubtedly been conceived during the Denali trip, and Teresa had very likely worked the whole thing out in advance as carefully as blocking the stage moves in one of her operas. God damn her! Or have mercy on her, if she's dead. Please, God, dead? Paul said to Mark, Denali may not be your typical picture-book colony, but what ethnic world is? 
After all, the whole idea behind the concept is to encourage settlers with special solidarity to go out together to planets that are more difficult to colonize. And the Alaskans did scrape up the minimal seed population requirement for ethnic planet status, with some surreptitious help from Minnesota and Maine and Wyoming and North Dakota. After I delivered my little rouser of a speech in favor of the amended proposal and hinted that any I.A. who presumed to question the ethnic dynamism of those sourdoughs would end up lynched with a walrus hide rope, most of the assembly caved in and passed the resolution by a big majority. Mark nodded soberly. Sounds like Denali is going to be a great planet. I'd like to visit it myself. Funny. Quite a few of the intendant associates said the same thing. And their subliminals all flashed skiing in neon lights, just like yours do. Mark managed a wan smile. I may not be doing any skiing for a long time, Papa. That, said Paul carefully, is entirely up to you. They walked under stately mutant elms that had grown to their full height of forty meters in the twelve years since the establishment of Concord as capital of the human polity. Off to the west was a striking vista of the Merrimack Valley, and on the other side of the river lay Old Concord, the capital of the state of New Hampshire. The city had graciously agreed to change its name when the human polity capital was established in the Loudon Hills to the east of it. The most prominent landmark in Old Concord, easily visible to Paul and Mark in spite of the lingering morning haze, was the white dome of the venerable New Hampshire State House, where a stubborn and uniquely democratic legislature, born in the year 1680, still met and prided itself on being the model for the regional level of galactic government. Like so many earth cities, Old Concord had been purged of all ugliness. Its service, manufacturing, and commercial structures were either relocated underground or concealed in restored buildings of architectural importance, gathered from other parts of the state during the drastic population redistributions of the early 21st century. The revitalized city evoked the image of a peaceful 18th-century New England village, while catering efficiently to the needs of a population living in the Galactic Age. Mark said, I can detect Braybuff Academy with my mind's eye, over there behind Rum Hill. Funny. I couldn't wait to graduate in March, get out from under the thumb of the fathers, do my first field trip on an exotic planet, start college. But now I really miss Braybuff. We seniors were the kings of the cosmos. We thought we knew everything there was to know. Now all of a sudden we're bottom dogs again, college freshmen at large in an inhabited universe, and we realize that we don't know beans, and we're trapped like the rest of humanity under the biggest thumb of all. There were very few other people on this particular path. Paul had been looking at the landscape as he walked, not at his son. They had come to a deserted, enclosed garden with a large informal pool overhung by willows. Pink and white lilies dotted the surface of the dark water, which reflected not only trees and shrubs, but also the delicate alabaster strato-towers of the North American and European intendancies that seemed to pierce the sky on either hand. The path traversed one arm of the pool by means of large, flat stepping-stones, and now Paul halted on the midmost stone and prevented Mark from going any further. His hands rested upon the boy's shoulders, and Mark was forced to look into his father's compelling blue eyes. Paul was tall, but not massive, with a very erect carriage and a natural grace to his movements that was almost Latin. His black beard was closely trimmed, and his hair cut Caesar-style, to minimize its waving and already beginning to gray, in defiance of the self-rejuvenating genes. As usual, he was smartly and expensively dressed. His suit was khaki-colored silk noil, and he wore a black open-neck shirt with a flame-red scarf. "'You do understand,' Paul said, "'why it was necessary for me to report this affair, and your own role in it, to the magistratum. "'But you didn't tell the proctors what Grandmère Lucille and Uncle Severin planned to do, did you, Papa?' Mark spoke very softly. "'That they would have taken the baby without reporting the pregnancy.' No. Their desire to spare me and avert the scandal at its source was regrettable, as well as illegal. But your grandmother's scheme came to nothing. Unlike your own unfortunate escapade, 
And your overnight disappearance automatically made you a suspect in Brett's murder as well. Mark remained silent. His mind seemed open, but the deepest levels were utterly impregnable. As they had been throughout Paul's own assaultive mental interrogation on the morning following the alleged canoe accident, Paul went on. Two presumed criminal incidents that closely concern persons like me and your uncles and aunts, grand master metapsychics who are also high officials of the polity and designated magnates. Put your interrogation out of the jurisdiction of ordinary human law enforcement bodies. The matter had to be referred to the magistratum. I was subjected to coercive redactive probing myself, and so were my brothers and sisters. You could not be exempted. Your meta faculties are too great and your actions were too suspicious. The magistratum must rule out a connection between Brett's murder and the disappearance of your mother and Uncle Roger. I understand, Papa. What will happen to you today? Paul broke off to reinforce his own faltering emotional barricade. Damn it, Mark! You must allow the exotic interrogators to see the truth, whatever it is. No matter who it hurts, we have a solemn duty— all of us who are privileged operants in training to serve humanity, to conduct our lives honorably, to obey and uphold the laws of the galactic milieu. Without question? For now, yes. Some of the milieu laws are unjust, cruel, inhuman. Son, my dear son, I know they may seem. Papa, I'm not the only one to doubt. No, but doubting isn't the issue at hand. Action is. You needn't worry. The interrogators won't find any incriminating data in my mind. The family honor is safe. Paul cried out, Damn you and your half-baked arrogance! Don't you realize that a Krondok Grand Master Forensic Redactor will be questioning you today? Mind-reaming me, Mark corrected. Out loud he said, Papa, nothing the magistratum learns from me will damage your reputation or compromise your authority. You and Grandpère searched my mind three days ago, right after the drownings, and Uncle Severin and Aunt Anne and Professor Barnes all had their chance to turn me inside out later. All of you believe that I've told the truth. Now it's time for the exotics to satisfy themselves officially. They'll either believe me too and let me go, or decide I've broken their laws and pass sentence on me right here this morning. That's fine with me. Just let me get on with it. Because the longer we delay, the more afraid I am. Mark, let me into your mind, Paul pleaded, gripping the boy's upper arms. Into the secret place. I know we failed to turn you inside out. You were very good at hiding the inner thought masking, but I know you concealed things from us. Let me see. Trust me. For the love of God, tell me whether or not your mother and Uncle Rosie are alive. Mark's psychokinesis gently cancelled the muscular tension of his father's hands, and he pulled free. You know the answer already, Papa. You tore my screens down and looked for yourself. All of you did. We did, yes, we think we did, but if the drowning story is true, why is there no grief? Mark, you can't not care. You can't have killed her deliberately. You did love her more than you did, Papa. Paul said, That's not true. Look in me. Look. The boy shrugged, ignoring the invitation. Through his mind danced the fleeting images of many different women, all of them beautiful, all powerful operants, all infatuated with Paul Remillard. You don't understand, Paul said. That has nothing to do with love. The hint of empathy he had extended vanished like a snuffed candle flame, and once more the father looked down from his Jovian rampart. You're too young to understand the complexities of male sexuality. You're too... inhuman. Emotionally detached. Uncle Roger used to tell me that. I'm going to miss him. Mark, tell me. Are they really dead? The full force of Paul's coercion struck the boy. Mark stiffened convulsively and would have tumbled into the water if Paul had not caught him. No sooner had Paul struck than he retreated, frustrated again by the unbridgeable abyss that separated his own passionate nature from the icy profundity of the young man's psychic core, those dark distances that could be concealing anything. The father held the son in a desperate physical embrace while their minds remained walled apart. Paul said aloud, 
I love your mother, and I love you. If you've done what I think you have, I believe that your motives are good. I can't help you, but I'll do my utmost to salvage the situation. Do you understand? Yes, Papa. Paul let the boy go. Then they walked on across the stepping stones and through the trees and came to another plaza that fronted a large gray building. The polity capital's departmental structures, unlike the magnificent office towers of the continental intendancies, were modest in design. This one seemed to be trying to efface itself by melting into the wooded hillside. Its stepped granite balconies dripped with flowering vines and other foliage, and the windows were deeply embayed and mirrored, so that they seemed part of the stone or the lush greenery. The building entrance, like the windows, was hooded and unpretentious. The double doors of massive carved oak were stained gray, with black iron fittings in American colonial style. A granite plinth on a small patch of lawn beside the steps held an identifying sign. Magistratum of the Galactic Milieu, Earth Proctorship The handsome bearded man and the tall boy walked up the steps side by side. Mark held the door politely for his father. Inside was a very small lobby with a polished black-and-white marble floor and richly paneled walls of chestnut wood. On either side of the room stood well-worn brown leather settees, each flanked by an occasional table and a brass stiefel lamp. One of the tables had a book-plaque reader, the other a telephone without a viewer. The third side of the room, opposite the entrance, was inset with a featureless brushed bronze door. Beside it was a viewscreen and a small bronze plate with an old-fashioned mammary push-button that was labeled Information. Paul pressed the button. The screen lit, showing the glistening green countenance of a male member of the Symbiari race. "'Good morning, Intendant Rumiyar,' said the exotic in unaccented standard English. "'Good morning, Enforcer Abaram. I have in my custody the witness defendant Mark Alain Kendall Rumiyar, who is scheduled to be interrogated at this time.' You are three minutes early, Intendant, but this insignificant deviation can be readily accommodated by Enforcer Chief Molotarsis and Evaluator Throma Lek. Unless the witness defendant prefers to wait out the interval. He does not, said Paul. The bronze portal slid open, revealing two expressionless symbiari in golden uniforms. The witness defendant will accompany these enforcers, Abaram said. As Mark came forward, Paul said sharply, When the questioning is completed, please bring the boy to my office in North America Tower. Immediately. This will be done, Abaram said, if the action is feasible, pending the outcome of the interrogation. We will notify you promptly if the witness defendant's presence is required elsewhere. The screen went black. Mark stepped between the two exotics, and they about faced. Then the door slid closed, leaving Paul standing alone. When they had finished, and the boy was breathing normally again, and his brain cycling in dreamless sleep, the two exotic redactors went into the adjacent parlor to escape the examination room's lingering etheric stench of pain and terror. Moti a la Malatarsis dug a handful of Kleenex from the platinum saber-tash case that hung from her uniform belt, scrubbed her slimy palms, and dropped the green-stained wad into a wastebasket. Her complexion had gone an unhealthy, olivaceous tan. She flung open a refreshment cabinet, filled a glass with carbonated water, and tossed it down in a single swallow. Belatedly, she said, My apologies, evaluator, but I felt an overpowering need for a rehydration. May I offer you a drink also? Single malt scotch, if you please, straight up. The Symbiari Enforcer Chief seized a fresh bottle of Bunaven and fumbled to open it. The bottleneck clinked as she poured sloppily, and she left sticky pad prints on the glass. Sorry about that, too. She thrust the drink into Throma Elulek's extended tentacle. The grotesque Kromdaku blinked his primary optics in mild acknowledgment of his colleague's unusual state of flusteration. A most peculiar and fascinating case, is it not? Once again, the human race displays its bottomless capacity to astound. The chief refilled her own glass. 
and this one is only a pubescent child. She sipped with partially restored composure. Let us go out on the balcony to discuss this, shall we? Disturbing resonances still propagate in here. As you wish, Thruma Elu sighed, slithering after her into the fierce sunlight through sliding doors opened by psychokinesis. Unobtrusively, he sent a restoring and redactive impulse into the limbic system of his fellow interrogator, while on another level of his mind he was assembling a precy of the bad news for the Select Judicial Evaluation Committee back at Concilium Orb. A more primitive level of the Krondok consciousness deplored the excessive gravity, low oxygen partial pressure, and intense ultraviolet radiation of the human home planet, the booze was superb, however, and Moti Allah had remembered to bring the bottle out onto the balcony with her. The chief flopped into a deck chair, rolled up her silvery uniform sleeves, and extended her bare green arms to the healing sunlight. Sacred truth and beauty, that's better. The monstrous Krondaku squatted in the shadiest spot, near the place where the balcony merged with the granite of an artificial cliff. A waterfall splashed down mossy stones and beaded Throma Elu's warty integument with welcome moisture. He appropriated the scotch and began a formal recapitulation. I understand now, colleague, why you requested my assistance in this apparently straightforward investigation. The metapsychic precocity of the Remyar line is, of course, a continuing topic of study amongst evolutionists of the Concilium. We were not aware, however, that an individual with the potential of this examinee had been born into the family. His ability to resist symbiari Krondok psychoprobing technique has disturbing implications. Of course, Mark could be unique. His father and the father's siblings are arguably the most powerful of human operants, yet our probing of them was readily accomplished. Nevertheless, I must point out that the blocking mechanisms that Mark used, virtually instinctively, are susceptible to program analysis, and could, at least in theory, be passed on to and utilized by other humans of high metafunction. But we broke him, I think. The Krondaku indicated qualified assent, simultaneously introducing a generous nip of scotch into his buccal orifice. I believe we have ascertained the truth of the drowning incident, at least, lamentable though it may be, the boy was clearly appalled by his mother's procreative risk-taking. Like many immature male earthlings, particularly those of high intelligence and stunted effect, he represses sexual feelings for the female parent, but at the same time craving the maternal consolations she vouchsafed him during his infancy, which she now denies him. In the human species the hormonal imbalance of puberty exacerbates the aforesaid psychological turmoil. Thus we may see that, all unconsciously, Mark hates his mother for denying him and envies both his father and the unborn sibling, seeing in the latter especially a usurper of the love that he feels is owed to him, and also a metapsychic challenger. The boy's relationship with his father is complicated by the role model factor. He has a powerful respect for Paul, at the same time that he is jealous of him. This is quite normal amongst humans. When Mark's mother revealed her illicit pregnancy, the boy's highest level of consciousness perceived a grave threat to both himself and his father. While the deeper mental strata cogitated the situational potential for simultaneous revenge upon both parents and elimination of the sibling rival. Yes, yes, I agree with your assessment, evaluator. The chief's face slowly regained its normal emerald hue as her hyperactive mucus glands simmered down. The area around her chair was now littered with used Kleenex, a situation that distressed the orderly sensibilities of the Krondaku. Before the Symbiari race had undertaken the proctorship of planet Earth, they had been accustomed to blot up their excess bodily fluids with unobtrusive small sponges concealed in their clothing. Their stewardship of the earthlings had proved so stressful, however, that the traditional expedient became inadequate without inconvenient ringing out operations and so earthbound symbiare had become addicted to Kleenex, which they carried in ornamental belt containers and rarely disposed of properly. They passed on the nasty new habit to their congeners throughout the milieu, to the delight of human paper product companies. 
and nowadays crinkled wads of tissue seem to litter half the planets of the Orion arm. Thruma Elu Lek, like many of his ancient and fastidious race, secretly deplored the lowering of standards, but never would have dreamed of humiliating the Symbiare by reproaching them. Earth was the first proctorship undertaken by that semi-unified race, and the project had shaken Sim courage severely. Is it your conclusion, then, the Krondaku inquired, that the boy is innocent of double homicide by drowning? The chief assumed a more dignified posture, and refastened her cuffs. Volition in the immature human psyche is not easy to pin down. But I believe our efforts show that Mark Remillard acted entirely through unconscious impetus when he brought about the drowning of his mother and the incidental demise of the aged male relative. Mark suggested the canoe trip in the first place, then neglected to portage around the rapids. However, there was never in his mind a deliberate intention to kill. I do not believe he has any complicity in the McAllister murder either. The Krondaku hesitated. Let us postpone for a moment any deliberation on the boy's possible implication in that truly heinous crime. I would like to clear up the tag ends in the matter of the illicit pregnancy. Are you satisfied that Paul Remillard was unaware of his wife's condition and her determination to flout milieu law? My personal redactive examination of Paul Remillard, immediately prior to his appearance before the Special Committee on Ethics, convinced me that he was innocent of conspiring with his wife. What has puzzled me is Paul's equivocal reaction to Mark's original account of the canoe trip, his apparent fear that his wife was not actually dead. Neither Teresa's body nor that of Rogatien Romillard has been found. The Heartland Rapids, in which the canoe capsized, have apparently trapped human victims among their dense and chaotically tumbled rocks before. The chief rose from her seat, frowning. Still, it would be most unsettling if thou and I have erred in our analyses of these affairs, my dear Lack. There were aspects of mentation in both the boy and his close relations that I could not apprehend at all, and the coincidence of the two fatal events happening so close in time is peculiar, to put it mildly. Yet there seems to be no connection between the deaths. No one but Mark seems to have been involved in the canoe incident, and the adult from Iars appear to be completely innocent of any involvement with that or the murder of Brett McAllister. The magistratum has been obliged, as a result of these mental examinations, to exonerate Paul and his six brothers and sisters. Now it is the boy's turn to be discharged. And still thou seest that I am sorely dissatisfied. The Krondaku's mind was reassuring in response to her anxiety-laden use of the second person familiar. The Lylmik, who selected the seven Rumiyar siblings to be magnates of the concilium, would hardly nominate persons of dubious integrity. Mark is, I admit, a naughtier problem. He is certainly an egocentrist, imperfectly adherent to milieu ethics, and capable of almost anything. But I hardly think that a human stripling, even one as mentally talented as this one, has the metapsychic wattage to hoodwink a couple of old pros like thee and me, my dear Moti Allah. Thou hast not struggled amongst these barbarous folk for thirty-eight orbits as I have, Lek. It's been one nasty surprise after another. The galactic milieu laid a heavy burden of trust upon the Symbiari race when it gave us humanity as our first proctorship. All through these difficult years I have often in the desolate hours of night fought back the growing conviction that we are inadequate to the task. Boulder dash, multi Allah. A tentacle patted her silvery shoulder, and she felt suffused by a cheering, psycho-creative boost to her chlorophyll. No, seriously, Lek. I must still ask myself why Paul was afraid that his wife was alive, and why I was unable to look deeper into this fear or find any explanatory data for it in the mind of Paul's son. It's impossible that humans should be able to resist our meta-concerted coercive redactive probing. Yet... It is impossible, as thou sayest. Only our Lylmic mentors surpass us in the deep probe function. Art thou suggesting that we refer this affair to them, 
express our misgivings and petition for delay of inauguration of the seven Remiar magnates? Or wouldst thou go further and request an extension of the proctorship? The two of them, by unspoken consent, re-entered the parlor. The chief squared her shoulders and made her decision. No, she said evenly. I would not go so far as that evaluator. She returned to the formal vocal mode. You will notify the select committee on orb that the Earth Proctorship Magistratum issues a pro tempore acquittal of both Paul Remiar and his son Mark, who have been adjudged not proven of contriving the deaths of Teresa Kendall and Rogatien Remiar. Paul is also adjudged not proven of conspiring to conceive an illicit child. You will notify the committee that the investigation into the disappearance of Teresa Kendall and Rogatien Romillard will continue. We will maintain covert surveillance of the boy who may have a synchronicitous relation to the crimes. I will transmit the decisions, Enforcer Chief. Meanwhile, we will expect to receive ongoing updates concerning the other case, the bizarre murder of Intendant Associate Brett Doyle McAllister. I confess I am both intrigued and mystified by the apparent draining of life force through intricate and symmetrical psycho-creative wounds. The killing technique is curiously reminiscent of that of the so-called vampires of Shigumith IV, a pre-emergent race that most fortunately extirpated itself before attaining interstellar travel some forty-two galactic millenaries ago. Chaos, take your extinct vampires, the chief exclaimed with asperity. We have no useful data whatsoever in the McAllister case. No suspects once the seven Remiars and Mark were acquitted. No motive, no clues, not even a confirmed mode of death. Nothing except the fact that the victim was married to one of the Remiar dynasty, just as Theresa Kendall was. You still intuit that there might be a connection between the cases? We shall keep open minds concerning the possibility. These enigmatic Remiars, Throma Elu uttered a great sigh. So talented, so controversial, so important. One can hardly forget that in 131 days, this same remarkable family will be among the first humans to become voting members of our concilium. The fact cannot help but color one's investigative judgment. If it were possible that members of the Remillard family had managed to conceal evidence during coercive redactive interrogation, the very jurisprudence of the milieu would require restructuring taking for granted, as it now does, that the truth is always obtained through mental probing. Moti a la Molotarsis felt the finally admitted uncertainty hit her like a blow in the chops. Thou dost think we ought to put it up to the Lylmic. Thou hesitatest to say so flatly out of a delicate regard for my ego, not wishing to undermine what thou perceivest to be my teetering self-esteem. Poppycock, Moti Allah, said Thromo Alu. Thou art valiant as ever only perplexed by this admittedly discrepant situation. Right. The chief's face began to glisten again, so I've changed my mind. I want you to report the whole kit and caboodle to the Lylmic supervisors. Let them decide whether to put their Remillard pets, or perhaps even the whole human race, on hold until we find out what's going on here. At the least, I would recommend that the human polity be put on probationary status in the Concilium for one galactic year. A thousand earth days. I will do as you request, Enforcer Chief Maratarsus. Throma Elu Lek opened the door to the examination room. The disruptions of the ether had completely subsided. The boy was still lying on the couch, sleeping, and in his sleep he smiled. The Krondaku flowed closer, placed one of his minor prehensorial appendages upon the lad's forehead, and tried to read the dream. Mark's eyes opened. His obdurate, conscious barrier was already in place. He stared at the hideous Krondak visage with perfect composure. Am I innocent? Not proven guilty is the verdict we will submit, said Throma Elulek. You have been acquitted. Do you feel able to walk? Certainly. The boy was smiling again, and he got up off the couch easily. It wasn't nearly as bad as I had been led to expect. Had enough, though. The smile vanished, and the gray eyes were suddenly cold. The Krondaku let his redactive probe slide lightly over the boy's mental shield. It was perfect, 
an artifact worthy of his own race of metapsychic titans. Ah, yes, a conference with the Lylmic was indeed called for. He said aloud, Do you resent what was done to you? Couldn't you? Mark's voice was neutral. I suppose I do concede the magistratum's right to probe me, but not the vehemence of the operation. You slipped a block into my memory, but I know that you caused me great pain and forced me to expose my innermost thoughts to you. I think this was wrong. Most humans still believe that the will of the individual should be inviolable, that no one but God has a right to know a person's most secret thoughts. But this is contrary to your unity, isn't it? No, you misunderstand. I suggest that you study the principle of unity more carefully, even though you are still far too immature to fully apprehend this most sublime concept, which is the very operational basis of the entire galactic milieu. A mind immersed in unity is at once sovereign and coadjutant, and incapable of committing the kinds of offenses you were suspected of. Since your race is still of client status, non-coadjutant, and ununified, we do not hold your will to be sovereign and untouchable. We are thus justified in having taken the most strenuous interrogatory actions in cases as serious as these. Mark nodded coolly. Thank you for explaining, Evaluator. You are welcome. Mark turned to the Symbiari official. May I go now? Please wait in the lift area for your escort to North America Tower. Chief Molotarsis was distant. He will bring along your notice of acquittal. Thank you, said Mark. He left the room without haste. The two exotics bade each other a perfunctory mental farewell, after which evaluator Throma Elu went out by another exit. The chief went back into the parlor for more Kleenex to refill her platinum sabretash. For some reason her face and palms had begun to sweat heavily again, and the next examinee was almost due. Chapter 13 Sector 15 Star 15-000-001 Telonus, Planet One, Concilium Orb, Galactic Year, La Prime, One Dash Three Seven Eight Dash Four Seven Zero, One September, Twenty Fifty One. Four entities of the Lyalnik supervisory body were in a slightly edgy mood, having spent a considerable time deliberating over the disturbing data transmitted by the Krondok Judicial Evaluator, Throma Elu Lek. Since no conclusion could be drawn without the input of Unifex, and it was absent on one of its extra-galactic mystery excursions, they decided a distraction was in order. So they translated themselves to the chamber where the bodies were kept and debated actually trying them on. It was a daunting prospect. One realizes, homologous trend remarked with a touch of grumpiness, that Unifex wishes to impress upon the entire Concilium the important status of the group of newly installed human polity magnates. But one might also question whether Unifex carries honorific condescension too far in requiring us supervisors to assume the actual material aspect of humanity at the inauguration ceremony. One would have thought astral bodies would suffice, said asymptotic essence, viewing the four upright forms askance. They were displayed in transparent cases extruded from the softly glowing green walls of the room, two male and two female bodies, alarmingly substantial. By the prime entelechy, but they're ugly things, said eupathic impulse, especially the males. And wouldn't one know that the Unifex, doubtless asserting its famous sense of humor, would assign this entity to that sex? Noetic concordance, the poet said. This entity agrees with its feminine designation, having once acted as creative matrix in the generation of a new Lyalmic person, the dearly loved Resolute Mandament. This event took place in far time, and the coercive instigator was none other than homologous trend. One admits having forgotten this fact, Eupathic Impulse said. Well, so did this entity, said homologous trend. They all laughed. Lylmic reproduction had ceased in Tie Time, more than eight galactic revolutions ago. It was generally agreed by the absent-minded historians of the race that the tragedy had nevertheless had the happy consequent 
of initiating the outreach from the Lyomic 21 worlds, which eventually led to the establishment of the galactic milieu and the beginning of coagenate mental evolution in the Milky Way. The long-ago reproductive event explains why Trend was assigned male and concordance assigned female sex, said the logician, asymptotic essence. But why is this entity, which has never acted as creative matrix, designated female? And why is impulse, similarly innocent of coercive generation, called male? Concordance said, Unifex contemplated our personalities when making its sexual determinations. One presumes that its selection is in some way justified. Oh, indubitably justified, Impulse said, displaying a tinge of exasperation. It has certainly worn the human material form often enough on its own earthside perambulations, to the scandal of the entities here present. One might wonder whether honoring magnified earthlings at the Concilium inauguration constitutes its sole motivation in foisting these fleshy envelopes upon us. The other three entities scoffed merrily at their colleagues' misgivings, but then they resumed examination of the bodies themselves, and felt their confidence waver. The things were so dismayingly solid. Omega knew what would happen when one actually put a body on. The individual Lylmic mind was normally invested upon the most diaphanous material substance, all but imperceptible to the physical sensing organs of Krondaku, Poltroyans, Symbiari, and humanity. Only members of the hyperkeen Gi could readily differentiate the wispy molecules hosting the Lylmic psyche from those of the inanimate atmosphere. On occasions when, for courtesy's sake, a visible presence was called for, Lylmic were accustomed to assume illusory astral bodies of varying form. What Unifex was now asking of the supervisors was something far more radical. Regard the lumpish sinewy feet, Impulse declaimed, the unsightly blemish of the umbilical scar, the vestigial pelt with its inconvenient facial lushness in the male and the odd little patches here and there on the torsos of both sexes. Some of those ridiculous hirsute regions have associated apocrine glands with secretions that will surely stink once the atmospheric bacteria get to work on them. The other three entities cringed. Impulse was taking a melancholy relish in its catalogue of infelicities. Note especially the inelegant design of the male reproductive organs, tacked on almost as an afterthought without regard to the artistic composition as a whole, vulnerable to injury, kinetically awkward. One wears garments, Trent said. We shall certainly do so at the inauguration, since this is the human custom. Asymptotic essence noted gently, We are procrastinating. Shall we pluck up our courage and perform the experiment? Yes, said the others. And in an instant the transparent cases dissolved, and the bodies lived and breathed as the four Lyomic supervisors became incarnate, as moderately youthful men and women who were neither excessively beautiful nor noticeably plain. They were of differing racial stock, and the only indication of their exotic nature was the inhumanly brilliant aquamarine color of their eyes. High thoughts to you, colleagues, and congratulations. You all look splendid. Unifex! Uneasy giggles filled the chamber. Eupathic Impulse discovered, to his horror, that an involuntary vasodilation had turned his pinkish face and countenance bright red. The Lylmic overlord said, The phenomenon is harmless, even susceptible to mental override. Let me pass on to you all certain physiological information that will assist adaptation. Data Impulse's blush faded as he applied the program that Unifex had transmitted. One is thankful for that knowledge. And might one inquire which human form you will assume for the inauguration? I think this one would be safest, said Unifex. There was a brief flash, and the overlord stood before them in the shape of a white-haired, white-bearded, powerfully built older man, taller than his colleagues, with deep-set gray eyes. And let's have clothes for everyone. Another flash and they all wore long tunics and softly flowing over-robes of different subtle colors. It is fitting, perhaps, that we have a little practice session now. Very well, said the others. Unifex was abruptly businesslike. Then let us deal with the intelligence vouchsafed by evaluator Throma Elulek. If we were truly human, 
we would be seated during our consultation. A round golden table and five matching chairs appeared. Unifex plumped himself down with careless familiarity, and the other four followed his example with more circumspection. The Krondok Evaluator presents us with two very disquieting pieces of information, Unifex said, having instantly digested a synopsis proffered by the minds of his fellows. The first involves a suspicion that the mind of the youth, Mark Remillard, and perhaps also the minds of his father Paul and certain other senior Remillards, involved in this investigation, have been able to resist mind probes of the most stringent type. One questions whether the boy may be guilty of the murder of his mother and great-granduncle, and whether the father and his siblings may be conspiring to conceal the crimes of the son, or, less likely, may even be accomplices in those crimes. Shall we join in quincunx to consider? Trend asked. It would take only moments to far-scan the entire planet Earth and ascertain the whereabouts of the physical bodies of Teresa Kendall and Rogatien Remillard, whether or not they are still alive. It isn't necessary, said Unifex. I will tell you flatly that Teresa and Rogi are alive. For reasons that I decline to share at the moment, we will not inform the magistratum of this fact nor will we transmit to it any new data concerning Mark Remillard's complicity in the disappearance of the pair. The boy is a technical violator of certain milieu statutes, but he has not committed murder or any other crime that need concern us. His peccadilloes have justification in the larger reality, and can be ignored for now. We can tell the Earth authorities to keep an eye on Mark, however, to see that he doesn't get into any more scrapes before the human polity joins the concilium. Eupathic Impulse was struggling to subdue his rising indignation. May one inquire just how you formed this amazing judgment? No, said Unifex. One objects. One is miffed in the extreme. Asymptotic Essence laid her hand upon the shoulder of her inflamed colleague and let calming redactive power flow through it. She said to Unifex, We accept your reassurance, as we have accepted it so many other times on good faith alone, but we regret that you do not feel inclined to confide in us. Unifex shrugged. In time it will all be clarified. The second matter for consideration is the psychic vampirism implicit in the death of Intendant Associate Brett Doyle McAllister. He hesitated, and his high brow creased in a deep frown. I have no input to contribute in this case. I suggest that we leave the matter in the capable hands and tentacles of the magistratum. I am certain that there will be a satisfactory resolution in time, and the perpetrator of the crime will be brought to justice. Homologous Trend studied his own new hands. The fingers had interlaced, and the thumbs were busily twiddling. You do not, then, foresee any barrier to the inauguration of the seven Remillards, in view of the grave questions raised by these two cases? Both Throma Alu and Chief Enforcer Malatarsis had deep reservations about the family's fitness for magnification. They even suggested that we might wish to consider postponing the termination of the Symbiari Proctorship and refrain from granting humanity autonomy and milieu citizenship at this time. Asymptotic Essence said, There is a strong sentiment among Symbiari and Krondok magnates for continued oversight, for at least a one-year probationary period of the human polity magnates of the Concilium, and a moratorium on colonization of new planets by humanity. One intuits that the potential for metapsychic calamity still lurks within the mind of this highly renitent people. Trend, impulse, and concordance nodded in agreement. Unifex declared, Friends, there are destined to be scandals and disasters whenever human polity affairs touch those of the milieu. What happens must happen. But in the end, unity will prevail out of chaos, I assure you of that. The Symbiari Proctorship must now end, and inauguration of humanity into the Concilium must proceed. One does accept the one-year probation period and the planetary moratorium. We'll wait a few days and then break it to the earthlings tactfully. I want any resentment over our action to have largely dwindled away before the majority of the magnate designates begin to assemble here in Orb. We wouldn't want to cast a pall over the festivities. The others bowed. Very well. 
we will transmit this judgment to the authorities on earth. Unifax rose from his seat and gestured. Five containers of foaming amber liquid sprang into being, one in front of each entity. Let me introduce you to another human tradition, the Cup of Fellowship. On important occasions one proposes a sentiment devoutly to be wished and drinks to it. I shall do the honors. To the magnification betimes of the galactic milieu, and all six of its polities. He lifted his glass and drained it, then uttered a deep sigh. The others sipped dutifully. Well, I must be off, Unifex said. We shall meet again at the inauguration. Do work out a bit with your new bodies between now and then, won't you? You will want to be at ease with their physical senses, voices, muscles, and other material paraphernalia before manifesting yourselves before the entire concilium. Unifex's smile was a trifle sardonic. There will be a bit of a commotion when we appear this way, you realize. One will want to be prepared. And now I bid you farewell. There was again a flash as the overlord's human body molecules disassembled and were dispersed into the matter-energy lattices. The four sat for some time, drinking the beverage and contemplating. Finally, noetic concordance said, I perceived from the vestibular mind of Unifex that this liquid is called Labat's beer. I rather enjoy the mild euphoria induced by the small alcoholic content. It diminishes anxiety impulses in the primitive human brain in a manner remotely analogous to the consolation to the unity. Let's have some more. Four full glasses appeared. Really? Eupathic impulse was slightly reproving, but not to the extent that he refused the second round. Homologous trend shared a more serious thought. Unifex virtually conceded that the Rumiyar father and son did manage to deceive the magistratum interrogators. We may note that the redactive examination of the other adult Rumiyar siblings was similarly inconclusive. The whole lot of them are probably capable of encrypting their secret thoughts. He raised his half-empty glass and watched the small bubbles rising in it. It is worrisome that human operant metapsychics are revealed to be so strong-minded before being safely coagulated and drawn into the unity. Asymptotic Essence said, We have been assured again and again by Unifex that humans have the highest mental potential of any race in the galaxy. Why should we be surprised that truly Grand Master class minds appear among them somewhat early in the psychoevolutionary sequence? What is the coagulate number for humans, anyhow? asked Impulse. One forgets these trivial details. Ten thousand million minds, said Homologous Trend. They have seven and a half now. The race had nearly outstripped the planetary resources just prior to intervention, and births had dropped drastically. Now, with a fresh population upsurge on the colonial planets, one projects coagulation around the year La Prime 1-390-150 what humans would call A.D. 2083. No time at all, asymptotic essence mused. She conjured her glass full again, and at a nod from eupathic impulse replenished his also. One cannot help but think of the thousands upon thousands of evolving worlds that have passed under lionic scrutiny during the life of the milieu. So many sapient life-forms, obedient to the evolutionary paradigm, rising inevitably from bio-sludge to transcendent self-awareness, that almost all of them doomed to dead end at the pre coagulate level through technological misadventure or natural disaster. Five victories and seven hundred and thirty galactic millenaries. It seems so wasteful. Evolution is wasteful, Trend said austerely, if one is impatient for Omega. One would do better to look at the diminishing temporal interval between the achievement of coagulation by the five successful races. And if humanity does not falter, it will have matured its mind the fastest of any. Perhaps we hover upon the brink of a veritable metapsychic explosion amongst ascendant intelligent races. Do you imply that the human polity might have a pivotal role to play in this problematic mental efflorescence? Impulse did not bother to conceal his skepticism, as he created a fourth beer. Well, I wouldn't want to go out on a limb, Trend hedged. Impulse tossed down his drink and plunked the glass firmly on the golden table. Essence refilled it again. 
My prolepsis hints that the earthlings are more likely to foment disaster than they are to accelerate progress. They're wily. That's what they are. Wily. He finished his fifth glass. There will be only a hundred of them raised to the concilium, Trend pointed out. How much trouble can they cause, being so greatly outnumbered in the vote? His mind displayed. Krondok votes? 3,460. Poltroyan votes? 2,741. Symbiari votes? 503. Guy votes? 430. Human votes? 100. Lyalmic votes? 21. With veto power. We may just find out too late what humanity is capable of, Impulse exclaimed. Don't say one wasn't warned. He gave a sudden start, then looked down in surprise into his lap. Oh, the body! What's it doing? Colleagues, help! This appendage has acquired a terrible will of its own. Trend got up, took his fellow male by the arm, and hurried him toward the door. He said reassuringly, I have analyzed the phenomenon. You've simply had a bit too much to drink, and it produces this odd physiological effect. Don't be concerned. All one has to do is... The door slid shut. Noetic concordance and asymptotic essence exchanged glances. Perhaps we should take our bodies off, essence suggested. Concordance smiled. In a little while. But first I think I shall take the tube to the observation lounge and look out of the stars with my eyes. Would you care to accompany me? It would be an interesting experience. Perhaps we can invite the boys to join us. Laughing, the two Lylemic women finished their drinks adjusted their garments so that the folds fell harmoniously, and went out into the teeming central promenade of the administrative center. There were already fair numbers of human polity bureaucrats residing in Concilium Orb in anticipation of the inauguration, so no one took any particular notice of the pair as they strolled slowly along, chatting and keeping their peculiar eyes modestly downcast. Chapter 14 From the Memoirs of Ragatien Ramillard on the morning after our arrival at Ape Lake, I woke shortly after dawn, left Teresa sleeping in the tent, and walked up the misty meadow to the margin of the woodland, where there was a fine view of the pale, eerie lake waters below. And there I seemed to feel the huge resonances of the place envelop me. I, the interloping alien tuning fork, was being urged to synchronize myself with the country's telluric vibrations, or even to sing as Teresa had instinctively done, blending into the enormous and subtle harmony of lake and mountains and glaciers and the indomitable plants and creatures of the place. Do not oppose, the soul of Ape Lake seemed to say. Do not impose. Only abide. I began to walk. The grass was dew-drenched. The sun was still concealed behind the eastern ridge, but behind me the hanging glacier of soaring Mount Jacobson was a dazzling white shelf, poised above us like a line of frozen surf. I came to the steep creek trail that led down to the lake shore. The stream was tiny, splashing through dark gray strata of shale or some other kind of mudstone that had cracked into thin slabs, oddly tilted to a vertical position by an ancient seismic convulsion. The pure cold stream, sliced apart scores of times by sharp blades of rock, almost seemed to sparkle with satisfaction when it reunited at last in a small cascading sheet and fell gently into the pool at the rock-strewn shore. I strolled along the lake's edge for a short distance, then stood receptive and relaxed beside the expanse of calm, milky water, listening with my mind's ear. I am not a poet, not a sensitive. I have never experienced cosmic consciousness, never joined in a true coagination of minds, never experienced even the least hint of those awesome precursors to unity that the young operants of the modern post-rebellion human polity yearn after and mind whisper about. But I did experience the essence of Ape Lake that morning. The rearing mountains were a palpable sensation, like drumbeats deep in my bones. I tasted a tangy shrillness radiating from the surrounding ice-fields, sensed the defiance of the valiant, twisted little trees of this exposed shore, veterans of hundreds of years of storm-blasts. 
I heard the distant thunder of an avalanche, the rush of a small waterfall tumbling down the slope on the other side of the lake. Most portentous of all, I perceived that I was watched by other minds, gentle, sub-rational, operant minds, whose contribution to the plenum of Ape Lake made it a part of planet Earth unlike any other. I felt amazed and grateful that these minds seemed quite willing to let me and Teresa and unborn Jack share their home with them. My fears and misgivings seemed to evaporate along with the dew on the willow thickets. I prayed, which I hadn't done for some time, and then, loaded down with sacks of food, I climbed back up the trail to the meadow and began to make breakfast. During our first week at Ape Lake, which coincided with the last week that caretaker personnel worked in the Megapod Reserve, Teresa and I refrained from any activity that would drastically change the appearance of the cabin site as seen from the air. And, as it turned out, two vintage flying machines did pass over, a large banana-shaped turbocopter toting some kind of bulky load on a dangling cable, and a venerable Cessna floatplane. Both were far to the south, behind Mount Jacobson, and heading northwest toward Megapod Reserve HQ at Bellacoola. The noise of their internal combustion engines gave us plenty of warning so that we could hide. I made a stab at far-sensing the occupants of the aircraft, but only managed to determine that none of them was operant. One of the first tasks I set about was the digging of a new latrine pit closer to the cabin, and the moving and roofing of the John house itself. Meanwhile it was Teresa's job to gather and dry large quantities of moss and old man's beard lichen. Over the next week she gleaned twenty giant gar bags full of this material, which we would need for log chinking. Building a food cache came next. This was vital in a region where bears, wolverines, and other creatures with a taste for human victuals abounded. I didn't know too much about Bigfoot appetites, but I had a hunch the creatures might be even more of a nuisance than grizzlies if they pegged us as a free lunch stop, so I designed the cache accordingly. The time-honored method, according to our wilderness references, was to find four stout trees that grew more or less in a smallish square, lop off the branches, then construct a high platform using the trunks as corner posts. The cache is accessed by a removable ladder. Unfortunately, our cabin site was on a northern slope, and the nearby trees were mostly stunted hemlocks or other varieties deformed by winter wind blasts and heavy snow. The best I could find were two fifteen-meter white bark pines, a stone's throw uphill of the cabin and close to Little Megapod Creek. Their battered trunks were so wide at the base that I couldn't close my arms around them. However, they tapered drastically higher up and were barely adequate. I figured to make the other legs out of two logs buried upright in holes, but the ground was so rocky and hard to dig that we eventually settled for a triangular cache. I used my old axe to cut down and delimb a suitable Engelmann spruce, leaving a few of the top branches for camouflage. The more efficient wood zapper would have created clouds of possibly betraying steam, and we didn't dare use it until the 1st of September. We hauled the log laboriously into position with a come-along hand winch. A pole tripod with a come-along suspended enabled us to raise the log and socket it in its pit, which we filled with rocks and soil. Later we would fit the three supporting posts of the cache with conical collars made from flattened spam cans in order to discourage squirrels, mice, and other marauding small fry. I built the ladder out of saplings, deliberately making it too fragile to bear the weight of a Bigfoot, and nailed the platform beams in place. I was amazed when Teresa volunteered to hammer down the trimmed poles of the cache floor and build its tarp frame. Oh, I'm not afraid of heights at all, she laughed. When you sing Queen of the Night, you get hung from the stage flies as often as not. So I left her to it, working fearlessly four meters above the ground and vocalizing like the lark ascending, while I got on with making the temporary shelter we would live in until the cabin was refurbished. This shed-like structure, which Teresa dubbed the pavillon, was a simple framework of poles, lashed together with wire and guy-roped against the wind. It became a reasonably snug four-by-six-meter wigwam once it was roofed and draped with heavy plass sheeting, 
then thickly covered with evergreen boughs on top and on three sides. The fourth side, facing the cabin some three meters away, had the transparent plass exposed for lighting and an overlapping flap door that could be tied shut. The floor was more plass sheeting, turned up at the edges and basted to the walls so that water couldn't run inside. I scattered dried grass underfoot for absorption and less slippery walking. The pavillon was to be our principal dwelling place for the next four weeks. It was, of course, unheated, but so far the weather had been warm with some brief periods of rain. After the first shower I added a kind of lean-to porch at the door. This was roofed not with plass, but with the old cedar shakes from the cabin, which we had carefully collected in order to reuse. I rescued the iron stove, set it up in the lean-to, abbreviated chimney poking out the side, and, presto, a nifty covered hearth. Once it was safe to make a large fire, we could cook and bake decent meals on the stove instead of living on trail rations, reconstituted with water boiled in our little microwave. When the first frost killed off the blood-sucking insects, we'd be able to sit by the fire and toast our bones on all but the stormiest of days, and even use the stove to dry clothing when the humidity was high. The woodpile and chopping block were right beside the porch. After the cabin was repaired, the pavillon was going to become a wood storage shed, easily accessible from the cabin a couple of meters away, even when the snow was rough deep. I scavenged broken floor planks from the derelict building and whacked together benches and two rickety tables. I also made a few rough shelves, promising to do better on furniture later, when I could slice up fresh boards with a wood zapper. The little dome tent, which I moved inside Le Pavillon and placed at the far end, was the designated bedroom and the only true refuge from the ravenous black flies, mosquitoes, and moose flies that plagued us in spite of our coercion and our repeated applications of repellent. We worked so hard during those early days, and fell asleep so quickly each night, that there was very little time left for simple socializing. Teresa was cheerful, but very often lost in mystical communion with the fetus, who, it seemed, was keenly appreciative of the special ambience of our refuge. In workaday matters she was usually willing to let me take the lead, doing without complaint whatever jobs I assigned her. She was a strong woman with a ravenous appetite, and her condition seemed to cause her no physical discomfort whatsoever. Since there was as yet no outward sign of the pregnancy, I tended to forget all about it. Seven days after our arrival we were sunburned, bug-bitten, and afflicted with a few minor scrapes and bruises, but we had shelter from the elements, a secure cache, and a few rude comforts. The old cabin had the rubbish cleared out of it and was ready for its new floor and roof. Now that the long-awaited first of September had come at last, we could finally work on our wilderness home without fear of being spied out. But first, a day of rest. I declared that we would celebrate the traditional American Labor Day holiday three days early that year. It was time for Teresa to relax and time for me to explore. She had no desire to accompany me and tried to persuade me not to leave her alone, but I convinced her that it was necessary to know what resources the area had. Most important, we needed larger and straighter trees than the gnarled specimens growing around the site if we were to repair the roof of the log cabin properly and cut new floor joists and planks. I already had a pretty good notion of where I could find what was required. You will be careful. Teresa's mind reflected quick-flicking disaster scenarios of me tumbling into ravines and ice crevasses, being chased by enraged big feet, fending off slavering grizzlies and wolves, getting lost, suffering a heart attack. Of course I'll be careful, and you know we don't have to be afraid of any of the critters. Why don't you just play your keyboard and sing, or watch a good old movie on your tri -D? You've worked hard, and you deserve a rest. But hiking is my recreation. Has been for damn near a hundred years. If you feel lonesome, you can give me a mind shout. I'm not going to go more than two, three climbs away. Just around the end of the lake to check out Ape Creek Canyon and the opposite shore. She cocked her head as if listening, then broke into a brilliant smile. Jack agrees with you that there's nothing for me to be afraid of. Exactly. I kept my mental overlay solemn. Well, wish me luck, ma petite. 
If I don't find some decent roof beams, we may end up spending the winter in Le Pavillon. I stowed a few necessary items in my old Kelty backpack, then hoiked it on and set off across Megapod Creek, heading for the eastern end of the lake. It was a marvelous sunny day, brisk with a light breeze. There were white cirrus streaks clawing up the azure sky over Mount Ramiar, and I hoped that a cold, clear air mass was moving in on us. This hope was reinforced once I hit the bush, for the goddamn bugs came at me in kamikaze squadrons, wild for what might be their last chance at a blood feast before a hard frost stopped their little clocks. I despaired at driving them off with my coercion, and finally put on gloves and my head net. There was a game trail a dozen meters upslope from the shore, which I was able to follow through an area of dense wooded growth. Then I came to a series of rocky meadows, where the alpine wildflowers made a beautiful season-end display. Scarlet paintbrush, lavender asters, and yellow daisy-like arnica bloomed amid the last spikes of arctic lupin. There were plenty of ripe blueberries that could be used to make class baggy jam, and abundant black crowberries that I seem to remember were also edible. I far spoke Teresa and transmitted a mental picture so she could check on the crowberries in one of the reference flecks, and also told her the good news about the blueberry crop. She was really an excellent cook, and our restricted menu of free-squeeze meals had been a sore trial to her, although she had never complained vocally. Her far speech now came to me, all scintillating with enthusiasm. Rosie, I know what I'll do. I'll come pick some berries, and I'll bake us a pie, and make some decent bread instead of that awful bannock. Sounds wonderful. I went up onto a bold little promontory to survey country that was not visible from the cabin site. Beyond the rocky outcrop there was a large clearing extending down to the lake shore. I saw no watercourse but from the suspiciously lush dwarf willows and other rampant vegetation I judged it to be a bog. As I tramped across it I discovered that I was half right. It was a kind of suspended water meadow, the flower-dotted surface quite dry at this time of year, but pocked abundantly with holes a meter or less in diameter, having deep pools of peaty brown water twenty or thirty cents below their overhanging grassy rims. It was necessary to step cautiously to avoid breaking through the treacherous areas of thin crust. I negotiated this obstacle course and passed into a dwarfed hemlock forest beyond, keeping an eye out for animal droppings or other signs of life. But there was nothing except the ubiquitous insects and one friendly whiskey jack, a bird that outdoorsmen with no sense of humor vilify with the name of camp robber. The western race was a little grayer than the birds of my New Hampshire White Mountains, but its habits were identical. It followed me, announcing my presence and begging for a handout by means of noisy clucks and squawks and throaty whistles. I couldn't have asked for a better bear alarm. Ape Lake's shape resembled that of a poorly baked croissant, about three kilometers long and one wide. The northern shore was a fairly smooth concave curve, while the southern, where the cabin stood, was irregular, with a couple of largish outwash moraines down at the glacier-dammed western end. An extensive grass flat at the lake's pointed southeastern terminus made a natural corridor between the heights of Mount Jacobson on my right and Mutton Jeff Ridge on the left. There was a region of thick forest at the corridor's far end that I decided to investigate later. Ape Creek did not drain through this gentle notch. Instead, the flat held only a meandering trickle that flowed into the lake. The Ape Creek outflow was a few hundred meters up the opposite shore, where an abrupt gash broke through Mutt and Jeff Ridge. I followed the narrow white mud shoreline across the flat, then walked over rocks until I came to a thick tangle of driftwood logs blocking the Ape Creek debouchement. With the whiskey jack yelling at me to beware, I crept across this man-trap with exquisite care, the waters of the creek rushing two or three meters beneath me. When I reached the other side, I climbed part way up a talus slope until I had a good view down Ape Canyon. Its walls looked as though they had only recently been cleaved from the living rock and lacked any semblance of a shoreline. The creek waters crashed down a series of ledges, then leapt outward in a white, rumbling cataract that my far side estimated to be a good twenty meters in height. There were smaller cascades further on. 
It seemed fairly obvious that Ape Canyon would provide no easy thoroughfare for either human or megapod. When the big apes came visiting, they probably entered the lake basin through the notch. I had finally reached my goal, the shore opposite the cabin. Beyond Ape Creek, the terrain was very dicey going. Contorted, spiky crumholts and tangled alder grew close to the water's edge, and behind them the slope was extremely steep. But I didn't have to travel much farther to find what I had been looking for. The brush thinned a bit, and there, on the precipitate hillside, I found a stand of fine, straight Engelmann spruce trees. Numbers of them were ideal for board-making purposes, measuring more than thirty-five cents in diameter at the base. The smaller ones and the saplings would make perfect beams and roof poles. All I would have to do was zap down a sufficient number of trees, delimb them and trim them to size, and tumble them down the forty-degree slope into the water, and then figure a way to get them across the lake. I found a breezy rock to sit on, took off the head netting gloves, and shared my lunch of raisins and velveta-smeared bannock with a whiskey jack. Neither Teresa nor I had managed to bake anything respectable in the microwave. Bannock, a traditional wilderness food made by mixing flour, lard, baking powder, and water, was fairly tasty when baked in ashes or fried over an open fire. Unfortunately, microwaves turned it into gray slabs with the consistency of plas foam padding. As I ate, I considered one solution to the log transport problem after another. Solution the first. Our hardware store loot included tenpenny nails. These could be used to spike small log stringers to the larger timbers, forming them into narrow rafts. I could pole these along the V-shaped shore to the cabin, a distance of perhaps two kilometers. It would be desperately hard work, but my arms are strong, and I could walk on shore some of the time, lining the rafts and playing Volga boatman. Evaluation? Practical, but very slow and I'd surely get wet, and the water was ice cold. Solution the second. If I could rig a sail, the rafts could travel directly across the lake, less than half the distance of the shore route. No sweat for me. Speed depended upon the wind, which unfortunately prevailed from the west, straight down the lake, when it wasn't dead calm, as it had been rather often during our week-long stay. Evaluation? I'd still get wet. And how the devil do you steer a 400-kilo log raft through deep water and a crosswind? Solution the third. Tow the rafts across the lake behind another boat. Evaluation. We didn't think to bring an inflatable, and I hadn't a prayer of building a canoe or dugout. Solution the fourth. Stop thinking like a deadhead normal, you klutz. Chop and slice the wood to size on this side of the lake, then use your psychokinesis on a calm day to push the individual pieces of lumber across. Even your lousy PK is strong enough to move floating wood. Evaluation? Eureka! The whiskey jack laughed at me. Feeling very pleased with myself, I finished lunch and then scrambled up the slope to cruise the trees and select appropriate specimens. Then I stood quietly among the doomed spruces and told Ape Lake that I would do my best not to scar the landscape if it would cooperate by keeping its waters calm during the transport phase of the logging operation. The local vibes remained tranquil, and I decided that the response was affirmative. Tomorrow I'd begin cutting with a wonderful new Matsu wood zapper, the laser device that had made chainsaws obsolete, to say nothing of simple axes. With luck, I'd have the cabin in good shape inside of three or four weeks. The day had lengthened into late afternoon. Across the lake, a small plume of smoke rose from the campsite. Teresa had fired up the iron stove for the first time, and perhaps even now she was beginning to cook us a civilized meal. I decided not to far speak her. It would be more fun to be surprised. I started back along the shore, feeling more vigorous than I had in years. Negotiating the Ape Creek log jam was easier the second time around, and when I reached the opposite bank I sat down and stared at it for a while. Providential, that mass of tangled timbers. Without it, I would have had a hell of a time crossing the strong creek outflow to my tree farm. Once again, my mind acknowledged the genius Losi. And my eyes, suitably cast down, spotted the gigantic naked footprint, twice the length of a man's, freshly impressed in the white mud along the creek bank. Chapter 15 
Hanover Municipality, New Hampshire, Earth, 4 September 2051. Professor Dennis Remillard sat on a stool at the greenhouse bench, preparing the last orchid plant. A violent storm was sluicing the vicinity of Hanover, filling the air with thunder and lightning and ebullient ions, so of course this had to be the night that the several times postponed Remillard family conference was finally scheduled to take place here at his farm in just a half hour or so. When the more spectacular varieties in Dennis's orchid collection came into bloom, he was accustomed to bring them into the house for Lucille to admire, or to use as decorations when she gave one of her famous dinner parties or other academic entertainments. Tonight's somber family gathering had nothing festive about it, but that was all the more reason, she had said, for some distracting flowers. Lucille had wanted to select the orchids herself, just as she and Dennis were about to go out to the little semi-detached greenhouse, she had a sudden brilliant idea, coinciding with the arrival of a massive cloudburst, and dashed heedlessly into the rain to her car. Her motivations and goal were artfully hidden, but she did fling belated mental reassurance at Dennis as she roared away into the storm. She had just remembered something, she told him, something that might be an important clue in the disappearance of Teresa and Roger. She would be back soon, and Dennis was not to let the family conference start without her. After fifty-six years of married life with Lucille Cartier, Dennis had learned to be philosophical about his wife's volatile mood swings and abrupt flashes of creativity. He knew it would be futile to attempt to stop her or to demand an explanation, so he simply went about the business of fetching the orchids and now and then thought to pray peace for the whole troubled Remillard family. As the hour drew near for the seven children's arrival, Dennis had already prepared and carried in two beautiful plants. One was a spray of Phalaenopsis for the mantelpiece, delicate as pale yellow moths perched on a bough. The other was a huge specimen for the Chinese porcelain pot by the front window, an Oncidium ornithorhynchum, bearing a cloud of dancing rosy lilac blossoms of quaint bird-like form. There remained only one last plant to groom, the pride of his collection, a Fujiwara azurine atmosphere, with a cluster of three splendid sky-blue flowers, each nearly eighteen centimeters wide. It had just reached perfection, and it might help to raise the spirits of poor Cat, who had always admired it extravagantly. Ironic that it was Uncle Roger's favorite orchid, too. Using a sterile knife, Dennis cut away a few damaged roots, then swabbed the wound with fungicide, he inspected the plant carefully for pests, watered it, and set it into a decorative basket. Then he tidied everything up, washed his hands at the sink, turned out the lights, and stood quietly for a moment in the humid, fragrant dark. Rain continued to batter the glass roof, but at least the thunder had stopped. Now and then a distant, silent lightning stroke illuminated the tossing maple trees outside. It had been one storm after another all throughout that dreary Labor Day weekend, not that the inclement weather had particularly discommoded the family. The recent tragedies had forced the cancellation of the traditional monster beach bash at Adrian and Sherry's house, and in its place Paul had called again for the family conference that had already been put off twice, the first time because of the disappearance of Teresa and Roger, and then once more when it seemed that the magistratum might demand that Paul and his siblings be barred from the concilium. No spouses and no members of the younger generation were invited to the meeting. It was only for the seven Grand Master Class children of Dennis and Lucille. They would discuss Catherine's future and what measures the family should take concerning the disappearance of Teresa and Uncle Roger, and whether they should attempt to intervene actively in the apparently stymied investigation into Brett McAllister's ghastly death. Dennis brooded over the latter, as he had done all weekend ever since a certain shocking notion had presented itself. Dear God, he said to himself, it couldn't possibly have been him that did it. He's dead. You took him. Freed us. But the pattern of Brett's burns was identical. I can't be wrong about that. I'll never forget that horrible sight, her poor burned body, as long as I live. But he couldn't have killed Brett. He's dead, safely dead. God, he's got to be. But 
How else to explain it? And Uncle Roger, he certainly hasn't drowned. I can't be sure about Teresa, but I'd know if that old rascal had turned up his toes. I love him too much not to know, and I deep-viewed the Connecticut River from hell to Hinsdale and found nothing, nothing, nothing. And even if the bodies got over the Bellows Falls Dam, they never could have made it past the Vernon, so they aren't there, no matter what Mark says, the little wretch. He knows. And, God, you've got to let me know, too, he cried aloud. But the Sexternians of the Divine Concursus remained obstinately mum. Standing there in the flickering, ion-charged night, fed to the teeth with mysteries, grief bereft of his usual composure and self-command, Professor Denis Remillard did something very atypical. He lost his temper. Frustration channeled all his immense metapsychic power into a bellow of sheer rage directed along his uncle's intimate mode. Roshi, answer me! I know you're not dead! Far speak me, damn you, via connard, and tell me the truth. And for the briefest instant, Dennis seemed to detect a minuscule response coded with Roger's mental signature, a telepathic squeak, quite involuntary, from a mind unexpectedly pricked. It came from far to the northwest. Dennis flung himself mentally in the direction indicated by that eye-blink brief trace, he soared across North America, out of body, scanning, scanning for Uncle Roger's familiar oddball aura over the eastern mountains, the Great Lakes, the woodlands and high plains of Canada, the Rockies, the interior plateau of British Columbia, the coastal mountains, the fjords and rain-forested islands of the Pacific, and found nothing. Of course nothing. Even if Roger's paltry metafaculty had heard, if the old man was hiding with Teresa, he would hoist mental barricades and lie doggo, mistrustful even of the man he loved like a son. Dennis's tremendous seeker sense, still imperfectly trained according to milieu standards, could only flail about in helpless wrath, not knowing where along that attenuated, fuzzy-edged mental beacon flash to look. I'm going to find you, Uncle Roger, sooner or later. You'd better believe it. Dennis returned. He commanded himself to be calm again. And at once a thought impinged on his still receptive mind. But this time the telepathic hail was from nearby, and it was his wife and not his quixotic uncle who bespoke him. Lucille was back, calling from the living room of their elaborately refurbished farmhouse. Dennis, Dennis, come inside. I found a clue. A clue? At the South Street house, Paul's place, went there, looked again, found... Dennis, come in at once. It's Paul's egg landing in the driveway and Philip and Maury together. Right, coming. And here's Anne and Sevy and Adrian bringing Cat. Yes, yes, I'm on my way. He picked up the blue orchid plant carefully and used his PK to open the door to the passage leading to the main house. The powerful, precisely directed mind speech of the seven grand master metapsychics, who were his adult children, called out affectionate greetings to Dennis as he approached and completely obliterated the dire, etheric reverberations of the storm. Paul. Here's Papa. Now, Mama, will you tell us what you found out, or must we commit mental matricide? Are Teresa and Roger alive? Lucille. I think I have proof of it. Paul. Oh, Jesus. Dennis. Come, everyone sit down. For heaven's sake, Lucille, take off your raincoat. Philip. I'll hang it up, Mama. Lucille, oh, damn the raincoat. You know I've been going through your house, Paul, trying to discover if any significant items were gone. Things Teresa might have taken away. Paul, and you've had no luck because her rooms are a mare's nest. Teresa has three closets stuffed with clothes and enough musical junk to stock a small conservatory. The housekeeper always followed Madame's instructions and never touched the personal things. So who could tell what items might be missing? Lucille, tartly, certainly not you. You spend most of your time at the apartment in Concord. But never mind. The reason I found nothing earlier is that I was checking out the wrong kind of things. I realized that this evening. What I should have been looking for were baby items. Catherine. Of course. And if Teresa did run away with Roger, it was certainly in order to save the child. Paul. The cedar chest. The one in that dressing room that we always converted to a nursery. Lucille. Yes, that's where she kept the baby things. The christening gown that Tante Margie made for you, Philip. That's been worn by all the children. 
and the shawl that Anushka Goris crocheted for Mark, and that silver dumbbell rattle that all your children teethed on, and the beautiful swan's down bunting that Colette Roy gave Teresa? The chest was all in a mess, and some minor items may have been gone. I couldn't be sure, but one important thing was missing. The bunting. Its protective wrappings had been torn open and left there empty inside the cedar chest. Various exclamations. Poor Dully. Alive. I knew it. I knew it all along. God, how could she do this to me, to all of us? Severin. That's hardly the question. She has done it, and artfully at that. Paul. God damn it, Sevy. Dennis. Your mother has more to tell us. Lucia. She took the bunting, and that set my mind onto a fresh track. Teresa may seem rather blasé about her older children, but never where helpless babies are concerned. If she was planning to hide for the next four months in a place where winters are cold, she might very well have wanted certain specialized information about the environmental requirements of newborns. I realized that no one had thought to check the public database records. Maurice. That's right, the library. How stupid. Lucille. So I went down to the computer to see what materials had been accessed from the house on August 24th, the day of the disappearance. There were no books on infant health listed, but someone had downloaded these. Image. Adrian. Skills for taming the wilds, camping and woodcraft, how to build your home in the woods, the camper's Bible. Philip. Walton. Good grief. Paul. The collected poems of Robert fucking service? Maurice plus Severin plus Adrian. A bunch of the boys were whooping it up in the Malamute saloon. Anne. She's gone to hide up in the Yukon? Preposterous. Dennis. Not necessarily the Yukon, but somewhere in that area. I have some brand new proof of my own. Recapitulation. Various exclamations and expletives. Dennis. So Uncle Roger is definitely alive, and Teresa is probably with him, and it seems a foregone conclusion that Mark conceived and executed the entire scheme. Paul, groaning. He had to. Uncle Roger doesn't have the expertise, or the balls, to engineer a stunt like this. Adrian. Given the fact that Mark was only missing for a period of fifteen hours or less, they must have flown out of here. Paul, if we turn this new information over to the magistratum, I have no doubt that it would find Roger and Teresa. Knowing Mark, we can be sure he created a fine mess among the V-route traffic records. But even if the flight can't be tracked, Papa's far speech trays narrows the search area to a fairly reasonable size, one that can be marked off and combed methodically by Symbiari Krondok teams working in Metaconcert. It might take weeks for the enforcers to pinpoint my wife and Roger, but eventually they'd nail them. Lucille. If we turn over the information, Mark must have known that there was a good chance that Dennis would scan out Uncle Roger. He set up the canoe accident to give the family an excuse not to pursue the matter further. And our interrogation and Mark's by the exotics produced no evidence that we conspired or that we knew Teresa and Roger were alive. The family is legally off the hook. Severin, we'll be on again, at least Paul will be, when Teresa shows up on the front doorstep with the fruits of her crime wrapped up in Colette's bunting. Maurice, four months from now. By then we'll all be safely magnified, Adrian. We could call in all our political markers, pass a retroactive legitimizing bill for the child in pardons for the lot of us once the human polity has legislative autonomy. Human sentiment will be overwhelmingly on our side. The repro statutes are probably the most bitterly resented aspect of the Symbiare proctorship, and the laws are bound to be modified. Philip, may I point out that our future credibility, our personal integrity as officials of the Galactic Concilium, will be compromised if we conspire after the fact of a felony? Adrian, fuck it! I say good for young Mark. Philip. On the other hand, from a milieu legal standpoint, the reproductive statute's violation falls under the just civili category rather than the just naturali, and it may be argued that from time immemorial humanity has held reproduction to be one of the sovereign rights of the individual. Severin, groaning, save it for the courtroom, Phil. Paul, this damned affair has me crawling the wall. Cat, you haven't made any comment yet. What would you do? Catherine, I'm a human, a woman and a mother. Need you ask? And poppycock, 
I'm human and a woman and a legal scholar, and I think Phil raises a perfectly valid objection. The human polity is going to be on probation within the concilium for a thousand days, and during that time, the five exotic races of the milieu will be judging our race by its leadership. And we all know that's going to be us. Is this family willing to march into the galactic age, papered with pardons like some gang of operant Nixons? Adrian, shrugging. It would be the earthling thing to do. I don't think the Symbiari would be disillusioned, poor green bastards. Not after pushing broom behind the human circus parade for thirty-eight orbits? Maurice, I rather doubt that the Gee would be scandalized either, given their racial penchant for reproductive enthusiasm. And the Poltroians are inclined to clap their little purple paws and give three cheers whenever we put one up on the leaky freakies. Dennis, Paul, you're going to be first magnate, unless Davy McGregor manages a major upset. Teresa is your wife, and the child is yours. So is the decision. Paul, let it be. Lucille sighs. Catherine, embracing Paul, bless you. All the problems will be worked out in time. Severin, Mark thinks he fooled the exotic interrogators, but you can bet your boots the magistratum still has him under surveillance. We'll have to warn him to watch his step. Paul, we will not involve that boy any further in this family conspiracy. Adrian, seems to me he's already in above the eyebrows. Severin, if we don't tell the kid that we know what he's done, we're putting ourselves at risk. I, for one, wouldn't put it past him to make visits to his mother's hideaway between now and the time of the baby's birth. He could be followed by agents of the magistratum, and we'd all be back to square one. Adrian, Mark would put any trackers off the scent the same way that he deceived the forensic redactors who tried to mind-dream him. Paul, not necessarily. If the magistratum used a mechanical surveillance device rather than a living far sensor, Mark might not even condescend to notice it. That son of mine is lousy with raw power, but he still has a few things to learn about high-tech machinery. Sevy's right about Mark being a danger. But taking him into our confidence, we'd end up actively aiding and abetting him, aggravating the original crimes rather than passively acquiescing. Philip, dourly. A nice point. And positively Jesuitical. Various uneasy laughter. Lucille, I have a suggestion, Paul. In two weeks, you'll be sending your new staff to Concilium Orb to deal with the pre-inauguration details and set up your office there. Send Mark with them. Get him off Earth entirely. Make him a junior member of your staff. Other magnate designates are doing it. I know that Anushka Goris is bringing her nephew, Vasily. The child is even getting university credit for time spent as a Concilium page. We could arrange the same thing for Mark with the Dartmouth Department of Political Science. And we'd have to keep a sharp eye on the young devil in the meantime. The safest thing would be to ship him off-world immediately. Tomorrow. Severin, damn straight. And you're the perfect one to nanny him. And, oh, no, you don't, Sevy. Severin, it's logical. You're a coercer whiz. You have low cunning and a suspicious nature. Essential for coping with Mark. And you're the only one of us who's unencumbered with a family who can drop everything and go. Your work in polity jurisprudence is all in your skull and a fleck library that you can tuck into your purse. Mama's scheme is our best shot, and Mark might actually turn out to be useful on Orb. He could use his mind-bending faculties to coerce suitably spiffy family accommodation out of the concilium billeting flunkies. Paul. Ernie, I think it would be for the best. Lucille, undoubtedly. Please, dear. Anne, trapped like a rat. Adrian, well, thank God that's settled. Image of agenda. On to the next item of business. Catherine, screen slam. Paul, can't, don't. You knew when you agreed to come here that we would have to work this out. Philip, gently. The project you and Brett worked on is sidelined for complete restructuring. It may take months to replace Brett, if he can be replaced. You must face it, my dear. You're no longer indispensable to that particular operation. You belong where the exotic nominators said you belonged, on the Galactic Concilium. Maurice plus Severin plus Anne plus Adrian plus Paul plus Dennis. Yes. Lucille, you know in your heart that we're right, darling. Catherine, you are all right. From the beginning... If I hadn't balked, Brett might still be alive. Various indignant horror. Paul. 
Cat, for God's sake. Catherine, all right, all right, you win. The damned dynasty always wins. I'll stop my puerile mourning for bread and admit that my project no longer needs me and accept my responsibility to the human polity. Are you all satisfied? Paul. Thank you, Cat. Catherine. And now, for the love of Christ, get on with the next order of business, the one all of you have been afraid to face from the start? Maurice, uneasily. Hmm. Can I get us all drinks first? Lucille, come and help me bring in tea and coffee, Moray. We need something to warm us on a night like this. Seven. Cognac in my tea, garçon, s'il vous plaît. The good stuff? Maurice, following Lucille. Canuck, Philistine. Dennis to Catherine. I understand why you did it, but I'm sorry about your hair. Catherine, smiling absently. No big thing. Brett liked it long, but it was always a bit of a nuisance to care for. Dennis, I'm a little disappointed that you haven't noticed the blue orchid. I brought it in just for you. Catherine. Papa, it's exquisite. And three blooms at once this time. Dennis. You'll take one home with you. Catherine. I couldn't. Dennis. Certainly you will. I insist. Cuts a flower with his penknife and places it in her hands. There. I'll have Maury bring you a plass bubble to carry it in. Catherine. I... All right, Papa. Kisses him. Thank you for... for trying to cheer me up. And all of us loved Brett, but we can't afford the luxury of mourning. The only meaningful way to honor his memory is to bring his killer to justice. Severin. The damned magistratum has been doing nothing but spinning its wheels since it put the family through their brain grinder and came up empty. Adrian. Do you know what the latest scuttlebutt theory is? That the murderer is a non-human. One of my colleagues in exotic affairs told me that the proctors now suspect a meta-concert of disaffected symbiotic, since their own race is the only other besides humanity that's so poorly attuned to unity as to be capable of murder. They postulate a meta-concert because no individual sim has the mental wattage to have extracted the summa totalis of Brett's psycho-creative energy in that crazy, complex fashion. Philip plus Anne plus Severin plus Catherine. Incredulity. Paul. The theory is perfectly plausible. Severin. Bullshit! The murder was the work of a psychopathic human operant with a tantric lotus ladder fixation. Anne. Thank you, Dr. Young. Severin, doggedly. The seven ashen chakras found on the body can have no other meaning. The police ought to be looking for some oriental colleague of Brett's with a professional grudge. Paul. They did. No such person exists. Neither Brett nor Cat has any associates who could be classified as genuine enemies. And among those who are less than warm charms, none possesses high metafunction. Severin. Then the perpetrator was a random killer. The idea of a symbiari meta concert is absurd. What rational motive could our worthy green brethren, or anyone else for that matter, have for killing Brett? And the magistratum was willing to believe that all of us had a rational motive, until they probed us. Catherine, only exotic imbeciles would think that my own brothers and sister would conspire to kill my husband just because I had refused the magnate ship. Philip, quietly. But now you have agreed. Catherine. Yes. Paul, the magistratum still questions whether the forensic redactive probing of the seven of us, and Mark, gave any valid data at all. They suspect that we may be powerful enough to thwart the mind dream technique. Adrian, that's ridiculous. No human grandmaster is that good. Paul, frankly, I wonder whether this symbiari villain metaconcert theory might be only a smokescreen. Severin, while they continue to suspect us? Paul, or Mark? Catherine, my God. Paul, if any human being is capable of resisting Krondok's symbiari mind probing, it's Mark. God knows none of us can get through his deep screens. Not that I actually suspect him of having anything to do with killing Brett. And we must mount our own investigation of Brett's death. Use every resource. It's the only way to clear the family name. Accepting pardons for helping Teresa have her baby is one thing, but an allegation of murder is something else. Adrian, you know, Annie's hit the nail on the head. As usual, it's no secret that the new probation period for humanity was a direct consequence of the murder investigation. Krondok and Symbiari members of the Magistratum even tried to rescind our family's nominations because of Brett's death and Teresa's disappearance. All that saved us was the Lionic veto. Philip, now there was a curious thing. 
It might lend credence to the notion of a non-human faction attempting to discredit us. The Lylemic would put a stop to that, but they might be willing to let the magistratum plod on and ferret out the Symbiari cabal on its own. Maurice, re-entering with Lucille. The Lylemic want the proctorship ended. They want the human polity to take its place in the concilium, and they want the most powerful operants of our race. That's us, working for the milieu rather than against it. This is why they've decided to ignore the scandals and push on with our inauguration. Adrian, ruminatively. Paul, you reported Teresa's illicit pregnancy to the magistratum before Brett's death, didn't you? Paul, I notified Malatarsis right after Mama called me, at 13.46 hours on Thursday the 24th. Brett was killed at least 14 hours later in the wee hours of the 25th. And so the exotic metaconcert theory is remotely plausible, given a conspiracy in the magistratum itself. We should also keep in mind that Cat's decision to decline the magnate ship was the talk of Concord that afternoon. Catherine, but that the exotics should kill just to impeach us and keep us from taking our concilium seats? Why? Maurice, we might be looking ahead. Afraid that what the Lylemics say about humanity's mental superiority is true. Resenting it. Catherine. The galactic milieu is supposed to be above dirty politics. That's what the concept of unity is all about. Paul. The Symbiari are an imperfectly unified race. Just as we will be some day. The fact that this theory is being taken seriously should indicate to us that a Symbiari conspiracy is within the realm of possibility. Adrian, there's no way this family can initiate any private investigation of exotics, not before the end of the probation. Paul, true. Shall we be content to leave matters in the hands of the magistratum until then? Philip plus Maurice plus Severin plus Anne plus Adrian. I, Catherine, what if the killer is someone else entirely? Maurice, you mean some psychopathic kundalini yoga adept who murdered Brett with or without a motive? Catherine. It could have happened. Philip, all the more reason for us to postpone action. The magistratum is aware of that possibility. Its enforcers can do a better job searching for such a person than we ever could. Paul, sir, we're agreed. We wait. Philip plus Maurice plus Severin plus Anne plus Catherine plus Adrian. Yes. Catherine, then that winds everything up. Mama, Papa, I know you'll understand if I leave now. Adrian, can we go? Adrian, sure, sis. My egg is your egg. And let me remind you all of one thing. Tomorrow you will be part of an honor guard escorting me and young Mark to the Kuru starport in Guyana. Various moans and catcalls. And cheer up. You can all have the cayenne chicken and mango daiquiris at the Devil's Island Rendezvous after the dear lad and I pop into hyperspace. To Paul. You'll have him ready. I checked the orb flight on my wrist com. We'll all have to take the shuttle from Burlington at 0635. Keep Mark in the dark until we're safe at the Kuru boarding gate, won't you, Paul? Just to be on the safe side. Tell him you're just seeing me off and pack a bag for him on the sly. We wouldn't want him to disappear or get sick at the last minute or think up some extremely logical reason why he has to stay here on Earth. Paul. Will do. Dennis helps Catherine wrap her orchid. She goes out with Adrian. Anne leaves. The seal begins to collect cups and saucers. Paul helps her carry things to kitchen. Dennis, on intimate mode. Philip, Maury, Sevy, please stay on after Paul goes. Philip plus Maurice plus Severin, question mark? Certainly. Paul, re-entering living room. Well, I'll get along, too. Good night, Mama, Papa. Thanks for hosting the confab. To his brothers. See you at Burlington, mes frangins. Exit. Dennis, after an interval. I have something to tell you three. It concerns Brett's murder. Perhaps we'd all better sit down again. Lucille looking in. Et moi aussi. Dennis. You may as well. Lucille sitting. I knew you were up to something when you coerced Paul into leaving. Severn. Astounded. Papa, you mean you can still... Philip. Be quiet, Sevy. What is it, Papa? Dennis. I have one solid piece of information to put before you. The rest is only intuition. You all know what this is. Image. 
It's a depiction of the peculiar patterns of ash that were left along Brett's spine and on his head when his killer extracted his psycho-creative life force. Please compare that set of lotus patterns with this one. Image. Philip. They are virtually identical. Dennis. The second set was found on the body of Shannon O'Connor Tremblay. She was murdered in 2013, on the very day of the great intervention, by my younger brother Victor. Similar marks were found on the body of her father, Kiran O'Connor, who was also presumed to have been killed by Victor. I regret to say that an emotional block in my mind prevented me from making the correlation before this. General consternation. Philip. But Victor acted alone. He shared his powers with no one, not even Shannon's devil of a father. There's no person he could have transmitted his... his... technique to. And Victor's been dead for eleven years. We were all there at his bedside and saw him, felt him, die. Dennis, he died. After nearly twenty-seven years in a coma, encapsulated inside his own brain, unable to communicate mentally or physically with another living thing, he died. Yes. That's what we thought. Philip. God almighty, Papa, are you suggesting... Maurice, that Victor's mind somehow regained its potency? Severin, that the contagion was passed on, that his diabolical ambition lives? Philip plus Maurice plus Severin, in the mind of one of us? Dennis, I have asked myself if it was possible, if God could have permitted Victor's imprisoned psyche to reach out at the very end, after we'd prayed for him for so long, reach out either in love or in a last temptation? Maurice, Papa, I don't mean to be blasphemous, but God doesn't have a damned thing to do with this. The question is, did Victor have the strength right then at the vital field of dissolution to break through his latency and take over another human mind? Philip. Mama wasn't there at the deathbed, but all the rest of us and our spouses were. I think we can eliminate Maeve and Cecilia from suspicion. Since the divorce, Maeve has avoided the family. At the time of the Rye Beach barbecue, she was in Ireland, asleep in bed with her latest boyfriend and Cecilia was off-world at a medical convention. That leaves me and Maury and Sebi, my wife Aurelie, Adrian and Sherry, and Paul and Kat herself, nine family members as potential tools of Victor, if he was capable of mind transfer. Lucille, no, no, you're talking witchcraft, not valid metapsychology. Such things can't happen. One mind can't be enslaved by another. The human personality, Severin, can fragment... Multiply. You're a trained psychologist, Mama. You know that scores of separate personas can reside within a single diseased mind, an ordinary mind. Who knows what monstrous deviations might afflict operants? We can utilize the mental lattices to influence the very fabric of time and space, matter and energy. Who's to say what else we're capable of? The abnormal psychology of Homo Superior is still being written. I'm writing a bit of it myself. If... Such a transfer were possible. The victim might not even be aware of it consciously, just as a patient with multiple personality disorder is unaware of the existence of the other identities. Lucille. Dennis, do you think it could happen? Dennis, I don't know. But you see why I'm afraid, don't you? Philip. Good God, yes. Maury and I are probably the only ones besides you and Mama and Uncle Roger who can remember what Victor was really like in his prime. The man wasn't a human being at all. He was an evolutionary aberration. Severin, quietly. I remember Victor quite well. The last time we saw him, before the intervention, that is, was at the family Christmas party at Tante Margie's in Berlin in 2012. You were fifteen, Phil, and Maury was thirteen, and I was nine years old. Anne and Cat and Adrian were just little kids, and of course Paul hadn't even been born. Uncle Victor came in with his twin deadhead stooges, Uncle Lou and Uncle Leon, all loaded down with expensive presents, just like always. And, just like always, the operant relatives were polite and had their toughest mental defenses in place, and the normal ones were either fawning over the family black sheep with a Midas touch, or else scared white. Only the littlest kids were glad to see Uncle Vic, the ones who were too young to realize that there was more to him than a big, good-looking guy handing out incredible loot. That year, when I was nine, was the first time I knew. Vic didn't try to make mental contact, didn't really do a thing, but all the same I knew. 
It was the mystery of evil coming home to me for the first time, and I was damn near petrified. Vic just laughed and gave me this fantastic rhythm programmer with one of the first of the brain board interfaces. Right after Christmas, I traded it. Maurice, good thing. Those early brain boards had nasty possibilities. A meditative interval. Dennis, slowly. Boys, do you agree when I state that no known operant entity could have killed Brett in that manner from long distance? Philip, I think it's a safe assumption. Even a Grand Master Class exotic operant, always excluding the Lyalnik, whom we know so little about, would have had to be in Brett's immediate vicinity to initiate a psycho-creative drain of such extraordinary complexity. Dennis, the Magistratum probed all your minds and presumed you and your spouses innocent of Brett's murder. Orally and Sherry were exonerated because their metapsychic powers are too meager to have accomplished the killing, and they are completely incapable of resisting exotic mind probe techniques. We can safely eliminate them from suspicion. But we know, and so does the Magistratum, that probing does not necessarily exonerate us. There are only four members of the family who I can be certain were nowhere near Rye Harbor when Brett died on that boat. You three, and your mother. Severin was here in Hanover all the previous Thursday and throughout the night and early morning on Friday, the day of the murder. Lucille had called him up from Concord when she thought she'd convinced Teresa to have the abortion. Early Thursday evening, when your mother discovered that Teresa had disappeared, she called you two others up from the capital to help in the rough far-scan search. The three of you stayed with her until the next morning. Severin. But Paul never went to the beach. He remained in Concord and came to Hanover late Friday morning. Maurice. Yes. On the evening of the beach party, he was to make a statement before the specially convened judicial panel that would determine whether he should be suspended from the intended assembly during the inquiry into Teresa's criminal pregnancy. When he was allowed to keep his seat, he decided against egging up to Hanover immediately. On Friday morning, there was an important assembly session debating the Denali colonization, and he had made his mind up that Teresa was only hiding and that she'd turn up. Dennis. Paul didn't come to Hanover until long after Mark was found on the riverbank around 06.30 Friday morning, when we had the first suspicion that Teresa and Roger had been drowned. Paul says he was at his conquered apartment all night. Severin. But he had all the time in the world to egg over to Rye. Dennis. Adrian and Anne and the wives didn't know about Teresa and Roger's disappearance or any of the rest of it until I told them. That was after the police notified me of Brett's murder on Friday morning. I far spoke Paul to inform him and found him still in Concord, so he must be considered a viable suspect. Lucille. Oh, my God. Dennis. And so are Adrian and Anne. Both of them came in from Concord on Thursday afternoon, as Cat and Brett did wanting to escape the magnate madness that had broken out in the capital. On Thursday night, Adrian and Anne were at the Rye Beach barbecue with me and all the grandchildren. Lucille, Adrian, Annie, Paul, it's not possible that one of them is a psychic vampire. Dennis, don't forget Catherine herself. If the aberration is locked away in the unconscious, she could be guilty. Lucille, Dennis, no. Dennis, calmly, yes. A part of her mind could have resented being tied to Brett in the child latency project. Catherine seems to have the smallest coercive component of any of you, the least ambition. She married Brett, a brilliant man, but her metapsychic inferior, against the advice of the family because she was deeply in love with him. But if she was invaded by Victor long ago, who can say what motivates her inner persona? Perhaps a kind of, of psychic time bomb lay dormant in her mind until the appropriate stimulus activated it. Severin. Mark is also a suspect. No one knows for certain where he was before he turned up on the riverbank at dawn. Maurice. But how could Vic ever have got to him? Mark wasn't there at the deathbed like the rest of us were. And he was only two years old. Papa, you postulated Vic acting out some kind of temptation scenario in extremis. But no one can tempt a two-year-old. Dennis, not an ordinary two-year-old. Philip, Mark was there. Uncle Roger brought him and Teresa to Berlin because Paul was flying Papa in from Johns Hopkins. Dennis, yes. Paul had tried to convince me that I was too ill to attend the Good Friday meeting. But some premonition told me it would be our last chance. Severin, 
Mark wasn't in the same room as Victor at the end, but he was across the hall with the nurse, and Victor was strong enough at his death to take Louis and Leon and Yvonne with him. Maurice. So he could have reached Mark. Dennis, sighing. Yes. Lucille, abruptly. But this entire notion is monstrous, that one of our family could be some sort of fiend in disguise. Philip. Brent is dead. The ash patterns match those on a known victim of Victor Remillard. There must be some correlation. The modus operandi is too bizarre. Maurice. Papa, were the details of Shannon and Kieran O'Connor's deaths publicized? I certainly don't remember anything in the media at the time. Of course, the great intervention overshadowed everything. Dennis. Uncle Roger, who practically caught Vic in the act, knew about Shannon. He told me early the next day, and we led a handful of New Hampshire state police officers to the closet in the hotel offices where Shannon's body was hidden. The ambulance attendants who took her body away would have seen the ash patterns, and later so would the county medical examiner who did the autopsy. Who else? The employees of the funeral home who put her body in a closed coffin. Nobody else, except for Uncle Roger and me. Everyone who saw the ash marks was non-operant. There was no publicity whatsoever on the cause of Kiran O'Connor's death. As for the inquests, well, as Maury said, the great intervention was all that seemed to matter. Roger and I agreed that nothing was to be gained by accusing Vic of killing Shannon. We had no proof, and he was in a profound coma. In the end, there was an open verdict on her death. It wasn't even called murder. She had no close living relatives. Her estranged husband... Jerry Tremblay claimed the body, and it was cremated. I suppose Jerry might have seen the ash patterns, but he's long gone, too. Victor remained comatose and was eventually remanded to the custody of the family because nobody could think of anything else to do with him except keep him in a private facility, and we were willing to take responsibility for him. He couldn't be tried for the gun battle on Mount Washington. He wasn't officially accused of anything because his accomplices had mental blocks preventing their testifying against him. By the time the proctorship looked into the case and officially pinned the attack on my brother, it was agreed that his medical prognosis was hopeless. We were free to pull the plug, if we wanted to. Philip, and none of us has ever understood why you didn't, Papa. We thought we were joining with you in Meta Concert to pray for Victor's natural death every year on Good Friday because you... because you couldn't... Lucille, you all saw that Victor's body did not deteriorate. Even without muscle stimulation and provided with only simple food and water, he retained the appearance of a healthy man. His nervous system functioned perfectly. His EEG traces showed normal sleeping and waking patterns and apparent cognition, even though he was incapable of making any voluntary movement or communicating verbally or metapsychically. He lived and apparently thought. What his thoughts were, whether he was sane or insane, no one could say. He was utterly isolated. Severin. Then why didn't you... Dennis, because while he lived, I could still hope that one day he would be sorry, that he'd feel remorse for what he had done. And it seemed obvious to me that he was not ready to die. He could have stopped his life processes by willpower alone at any time. Maurice. Good grief, Papa. Dennis, none of you children knew the true extent of my brother's sins. Very few people did. I'll have to tell you now, I suppose... But not tonight. Severin, softly. He was a monster. But to condemn him to that... Maurice, every year, every Good Friday, you made us all visit him. We never knew the real reason why you joined us and made a concert, why you focused our massed mind power with your own coercion, subjugating us. Dennis, wearily, would it have helped? To know that my poor brother had damned himself? We can only do it to ourselves, you know. And we make our own hell. But as long as he was capable of thought, not in physical pain, Severin, imprisoned in the ultimate solitary confinement, is that what you sentenced Vic to, Papa? Dennis, I did what my conscience directed, what my religious beliefs required. Philip, oh, Papa, if only you'd told us the truth. You were mistaken. No matter what kinds of crimes your brother had committed, you had no right to... Lucille, I concurred with your father's decision. It was a matter of hope. We are required to take charge of our lives, to make responsible choices. But we also face perplexities, times when there is no ready answer. 
Victor himself seemed to want to live, and we hoped for his eventual reformation. Your father did for his brother what he had a right to do. Severin. And now we all live with the result. Dennis. Yes. A long silence. Maurice. If somehow we could acquire, or design, a coercive redactive probe configuration that would give us the truth when it was used on a Remillard, Philip, the five of us, working in a concert, using purely human parameters, not the half-exotic techniques of the Krondaku and Symbiari, we could probe the suspect family members and establish guilt or innocence for Brett's death use the milieu's own mental evidence-gathering technique to support or contradict the inconclusive magistratum interrogation sessions. It would be legally admissible evidence. Dennis, I don't know. I just don't know. We're only beginning to understand the programming principles for precision human metaconcert. When I worked with you on Victor, I coordinated almost instinctively. I could try to design an infallible probe program, but I don't think I have sufficient skill. I doubt that any human does yet, not even Davy McGregor or Ilya Goris. It would be best to wait until our polity takes its concilium seats, then request informal help from the Krondok Ministry of Evaluation. They wrote the damned book on mind-dreaming. Philip. Yes, that seems the best course. Maurice. And the safest, as long as there's a chance that a member of our family is a deliberate or unconscious murderer, the five of us will have to guard our minds and act with the utmost caution. If our monster of iniquity feels threatened, it might kill again. We still don't have the remotest inkling of its motive. Severin. Once we're all in concilium orb, we'll surely be safe. No operant murderer would dare to try anything in a ceremonial beehive crawling with exotic grand masters and lyomic supervisors. We might even be able to resolve this thing before we return to Earth. If Papa will agree to work out a probe program with the Krondok Ministry of Evaluation while we're all there. Dennis. Your mother and I aren't magnate designates, and we certainly can't tag along with you ahead of time, pretending to be part of your staff. I'll come to Concilium Orb when the rest of the family guests, too. And meanwhile, I'll do my best to work up the skeletal probe configuration. I promise I won't try to play Sherlock Holmes or flush out bogey persons ahead of time if you won't. Philip plus Maurice plus Severin. We agree. Dennis. Then I think we'd better say good night. Parents and children embrace. Philip, Maurice, and Severin leave. Lucille and Dennis stand at the front window, watching the row craft loft into the sky. Small clouds speed before the moon. The rain is over. Lucille. It's none of them. I know it. Dennis. We can hope. Chapter 16 Sector 15 Star 15-000-001 Telonus Planet 1 Concilium Orb Galactic Year La Prime 1-387-497 28 September 2051 On the morning after their arrival at the world called Concilium Orb, Anne Ramillar and her nephew Mark went out for breakfast to La Closerie de Lilac an open-air restaurant across the square from the little Hotel Montparnasse, where they were staying until more permanent accommodations for the family could be arranged. The orbicular wedge within the great hollow planetoid built by the Lylemic already had over thirty different enclaves set apart for humanity, each one simulating a distinctive district on Earth. They featured appropriate landscaping, typical ethnic, commercial, cultural, and artistic amenities, and characteristic residential areas. Some enclaves bustled, and some were quiet. Some were tasteful, and some were gaudy. Some were urban, while others imitated the inhabited countryside and housed people in tiny villages. The enclaves were of differing sizes, separated from one another by carefully tended parklands and forests that underwent seasonal variation, by rockeries that looked much like mountains, by desert gardens, jungles, simulated tropical lagoons, waterways, and lakes. Overall stretched an illusory sky, which brightened and darkened in the twenty-five-hour cycle of the galactic day, showing the star patterns in the single moon of Earth at night and changing varieties of clouds during daytime. Rain fell when and where it was appropriate, 
and in the boreal forest separating Scandia and Baltica enclaves, and in the Alpenland, Yakutskaya and Himalaya enclaves, there was occasional snow. Most of the plant life was living and authentic. Most of the fauna, except for some domesticated species, was bionic. Everything was kept clean and tidy by automated mechanisms. The new human magnates of the concilium, their immediate families, and their operant assistants might live in whatever enclave they wished during the periods that the concilium was in session, and they could return to their home world or continue to reside in Orb while the galactic governing body was in recess. Although there were only one hundred human magnate designates now, it was expected that many more would be raised to the concilium in years to come, until humanity was represented proportionally as the exotic races were. The human enclaves would expand and multiply as the need arose. All of the magnate designates in the Ramiyar family, except Paul and Anne, had requested beach houses in Paliuli, a Hawaiian-style paradise that was fast becoming one of the largest and most popular enclaves in Orb. Paul had asked for a place in Golden Gate, the Lylemic evocation of sophisticated San Francisco, situated near Orb's central concourse and meeting chambers. Anne thought she might like a Parisian-style apartment in Rive Gauche, which was why she had chosen to stay in a hotel in that enclave. Mark thought Rive Gauche was too suffocatingly quaint and whimsical for words, and he found it inexplicable that the normally sensible Anne would even consider living in such a kitschy place. Although his aunt ordered only a café au lait and a couple of croissants for breakfast, Mark insisted that he was starving after more than three weeks of mediocre shipboard meals on the CSS Hassan Bashaw. With adolescent perversity, he turned up his nose at all of the elegant French items on the Closeries menu and scandalized the waitron by demanding corned beef hash, fried extra crisp, with poached eggs, a slice of fresh papaya with lime, banana walnut bread, and a pitcher of Mexican chocolate. Those are hardly the specialties at the house the prim, middle-aged waitron began. She was dressed like a nineteenth-century serveuse, in keeping with the decor of the establishment. "'But you can get them, can't you?' Mark's face wore the mocking, one-sided smile that had driven Anne to distraction during their long voyage from Earth. "'All the food in Orb comes from a central provisioning depot, and you can have any Earth edible imaginable sent to your kitchen within five minutes.' If I wanted to, I could order witchetty grubs, or sheep's eyeballs, or bison hump ribs, or poi. Mark, Anne said wearily. Well, couldn't I? the boy demanded. Yes, monsieur. The waitron, like all human service personnel in the huge artificial planet, was a non-operant, but she knew a rebellious brat when she saw one, and her attitude changed instantly, becoming sweetly patronizing. Of course we will be delighted to prepare what you have ordered, it is unsettling to be so far away from Earth, isn't it, poor little fellow? We must do our best to ease your homesickness. Would you like your witchetty grubs on toast? No, he growled. Just the other stuff. Very well. And she patted Mark on his head, winked at Anne, and swept away. Face flaming, the boy stared at the tablecloth. In the ever-blooming mutant lilac bush behind him, a robotic bird began to warble. Other human patrons of the outdoor restaurant filled the air with a hum of their verbal conversation. The ether, as everywhere within Orb, was pervaded with the most serene and benevolent vibes. Mark felt like puking. "'Don't you think it's about time you and I declared a truce?' Anne asked him. He raised his eyes. "'A truce?' "'You know very well why we wanted you off Earth.' "'Yes.' he snapped. At the embarkation, when Paul had abruptly handed Mark his carry-on bag and credentials, and the entire family had focused their coercion on him, the boy had offered no resistance at all. Helpless in the multiple grip of the Grand Master adults, he had simply looked his father in the eye and said, You may regret this. Then he had turned away and followed Anne onto the starship without another word. Now, she said, you're going to stay here in Orb at least until January, until after the inauguration. You can continue to brood and sulk like a silly child if you wish, but I had hoped you would accept the family's decision and be of some help to me while you're here. 
There's a great deal to be done in our offices before the others arrive in December. He stared at her, and she stared back at him, yielding not a mental micron, until he finally lowered his eyes. Like her younger sister, Catherine, Anne was tall and blonde, but where Cat was as impetuous and passionate as Lucille, Anne embodied the icy intellectualism of Dennis, and had always been her father's favorite. There had been sibling jokes about her springing fully armed from Dennis's brow rather than being born normally like her five brothers and her sister. Anne had taken the jests to heart while still a young girl, obtaining a small statue of Pallas Athena, which she made her mascot and still kept on her desk in Concord. Mark had asked her once what the goddess symbolized, and she had replied, the victorious mind. Mark was not particularly close to his uncles and aunts, but early on he had recognized a certain affinity between himself and this calm, efficient woman who had always spurned any kind of emotional involvement. For some reason it was to Aunt Anne, rather than his own parents or Uncle Roger, that he had turned as a nine-year-old boy puzzling over the mystery of human sex. She had explained it with brisk clarity, putting it into perspective for the nuisance it was to those who were dedicated to a higher life of the mind. Sex distracted you from important matters, she explained. It was only biochemistry, a mere animal drive. Nevertheless, it had the potential for devastating a person's reason, and so it was never to be trusted. Mark had not understood how this could possibly happen, but Aunt Anne had only laughed grimly and said, Wait. She told him that she had chosen not to marry or have children or seek any other kind of close relationship with another person because her work for the milieu and operant humanity must take precedence in her life over mere private gratification. At the time, Mark had thought her example noble and admirable and well worth emulating, but he had been very careful not to let her know how he felt. Anne had been the first Ramayar to be appointed by the exotic proctors to the North American Intendancy and to the Assembly of Intendant Associates, the human polity's quasi-independent legislature. She had also been the principal political mentor of her younger brother Paul from the very beginning, guiding and advising him in his swift ascent to Intendant Associate, encouraging him to aspire to the first magnate chair when the human polity was accepted into full voting membership in the Galactic Concilium. After Anne herself achieved the rank of intendant associate, she dared to speak of her own secret ambition to the rest of the family. She wanted to be no less than planetary dirigent, the chief operant executive of Earth, after the Symbiare proctorship ended. His aunt's dream had further overawed Mark, and he had continued to admire her uncritically, until this enforced trip from Earth to Orb. Furious at being shanghaied and fearful about what would happen to his mother and Roger, the boy had shut himself up inside his inviolable mental fortress, hardly speaking to Anne during the voyage and even distancing himself from her physically, insofar as that was possible on a rather small starship. There was plenty of time to think during his self-imposed isolation, and one of the things he brooded over was the murder of his uncle Brett McAllister. Using much the same logic as Dennis had, Mark deduced that Anne, together with her sister Cat and her brother Adrian, was a principal suspect. And so was his father. In his solitude, thinking about unnatural death and trying to suppress the very genuine fear that had taken root within him, Mark also puzzled over something that had mystified and disturbed him for nearly eleven years, the passing of Victor Ramillard. His recollection of the events on that Good Friday in 2040 had the vivid accuracy of perfect memo recall. As a precocious toddler, he had been curious about the family ritual he had been excluded from, and so he had extended his ultra senses into the adjacent bedroom and experienced the deathbed scene almost as fully as the adult witnesses had. What young Mark had seen and felt had been quite incomprehensible to a baby's understanding, even now it defied complete analysis. But things were becoming clearer to him as he grew more closely acquainted with the shadowy aspects of his own mind and the minds of other superior metas. However, there was still no answer to the principal question, 
Could a dying mentality, energized by evil ambition, find sanctuary in the mind and body of another? Everything Mark knew of psychology and theology denied that such a thing was possible. But something had happened at Victor's deathbed, and whatever the dying man had done was done with a conscious or unconscious assent of the mind, or minds, invaded. The notion that Victor, or some agent of his, must be involved in Brett's strange death, had come upon Mark in a synchronicitous flash, having nothing to do with logic, and all the more distressing because of that. Aunt Anne was looking at him now with those pale, cold eyes of hers that also held a surprising intimation of foreboding. Will you work with me, Mark? His gaze slid away. As subtly as he could, he projected grudging resignation, a slight cracking of the mental shell that she had perceived as completely indomitable. He projected adolescent uncertainty and a desperate need to trust in some reliable adult. He projected the merest hint of his old admiration for her. I'll, I'll do my best, Aunt Anne. She reached out one hand and touched his own, smiling a little. Good. And I'll try to help you too, Mark. Then the food arrived, and the French waitron was very maternal and jolly when Mark apologized for insulting the restaurant's cuisine. He confided wryly to her that he was only a Franco-American and a poor excuse for a gourmet, but he hoped to visit all of the ethnic enclaves of humanity while he was an orb and educate his taste buds. She laughed pleasantly. And you must try exotic food, too, except for the Krondok kind, of course, which contains too many petrochemicals and unhealthy alkaloids. The cuisine of the ghee is really delightful, like feasting upon the most subtly perfumed desserts and salads, while poltroyans do wonders with seafood and strange meat dishes, and the symbiare devise the most delicious candies imaginable. The green ones are only partially photosynthetic, you know, and do amazing things with sugars. Then there are the lyalmic. Just think, you may actually meet one of the rare beings here. Those who have done so say the experience is unforgettable. One realizes that they do not eat. Some say they subsist upon the music of the spheres. But I suspect that is nonsense. Mark said, I'm looking forward to my stay here very much. I've heard that visiting the exotic enclaves of Concilium Ward is like taking a quick tour of the inhabited galaxy. I'll be the envy of my college classmates when I get back to Earth. Everybody's heard the fabulous stories about Orb and wants to come here, but, of course, it's off-limits to tourists, even operant ones. How long do service personnel contract for? Anne asked the woman curiously. The server sighed. Only three hundred days for most jobs. I hope they change that eventually. I would love to re-up when this tour is finished, even though my husband can hardly wait to get back to Paris. But life is so much more exciting here, especially now that humanity will be taking its place in the concilium. She lowered her voice. And salaries and all are triple those of the human polity worlds. And of course we normals have the same shopping privileges that operant bureaucrats do. We can also use the same artistic and cultural and recreational facilities as the magnates and their operant assistants, if we want to. Do you want to? Mark asked. The woman eyed him shrewdly. Not always, no. And we are very glad to be able to live in our own non-operant neighborhoods within the ethnic enclaves. One is always most comfortable amongst one's own kind, n'est-ce pas? Mark said, Mais naturellement, madame, vous m'en direz pas. She uttered a happy cry. You do know French after all, young Franco-American. Eh, hey, papa? Only a little... My great-granduncle taught me. And is he here with you? The smiling woman inquired. No. Mark looked away, his face now expressionless. The waitron took her big tray under her arm and began to move away from their table. Eh bien, bon appétit, and have a nice day. For many minutes, Mark and Anne ate in silence. When she had finished the second of her croissants, she said, if there was a very good reason for it, you could call your grandfather on the subspace communicator and arrange for a head on intimate mode. 
His far speech would have no difficulty reaching the four thousand light years from here to Earth. Why would I want to talk to Grandpa? Mark finished the last of the hot chocolate and licked the foam from his lips. It had been served in an incongruous large cup of thin china, but it was whisked perfectly with honey and vanilla and a hint of cinnamon. I know you're not that close to Dennis, but if there was any serious family business you had to discuss with someone on earth, any matters you had to arrange, he would be the one to call on. I'll keep it in mind. Mark pushed the empty cup away and laid his knife and fork parallel across his plate. Will we have to begin work right away? Anne smiled. Not really, although I do want to drop in at our offices today. What did you have in mind? Sightseeing? I'd like to check the place out, just prowl around. Twenty-three days in the gray limbo didn't do my nerves any good. I can certainly vouch for that, Anne consulted her wrist calm. We've been invited to dinner tonight at 19.30 hours by Kyle MacDonald and his wife Mary Gorris, over in Lomond Enclave. You remember them, don't you? Mark nodded. He's the science fiction writer. She's the European IA. Uncle Roger told me that he introduced them. I tried some of MacDonald's plaques, but the stuff was pretty wild and implausible. I hope you'll keep your literary criticism to yourself at dinner. Now, if I let you run loose today, will you promise to work on the Polyuli housing tomorrow? It's going to be very difficult to get anything decent on the beach. I've heard the Russians have tried to hog all the best places. Mark's gray eyes were light. Just let me have some time to myself today, and tomorrow you can ask me anything. Anne laughed. Off with you, then. Just don't get into anything you can't get out of. He flung his napkin onto the table and almost upset the wrought iron chairs. He sprang to his feet and hurried off across the terrace. There was a tube entrance a hundred meters away from the restaurant, next to the boulangerie, and he forced himself to slow down and walk to it, turning once to wave over his shoulder to Anne, who was drinking another cup of coffee and watching him with an expression that betrayed considerable anxiety. Then he plunged down the steps into a glowing, glassy gut that was a shocking departure from the folksy charm of the French enclave. He caught an inertialist capsule almost immediately and headed for the outermost level of the colossal ceramental planetoid and the orb spaceport. For over four hours, Mark sat quietly on a bench in the human terminal, letting his farsight and other ultrasenses roam absorbing all of the formalities of departure to be certain that he would make no mistakes. He studied the ticketing procedure, the quarantine setup, the rather casual way the smaller private superluminal craft were boarded, even the way the exotic ground crews serviced the ships of the human polity in the docking bays. This time he was ready to break whatever laws it took to get him back to Earth. But how to do it? He could easily coerce his way on board a big passenger ship and brain-wipe the coercees, provided none of them was master class. But when he disappeared, Anne would be bound to send out a subspace squawk on him, so that was out. He could use his creativity to disguise himself or go invisible, then stow away. But she'd still have the magistrate on waiting Earthside to check out arriving ships from Orb, and a Grand Master exotic cop would see through any attempted mental camouflage of his like a plate glass window. Okay, what was left? Use his coercion to hijack a very small ship, one of those executive hoppers with a crew of three. There was a Caledonian jobby over in Bay 638 that checked out as a likely prospect. Disable its communications and beacons. Mind fuck the crew just short of imbecility once they put the ship on course, popping in and out of hyperspace. Sleep only while the ship was traveling its catenary in the gray limbo. And none of your bunny-hopping 180DF this trip. Push the displacement factor to 250 or even higher. He'd have no trouble taking the pain of tight leash translations through the Upsilon field. If the crew wonked out from overload, they'd be that much easier to handle. With luck, he could get home in two weeks, long before they'd expect him. He'd load up with food and get gone to B.C., and hide out with Mama and Uncle Roger until it was safe to resurface. If he pulled the trick off artfully, the family would probably even continue to cover up for him. Buying off the owner of the hijacked exec hopper and the crew would cost a bundle, but that was no big deal for the family corporation. 
provided he didn't kill anybody. He got up from the bench and bought himself a large Pepsi-Cola at a refreshment bar. Then, sipping it through a straw, he strolled casually to the feeder tunnel that would take him to Bay 638. The small craft facilities were much less crowded than the main terminal area, and the non-crew people hurrying along the tunnel tended to be earnest-looking business types in sober suits, carrying briefcases, or rumpled scientists meandering along, thinking great thoughts on declamatory mode. There were no young people about and several passers-by eyed him curiously as he stopped at the observation window overlooking Bay 638 and stood there drinking his Pepsi. The display beside the access door told him that the ship was CSS Roderick Du, a 12-passenger to Haviland S211 out of Grampian Town, Caledonia, owned by Guinness PLC. Its EDT was about one hour from now. Perfect and the spacecraft was even a lineal descendant of the antique beaver float plane that had carried him, his mother, and Uncle Roger into the Megapod Reserve. Seems almost like fate, doesn't it? An adult voice remarked. Mark whirled about his heart pounding. He had been aware of no one approaching him, sensed no aura, but he had company. Standing close behind him was a very tall elderly man with a neatly trimmed white beard and a patriarchal halo of snowy hair. He wore floor-length blue garments in a style that Mark could not immediately identify as typical of any ethnic group. His eyes had a preternatural brightness, set deep within dark sockets. Mark suspected immediately that he was not human. The mental signature was totally absent, even to a third-level probe delivered at point-blank range. But what kind of exotic was he? The Krondaku were known to assume illusory bodies sometimes, especially when they undertook sociological research or other work among humanity that depended upon an unobtrusive or non-threatening presence. A Krondak Grand Master would be able to suppress his aura beyond the reach of any human-generated redactive probe, and the Magistratum had a disproportionate number of the frightful, supremely intelligent beings on its roster. The cup of Pepsi trembled in Mark's hand as he turned, his mental screen strengthened to the maximum. Excuse me? What did you say? I said nothing special. I implied a great deal. Mark grinned and shrugged. Sorry, I don't understand. I was just looking this ship over. Wondering whether the crew would use this access door or the one down in the bay to board her. The answer to that is neither. They've just been notified that they can't return to Caledonia today, after all. A small problem with the environmental system. But you needn't start looking for another ship. Oh, said Mark. Oh, Jesus, the exotics were on to him. He had been so sure that his secret thoughts were beyond their reach, so sure that he'd pulled the wool over their eyes during the interrogation. But they'd only bided their time. Some giant brain had been reading his mind, probably from the moment he arrived in orb and knew all about your scheme to pinch the ship. Oh, yes. It would probably have worked, too, if you were able to control the coercive redactive ream precisely enough to avoid permanent mental damage to the crew. I'm not sure you're up to that yet. But the point is moot. There's no need for you to go back to Earth. The two of them will survive without your help. Who will? he whispered. But he knew. Off we go, said the disguised exotic briskly. Don't waste time. A heroic form of meta-coercivity took hold of Mark. He had never experienced anything like it. He wasn't a child hurried along by a stronger adult. He was a mosquito borne along by a gale. As he walked helplessly alongside his captor, heading back toward the main terminal, Mark managed to look more carefully at the face of the person beside him. To... Do I know you? The tall man laughed, but did not answer the question. What do you want? Mark asked. I want you to take a hike, kiddo. Get the hell out of this terminal and don't come back until you're ready to go home. Am I under arrest? No. Providing you haul your young ass out of here and don't try pulling a stunt like this again. You do, and I'll see that you come down with a galloping shits and spend the time from now until Inauguration Day in the hospital. The pediatric hospital. You like it. The bed gowns have Walt Disney characters printed on them. Mark was dumbfounded. This was a Krondaku? 
He sure as hell didn't talk like one. But whoever this guy was, he was no enforcer of the magistratum. He was somebody else, playing games. Somebody who obviously knew all about Mama and Uncle Roger. Mark felt the anger that had blazed within him drain away. A sudden awful suspicion gripped his heart. Are you him? Vic— I have nothing to do with Victor Remillard or his creatures, the being said. But you are quite right to keep the possibility in mind. They pose a rather serious threat to the good order of the galactic milieu. They're damn near as dangerous as you. The two of them had entered the busy terminal. Mark's mind spun as he was compelled to walk directly to the tube entrance. His mind began to shout, Who are you? Who are you? Who are you? He was aware that the telepathic scream went no further than the boundary of his own skull. Side by side, the disoriented boy and the tall man stood waiting for a transport capsule. In one last futile attempt to break the coercion, Mark had managed to drop his nearly empty cup of cola, scattering bits of crushed ice all over the capsule platform. "'You'll find out who I am eventually,' his captor said. "'Just remember what I told you. I wasn't joking about incapacitating you if you make trouble. Here's your capsule. It's been very interesting talking to you face to face, but now get lost.' A big hand took hold of Mark's shoulder with a painfully strong grip and thrust him unceremoniously into the open hatch. I'm sending you to Carioca Enclave. Colorful as all get out, but don't lose track of time and turn up late for dinner, or your Aunt Anne will be more than a little pissed. Au revoir, kiddo. The hatch slammed and the capsule shot into the glowing purple row field of the tubeway, whisking Mark away at 6,000 kph. Unifex's smile faded, and he shook his head. Then, with a gesture, he cleaned up the ice and the rest of the mess and went back into the terminal. He had decided to have a Pepsi himself before he dematerialized. Chapter 17 From the Memoirs of Rogatien Remillard I said nothing to Teresa about the telepathic bolt from the blue, that furious, far-spoken blast on my intimate mode that Dennis had broadcast over the entire planet Earth and God knew how many parsecs of interstellar space, calling my name. The thing hit me with the impact of a punch in the stomach, and I had responded with an involuntary mental grunt. But I clammed up immediately thereafter, and I was certain that Dennis hadn't been able to fix my position. Yet. Many times during the following weeks at Ape Lake I lay half awake, momentarily expecting my mind's ear to hear the precisely directed mind speech of my foster son, telling me that his seeker sense had found our hideout at last. But it didn't come, and I finally convinced myself that Dennis wouldn't find us, and neither would anybody else, not until young Jack was born, and the Ramayar dynasty was safely inaugurated into the concilium, and Teresa and I were safe from the clutches of the law, and we all lived happily ever after. It took two months for us to finish repairing our rustic home and get it ready for winter. The tree felling and carpentry were made almost pleasurable by that miracle machine, the wood zapper, which I thanked God and Matsushita Industries for almost daily as I worked on the cabin and its furniture. When I was a youth I had used a device called a chainsaw, which was a wonderful improvement over chopping or sawing wood by hand. But even small chainsaws were awkward and dangerous to use were fueled by petrochemicals, and needed frequent sharpening. In contrast, the wood zapper was a lightweight wonder. In place of the chainsaw's oval guide bar, it had a business end that looked something like the capital D frame of a large hacksaw, but without the blade. When you switched the thing on, a thin bar of coherent golden light closed the gap. This photonic beam, so the instructions assured me, would slice through the most dense varieties of wood like tofu. And it did, too, exploding the cells of green wood with a great blast of steam and yielding a smooth, raw surface that seemed almost to have been sanded. Dry wood had a residual thin layer of charring after being zapped, but I used hardly any of that in my construction. Notching logs was a breeze with that sweet little wood zapper, and one of the most tedious parts of log cabin making, cutting boards, was almost like slicing bread. You could debark a log with a zapper as quick as peeling a carrot, and cut and split billets of firewood as fast as you could wave your arm. 
The only thing you had to remember was to wear the protective face shield and gloves and keep your bare skin out of range of the cloud of hot sawdust. The device was powered by one of the ubiquitous small D-type fusion cells that had been part of the milieu's answer to Earth's energy hunger, and it was guaranteed to operate for some two hundred hours before needing a fuel refill. I loved that wood zapper dearly, and it worked like a charm up until the fateful day of 19 October, when I forgot to press the standby button after knocking off work. The overnight temperature outside on the porch where I had left the zapper fell well below freezing, turning the dewater inside the machine's integral fusion unit to ice, and ruining it. Fortunately, the construction work was nearly finished by then, but from that time on I had to split firewood with an axe. The flights of migratory birds began early in October, and often at night we would hear them calling as they winged southward, especially when the moon was bright. The geese and tundra swans hooted and blatted and honked as they flew, but the trumpeter swans made glorious music like an airborne squadron of French horn players, and sent Teresa into raptures. She managed to reproduce their calls with her electronic keyboard, and composed a swan sonata that sounded rather good to me although she deprecated it as too derivative of Sibelius and Rachmaninoff. On 21 October the first feathery flakes of snow fell, whitening the heights of Mount Mutt and Mount Jeff across the slowly freezing lake, but accumulating less than a couple of centimeters around our cabin. The sun came out immediately afterward, creating a sparkling wonderland until most of the snow melted, but I was in no mood to join Teresa in her celebration of the beauty of it all. The first appearance of the white stuff only served to remind me that I had forgotten to bring snowshoes, and without them we would be unable to move away from the cabin when the really heavy snow arrived. I made two stout wooden snow shovels at once, then consulted the reference flex for a suitable snowshoe pattern. The ones I had used back home in New England had been of the classic main pattern, wide and quite large, with long tails, having ash wood frames and rawhide webbing. Decamol would not be invented for another fifty years. The main shoes were devils to use in brushy or steep terrain, which Ape Lake had plenty of, and I decided to make the more compact, rounded style called Bear Paws instead. The only flexible hardwood available for the frames was a kind of shrubby willow. I feared that the thicker sticks would break under my weight once the wood dried, and so I lashed together four much narrower widths with wire to give the outer framing and cross pieces the extra strength of lamination, then webbed them with stout cord. This webbing would be much less efficient than rawhide, which was nearly indestructible and did not stretch. But so far we had seen neither moose nor caribou in the region, and only the hides of these large animals would have been strong enough to make suitable babiche thongs. I expected to have to use the improvised shoes only in the immediate vicinity of the cabin, digging us out after storms and doing chores. It never occurred to me that those crudely made snowshoes would one day make the difference between our living or starving to death. In the early weeks, when it seemed that we had all the food in the world, the only animals Teresa considered fair game were the snowshoe hares. These creatures, which were brown-furred when we arrived at Ape Lake, and became pure white except for black-tipped ears as the season advanced, were at first very numerous on the lightly wooded slopes above the cabin, and easily taken in wire snares. Theresa not only caught and cooked the hares, she also skinned them to a special purpose. After I completed the new floor for our home, Theresa had made floor mats from part of the ten meters of wide wool duffel cloth we had bought. A couple more meters of the stuff were earmarked for childbirth supplies, and there was enough left to make a single narrow mattress pad for each bed but she fretted that we might not be warm enough, even with our sleeping bags and the down comforter and the pads, when the temperature dropped far below zero. Then she happened to read in one of the woodcraft references how the Indians had made robes by weaving strips of rabbit skin. She decided to make fur blankets in the same way, and set about immediately snaring the unfortunate snowshoe hares without mercy, extending her trap line in all directions. Her scheme eventually yielded two sizable blankets, fragile but luxuriant, and a small fur robe to wrap the baby in. 
From September until late October, we dined on sautéed hare, roast hare, hare cutlets, civet of hare, hare pie, southern fried hare, blanquette of hare, ragout of hare, hare ravioli, fricassee of hare, hossenpfeffer, pasta with hare sauce, and hare soup with bannock croutons. Finally, a diminishing bunny population and the increasing awkwardness of her pregnancy brought her trapping career to an end. To this day, the mere mention of any dish containing rabbit turns my complexion green. In its finished state, our cabin on Ape Lake was about 4.5 meters square. Teresa had rechinked the old log walls tightly with moss and mud. The new roof was constructed on a framework of log beams which I had hoisted into place with the come-along, suspended from a three-legged tripod. I nailed close-set poles onto the beams, overlaid them with plash sheeting for waterproofing, then nailed down a second layer of stringers and poles chinked with moss. Teresa and I capped the whole lash up with the old shingles, plus some new ones I had made. I was bound and determined that this roof would not collapse, no matter how heavy the snowpack. The roof overhung a small porch that ran along the eastward-facing side of the cabin. I cut more poles and enclosed most of the porch with a windbreak so that snow would not blow in each time we opened the door. Here is a diagram of the interior of the birthplace of St. Jack the Bodiless. Reader's Note The diagram will not be described. End of note. Both bunks were wooden frames with rope-webbing springs, the longer one being mine. They stood high above the floor for the sake of warmth, and we stowed items underneath them and on shelves built above. Teresa had patiently scraped most of the rust off the cast-iron stove with grit, and we stood it upon a shallow bed of small stones covered with glacial silt cement. Fortunately, the stovepipe sections were sound, as were the damper and roof plate. Being familiar with the dire effects of carbon monoxide in small shelters, a second cousin had perished that way in an ice-fishing shack on Lake Winnipesaukee, I sealed the pipe joints carefully with pyron duct tape. We discarded the earlier crudely made furniture, and I managed to make some rather nifty new pieces with a wood zapper before its untimely demise. It could be manipulated with considerable delicacy once you had a bit of practice. A large table and a smaller kitchen work table were fastened to the walls and had shelves above them. Most of Teresa's musical things were stored beneath the large table, as was the sophisticated little hydrogen-fueled fusion power supply, incompatible with the wood zapper, alas, that operated her equipment, the stereo unit, the Tri-D, our two lamps, and the microwave. I crafted two uneasy chairs, which Teresa fitted with moss-packed pads on the seat arms and back. A stool near the beds also served as a nightstand. I built a slew of Wanigan storage boxes. We had brought in all our food from the cache. More shelves, a washstand, a wood box, and a cradle, which was nothing but another box on tall legs. Our bathroom was the small area adjacent to the front door, where I hung the old porter shower pouch from my camping equipment. Theresa curtained it with cotton flannelette from the bolt we had brought. The single window facing the lake had a movable shutter hinged at the top that we sometimes lowered over the glass at night and when the wind blew strongly from the north. I was very proud of the shutter hinges, which I had to whittle with a jackknife. We had found serviceable iron hinges and a latch for the front door buried beneath the derelict cabin floor. Our cabin acquired a family of wood mice as soon as we brought food inside. The wretched little creatures lived under the new floorboards and became terrible pests, attacking our food supplies and even shredding one of my wool socks to make a nest, until a beautiful little ermine, snow-white with a black tail-tip and black eyes, showed up and made short work of them. The ermine was ridiculously tame and eventually came to treat our cabin as his private stamping grounds. I was surprised at his friendliness, for I thought all creatures of the weasel family were vicious. Teresa called him Herman and gave him bits of spam as a reward for exterminating the mice, and when she played her keyboard and sang softly to unborn Jack late in the evening, the little beast would lurk behind the wood-box, listening, with its beady eyes a-glitter. The cabin was complete by 23 October. I had mounted the snowshoes, the axes, the saw, and the rifle on the wall outside, which gave the place a fine coureur de bois air, and above the door on a peg I stuck up a bear skull I had found for a totem. 
We looked forward to showing the cabin off to Mark when he arrived with the additional supplies of food. Ape Lake was beginning to freeze over already, but I assured Teresa that the antique beaver aeroplane would be able to land and take off just as easily on skis as it had on floats. That final week in October was our first opportunity to really relax. Now that there were no more construction noises, the place resumed its mantle of profound peacefulness during the day as well as at night. We had a brief Indian summer, when it was warm enough for us to potter about in our shirt-sleeves, blissfully free of the insects who had died with the first hard frost, along with the wood zapper. On the twenty-ninth we undertook one of Teresa's favorite hikes, moving westward along the southern lake shore as far as the lateral moraine of Ape Glacier, where a brawling torrent dropped steeply down Mount Jacobson. The moraine stream had shrunk since the last time we had seen it, two weeks earlier. The glacier that fed it was congealing with winter cold, and soon our own little Megapod Creek and all the other cascades rushing into the basin would dwindle away, and we would have to take our water from the lake. On our Indian summer walk we saw only the friendly whiskey jack birds, some spruce grouse, and the trail of a small wolf in some unmelted snow beneath the gnarled trees. We always kept a sharp eye out for the elusive big feet, but we had found no footprints other than the single one I had seen. The only other trace of the primates had been a faint, rank stench occasionally borne toward us from the foot of the lake on the rare easterly breezes. I remembered Arom de Sasquatch from my previous encounter with the creatures, and had alerted Teresa to its significance. But no big feet had ever appeared. When I awoke on the morning of 30 October, our cabin was very cold. The bucket of water on the unlit stove was skimmed with ice, and I cursed under my breath as I made up the morning fire with stiffened fingers. Outside, clouds of deep gray hung low, and snow was sifting down thickly through the dead calm air. These flakes were unlike the tentative feathery ones that had fallen earlier. They were small, and one had the impression that they intended to keep on falling for a good long time. There was already about fifteen centimeters worth on the ground outside, and I could see that the lake was frozen at last from shore to shore, a level expanse of purest white. I let Teresa sleep on. When the fire was going well, I bundled up and slipped outside. The snow shovels were ready on the porch, and it was an easy matter to clear paths to Le Pavillon and the latrine. I brought quantities of split, dry, and green wood to the porch. One required the first for proper cooking, and the second for maintaining heat. Then took the smaller axe and an empty bucket with a rope on it from the porch and went down the path to the shore. The ice round about the little rock jetty I had built was only a couple of centimeters thick. I broke it easily and scooped up a pailful of milky water. Now that the silt-laden streams had ceased to flow, the lake water would begin to clear. I stood looking out over the lake for some time. There was no sound except the gentle hiss of falling snow. I could smell wood smoke and frosty air. I was well dressed for winter in a down parka, heavy polypro pants, and felt-lined pack boots. Up the slope behind me, the comfortably furnished little cabin was slowly warming, and in a few minutes I could go up and make a breakfast of scrambled powdered eggs and fried bacon and coffee, and share it with Teresa. Her fay mannerisms and innocent carelessness no longer troubled me. Keeping her out of trouble and advising her in the ways of the wilderness made me think of the time more than eighty years before, when I had been the best friend and met a psychic mentor of baby Dennis. He had depended upon me in order to survive, and so did Teresa now. Having been a loner for so long, I had forgotten what a great satisfaction it was to be needed by another human being. Two, actually. After breakfast, Teresa would do the dishes and get the sourdough bread ready to rise. She might put beans on the back of the stove in the Dutch oven, where they would cook all day. If I felt like it, I could watch an old movie on the Tri-D, or read a plaque book, or wash my socks. Teresa might practice sonnetly on her keyboard, using the earphones, or sew baby clothes. Then we might play poker, using dry beans for chips and the greasy old deck of miniature cards that I always kept stowed in my Kelty pack's lower right pocket. Or she might work on one of her musical compositions, while I brought my plaque journal up to date. I'd neglected it, working twelve or fourteen hours a day, getting the cabin finished. Time had raced by. 
Next week would mark the halfway point in our sojourn at Ape Lake. Teresa was healthy and happy, full of a naive certainty that Jack's birth would rekindle Paul's love. The prodigious fetus was seven months alive, apparently thriving and learning about the world through ultra-senses and through his mother's borrowed faculties, in the mysterious way unborn operant babies do. And I was surprised to realize that I was enjoying life immensely. I was fit and strong again, feeling like a forty-year-old, and of the six bottles of 151-proof rum I had bought in Williams Lake, five and a half remained. When he showed up in the beaver with the rest of our food, Mark was going to be mighty proud of his old Uncle Roger. Chapter 18 Hanover, New Hampshire Earth, 31 October, 2051 The great enemy had unexpectedly accepted an invitation to speak at a symposium on milieu politics at Dartmouth College, and there was to be an informal dinner party for him and two other distinguished symposium speakers at the President's house on that same evening, on Halloween. It was too good an opportunity for Fury to miss. Who would pay any attention if the Hydra prowled the landscaped grounds around the college president's mansion on this festive New England night of nights? All of Greek Row was throwing impromptu bashes, Half the undergraduates were roaming around the campus in costume, as were the town youngsters, most especially the operants, playing trick-or-treat and having no scruples at all about ringing the president's doorbell and the bells of the frat sore houses. There was a certain risk bringing Hydra into the open, but it just might be possible to put Davy McGregor out of the game now, right here on earth, rather than waiting until the magnate designates were assembled on Concilium Orb. Fury had decided to risk it. The night was crisply chilly and clear, and it was nearly twenty-one thirty hours before the Hydra arrived. It flitted across the moonlit lawn toward the President's house, with Fury watching from above. The windows of the stately Georgian-style dwelling were all ablaze, and the front door was flanked with sheaves of cornstalks and a collection of glowing jack-o'-lanterns. There were three ground cars parked along the drive, together with a small row craft having both polity capital and Lothian registration. McGregor lived in Edinburgh, when he wasn't on deck down in Concord at Europa Tower. So you're finally here. It took you long enough. Fury, dearest almighty Fury, don't be mad. I'm sorry. I came as fast as I could put myself together. Never mind. You feeling in top shape? Oh, yes, yes, yes. I may be able to let you do it tonight, sweet little Hydra. Do it. You mean really do it again? If conditions are favorable, only then. I'll have to decide, and you will have to obey. Yes, yes, yes. But please, let me, please, please, please. It was so wonderful, it made me grow. Silence. Absolute mental silence from now on. Everyone at this dinner party except the President and his wife are powerful operants. If you're detected, if anyone gets the least notion who you are and what you're up to, you're to zorch on out of here, screened so tightly you're bug-fucking invisible. Do you understand? Assent. Study the metapsychic armamentaria of both McGregor and his wife, Margaret Strayhorn, while they're finishing their meal. Then come to the front of the house and wait in the shrubbery near the library windows until I give the word. Assent. Three little children in costume came romping up the drive, giggling and squealing. They were non-operant, and had no idea that the Hydra was watching them from the shelter of the bushes. The children rang the bell, and one of the President's adolescent daughters opened the door. The youngsters yelled, "'Trick or treat!' The President's daughter dispensed candy bars, which the kids tucked into their loot bags. Then they dashed away to try the Sigma Nu Delta House. Thoughtfully, Fury followed them for a few minutes with its farsight, mulling over the startling new idea that had occurred to it that afternoon. Davy McGregor was going to be a far more formidable opponent than Brett McAllister had been. Fury's own cautious appraisal during the political symposium had confirmed certain suspicions. Over the past year, and especially since his second marriage nine months earlier, the great enemy had changed and had probably become too strong for the still inexpert Hydra to damage significantly, much less kill. Davy McGregor had been transformed from a morose and aging widower of sixty-five into a rejuvenated operant stalwart. 
He had gone into the Regen tank before Margaret Strayhorn had finally agreed to marry him, and now he once again looked like what he had been in his youth, the champion caber-thrower at the annual Caledonian Games, tall and dark-haired, with snapping black eyes and a snow-ploughed jaw decorated at the sides with archaic dundreary whiskers. Davy was also deeply in love with this new wife of his, and romantic passion, as so often seemed to happen among humans, had augmented his already powerful creative metafunction. But there were other ways for Fury to deal with a great enemy, besides the obvious one. The new wife herself presented one attractive option. Socorro Ortega was very good at her job, which was officially listed in the employment roster of Dartmouth as First Lady to the President of the College. She was compensated with a salary equivalent to that of a full professor, and worked a good deal harder than most academics did, serving as the official hostess and unofficial mother confessor of the institution, as well as being the president's wife and the co-parent of their children. More often than she liked, she was also called upon to defuse potentially disastrous social situations, among which this Halloween dinner for the operants certainly qualified. Ordinarily, the First Lady had no qualms about entertaining the human metapsychic elite, though some highly educated normals did have. Why, nearly a tenth of the Dartmouth faculty were operants, and most of them were sedulously agreeable people who would never dream of condescending to non-operants. But human metas nonetheless possessed the same frailties as the rest of the race, and therein lurked the challenge that Socorro Ortega had faced, and bested, tonight. Her husband, President Tom Spotted Owl, had once been a student of Davy McGregor's in Edinburgh, before the Scotsman, who was the only son of the famous Jamie McGregor and a celebrity in his own right, had given up the teaching of xenopsychology to serve in the European Intendancy. When an important speaker at the symposium on milieu politics had fallen ill the day before the event, Tom had prevailed upon his old mentor to egg up from Concord and fill in, and so both of the principal candidates for first magnate of the human polity, David Summerled McGregor and Paul Nemiar, lectured on their personal political philosophies on the same day. The result had been a public relations triumph for the college, heavily covered by the media. The next afternoon, which was Halloween, a mated pair of distinguished psychopoliticians of the amalgam of Poltroy had joined the two human magnate designates on a brilliant and often contentious panel that was bound to keep the dovecote of political science aflutter for months to come. It was Tom who had decided at the last minute that Davy and his wife Margaret must also attend a little informal dinner at the President's house that was being given for the two Poltroyans, who were newly installed visiting fellows of the college. The First Lady had agreed, but without thinking through the more subtle repercussions, she had decided that Paul Remillard should be invited too. Paul was not an old friend of Tom and Socorro's, as was Davy McGregor. Neither she nor her husband was particularly fond of the dashing intendant associate, whose media popularity and fierce loyalty to the galactic milieu were somewhat at odds with his reputation for sexual adventurism. But the college could not afford to snub Paul, either. He was one of Dartmouth's most famous alumni, and he would expect to be invited to the dinner, if McGregor was. And so the invitations to McGregor and his wife were conveyed by the First Lady personally to Seuss Auditorium, where the symposium was being held, and were accepted. But when Socorro went in search of Paul, she happened upon the two Poltroyans in the participants' lounge, and blithely mentioned the expanded guest list for dinner. To her dismay she met with distressed hemming and hawing, and finally a sudden indisposition on the part of a female exotic that precluded their attending the dinner after all. The President's wife was no mind-reader, but she was an experienced diplomat. She quickly ascertained, through a sympathetic third party, what the problem was. Paul Remillard's inseparable female companion all throughout the symposium had been none other than that puta callejera Laura Tremblay, the wife of Paul's perennially cuckolded colleague, intendant associate Rory Muldowney. It was common knowledge that Paul and Laura had been intimately involved for more than a year. The two Poltroyan academics, especially the female, who was a keen devotee of human opera, 
had been scandalized by what they considered to be Paul's insensitive behavior following so closely upon Teresa Kendall's tragic death. It was instantly obvious to Socorro why the exotics had abruptly declined to attend the dinner she had planned in their honor. They were afraid Paul would bring along the lovely round-heeled Laura. And he would, too, if Socorro did not find a way to outwit him. Caracoles! Was Dartmouth Cottage to insult the kindly and anthropophilic Poltroians merely for the sake of Paul Remillard's insatiable cojones? Then a brilliant thought struck Socorro. Instead of a dinner for eight, the Dartmouth President and First Lady would host a dinner for ten. Socorro quickly phoned Lucille Cartier, begged for her help in the emergency, and obtained it. Later, when the First Lady finally managed to corner Paul alone and give him his invitation, she mentioned that she had also invited his parents, and wondered, demurely, if he would like to bring his godmother, Dartmouth's Emeritus Professor of Human Genetics, Colette Roy, as his dinner companion. Socorro and Tom were so fond of Colette, and they had not seen her in quite some time. After an instant's hesitation, the outmaneuvered Paul had agreed, whereupon the First Lady had recontacted the Poltroians, begging them to reconsider, mentioning casually that Paul would be squiring the venerable Professor Roy. The exotic couple reaccepted with alacrity, and Socorro was finally able to tell Tom that all was in order. From the beginning, the dinner party had every indication of being a notable success. Paul and his rival for the office of first magnate put aside the political differences that had provoked fireworks at the symposium, and confined their audible conversation, at least, to innocuous chit-chat. Dennis Remillar was happily renewing his old friendship with Davy McGregor and charming the socks off Margaret Strayhorn. The diminutive, mauve-skinned Poltroians, looking almost like bald-headed earth children costumed for Halloween in their bejeweled exotic robes, turned out to be hilarious raconteurs of exotic political shenanigans. And Lucille, whose faculty parties had been legendary when Tom Spotted Owl was no more than a lowly assistant professor of political science at Dartmouth, and Socorro, a doe-eyed undergraduate from Campeche, had been lavish in her praise of Socorro's recent redecoration of the President's house. It was, the First Lady thought happily, going to be a night to remember. In the plant room, where the dinner was in progress, Tom and Socorro and their eight guests were seated on white iron chairs around a large round glass-topped table. Brightly colored chrysanthemums and asters growing in black Oaxaca pots were combined with great stoneware vases of flaming maple leaves to make a display around the diners that almost, in Lucille Cartier's opinion, crossed the bounds of good taste. Or am I just being bourgeois? Lucille thought. Or could it be a touch of indigestion? The fish had been so terribly spicy. But everyone except for her seemed to be enjoying the dinner tremendously. The panel with Davy and Paul and the Poltroians this afternoon had evidently been a smashing success, and there wasn't the least hint of enmity between the two men tonight. Why, then, did she have this feeling that something awful was about to happen? The First Lady had arranged a meal in a pre-conquest Meso-American mode. The exotic couple, Fratisso Prontanalan and Minatippa Pinacrodin, called us Fred and Minnie, and the visitors from Scotland had gone into raptures over the fish in Anato pepper sauce, the mole de poblano, the tortillas, rice, frijoles, and the accompanying guacamole sauce. Dennis and Paul made positive pigs of themselves, especially over the Mayan-style fish, which Socorro had prepared herself from an old family recipe. But Lucille had only toyed with the highly spiced food, having felt unaccountably queasy all during the day, because of the mellifluous vibes that seemed to pervade the ether. When she and Dennis had suddenly received the invitation to dine at the President's house, Lucille had almost declined, but she had not wanted to let Socorro down, and she was also curious to meet Margaret Strayhorn, a powerful operant whom Davy had recently married, after being widowed for over thirty years. Lucille had steeled herself and accepted. But now she bespoke her son Paul, seated at her left, on his intimate mode. Darling, can you manage a quickie redact of your poor old mother? I'm feeling just the least bit delicate in the head and tummy. Sympathy. Is that better? Much. 
Are you aware of any peculiar disruptions in the mental lattices today? Sunspots or supernovae or anything? No. I'm only rather surprised that Davy and I are getting on so well. He came at me hammer and tongs during the discussion this afternoon. The audience just loved it, too, especially when Davy castigated me and the other North American intendants for not taking a stronger stand against the thousand-day probation period summarily imposed by the Lylemic. There's nothing the academic crowd likes better than to see a bigwig politico savaged with style by one of their own, even one of their ex-own. Davy McGregor seems to think that if the Remillard family members had withdrawn en masse as magnate designates, then the human polity would have been admitted to the concilium without condition. We Ramayars are suspicious characters in exotic eyes, you see, holding back galactic humanity through our dynastic hubris. Oh, my dear, but that's so unfair. The Lylemic never asked you to resign. On the contrary, it was made quite clear that the Ramayars were to remain on the roster of the designated, and I was to continue my campaign for first magnate. "'Our dessert tonight will be something very special,' Socorro Ortega announced, as the dinner plates were being cleared away. "'They are sapote pietos, tiny blue persimmons that my sister picked earlier today in her garden down in Merida, in the Yucatan, and sent me on the XP shuttle to Boston. I hope you'll all enjoy them.' There were dutiful exclamations of appreciation from around the table. Lucille found the sweetness of the little fruits to be almost cloying, but she ate them resolutely— while the Poltroyan, called Fred, sitting on her right, told her how much he and his mate were going to enjoy being visiting fellows at Dartmouth College. "'The countryside with its sugar maples is extraordinarily beautiful now,' Minnie said, her ruby eyes twinkling with enthusiasm. "'I can scarcely think of any other place in the galaxy where the changing of the seasons proclaims itself so vividly.' She sat on the opposite side of the table between Tom Spotted Owl and Davy McGregor, looking almost doll-like next to the burly Native American and the rangy Scot. Both Poltroyan sexes had hairless heads, but the females painted their shapely, purplish skulls with elaborate designs in gold paint. "'We are also greatly looking forward to winter here, which will be so much more like the climate on our native world. Fred and a colleague actually did pre-intervention research in this region of Earth, and he jumped at the chance to return here.' Fred said, Our twin daughters will be joining us on campus beginning with the winter term. They've enrolled in several music courses, and they're eager to try human winter sports. "'How nice that your family can join you,' Dennis said. "'Dartmouth has its own skiing facilities, you know, both alpine and cross-country. And there's a college ice hockey team, and toboggan races, and dog sledding and skating, and even an ice cycle racing event on the frozen river that my grandson Mark has been dying to enter.' "'But he's only a freshman, and so he'll have to wait until next winter.' "'Ice cycle racing? I don't believe that I am familiar with that particular sport,' Fred said. Poor Remillard frowned into his dessert dish. "'It can be quite dangerous, and that's undoubtedly why my son wants to participate. The motorcycles are high-powered, heavily-built machines, and the wheels are shod with steel spikes to grip the ice.' "'Love's oath!' Fred exclaimed. "'This son of yours must be a very brave lad.' "'Foolhardy might be a more apposite term,' Paul nodded pleasantly to the Poltroyan, and turned away to converse with Margaret Strayhorn on his other hand. Fred leaned close to the kind-faced Colette Roy, who sat at his right, and spoke very quietly. "'Didn't I hear that one of the intendant from Iyar's sons was—' <laughs> Too late, Minnie had delivered a sharp mental caution to her mate on his intimate mode. But Colette only sighed. "'That's the boy, I'm afraid.' After he was acquitted, Paul sent him on to Orb for prudence's sake. The young man is said to be uh, amazingly talented in the higher mind powers, Fred persisted, in spite of his mate's anxious looks, as is his distinguished father, of course. Is it true that Intendant Ramillard was the first human to be educated in the womb by means of the preceptorial techniques of the milieu? Colette Roy nodded. I had the honor of making the suggestion. Which is why you're my godmother. Paul said, showing snow-white teeth and a flashing smile. "'With your work cut out for you, trying to keep me sinless and worthy?' Dennis said quickly, "'Lucille and I had considered our family to be complete when we had six fine operant children, but Colette insisted that we make one more baby and teach him in utero, more or less the way you Poltroyans teach your fetuses.' "'I learned about the technique quite by accident a month or so after the intervention,' Colette said. 
One of the Poltroyans in the local liaison group was pregnant. I'd had a hysterectomy years earlier, after the birth of my son, so I put the proposal to Lucille and Dennis. It seemed a marvelous research opportunity. "'Funny thing,' Dennis added. "'My uncle Roger had made the very same suggestion to me less than a week earlier. God knows where he picked up the notion. He's only an antiquarian bookseller.' "'The milieu has cause to be very grateful to your vision, Dr. Roy,' Fred said. "'The book that resulted from the uh, cooperative researches of Lucille Cartier and Dennis Romillard proved to be seminal in human metapediatric studies.' "'We humans have so much to thank Poltroyans for,' Margaret Strayhorn said warmly. "'You've always been so friendly and sympathetic to our race of primitives. You, you humanized the galactic milieu for us during the difficult proctorship years. If we had had only the other exotic races as examples of galactic citizenship, we might not have been able to persevere, to hold on to the belief that humanity really belongs among the coadjunates of the milieu. You're a rather daunting lot, you know.' It seemed unfortunate to many of our people, Fred said, that the Simbiari were appointed your proctors rather than us, but one does not question the decisions of the Lyalmic. Oh, yes, one does, muttered Davy MacGregor. Many, sitting next to him, smiled sweetly and said, Humanity's ultimate mental potential is much stronger than ours, Intendant MacGregor. We would not have been such stern taskmasters to you as the Simbiari, and no doubt the Lyalmic took that into account. "'It's very fashionable to put down our green brethren,' Colette said with some asperity. "'I myself believe that the Symbiare did rather well at a thankless job, and at least they're humanoid. Would we rather have had those Krondok monsters riding herd on us?' Several of the humans at the table winced. "'They proctored our Poltroyan race,' Fred said. "'Our legends say that we barely survived the terrible experience and achieved coagination. We have empathized with your own racial distress because we feel closely related to you, having experienced an evolution that largely parallels yours, even to the aggressive impulses that once ruled us. This is why we have been eager to mitigate the severity of the Symbiare proctorship whenever possible, and to share with you our fetal educational techniques and other useful data. So you would not make the mistakes we made long ago, when the Krondaku proctored us, or even fail, Minnie put in, her pretty little face sombre, as did the seventy-two luckless emergent races entrusted to our Poltroyan proctorship. "'What happens to those who flunk out?' Tom Spotted Owl asked. "'They are isolated,' Fred said sadly, "'denied the superluminal transport system that makes travel among the stars practical. The grey limbo of hyperspace is patrolled by the Lyalmic to ensure that the quarantine is kept. Most civilizations do not endure long after failing coagination. This so-called coagination, Dennis leaned forward, his blazing blue eyes fixed on the male Poltroyan. It actually prevents aggressive behavior and guarantees altruism? After time, yes. Once a race reaches its coagulate number and is thoroughly matured, the racial mind as a whole attains unity and rejects malignant aggression just as any highly complex system rejects disorganization. In an imperfectly unified race, such as the Symbiari, a certain number of uh, maverick individuals may still be capable of antisocial behavior, but not the vast majority. The four elder races of the milieu being perfectly coadjunct, also partake whole-mindedly of unity, and this renders us incapable of any serious social sin. Of course, we still manage to commit personal transgressions, pride, despair, frivolity, that sort of thing. Fascinating, said Margaret Strayhorn. And how amazing that we humans were brought into your milieu, while we're still so imperfect. Even with the new probationary period imposed upon our concilium magnates, we are being given far more than we deserve. It was one of the many decisions of the Lyalmic in your favor, many said, in which we Poltroyans have always concurred without reservation. Fred shrugged humorlessly, and which the other coagulant races always opposed. But there you are. Everybody laughed. Davy MacGregor lifted his glass of Rioja Reserva. Here's a toast to kind Poltroy and to its reproductive physiology, so similar to ours, and its fetal education techniques, which we were able to borrow. 
But for them, we humans would have had to adapt the methods of the Symbiari. And for the next eight months, Margaret added, her face triumphant, Davy and I would have had to pretend I was carrying a suboperant tadpole. Everybody called out congratulations amid laughter, and they all drank to the amalgam of Poltroy and to the embryo. Immature humans and Poltroyans may matriculate at Dartmouth, said Tom Spotted Owl solemnly, but tadpoles, never. More laughter broke out. If everyone has finished dessert, perhaps we can have our café de olla in the living room, Socorro Ortega suggested. She explained to the Poltroyans, the caffeine beverage is flavored with a spicy bark called cinnamon, and an aromatic semi-refined sucrose called brown sugar is added to taste. It sounds delicious, Fred said. The more sugar, the better. He puts maple sugar in his soda pop, Minnie confided to Socorro, shaking her head, and jam on his scrambled eggs, and he dips fried onion rings in honey. But the president's wife was unfazed. The next time you come to dine, I'll make a real treat for Fred. Candied jalapenos. As they all rose from the table and began to move slowly out of the plant room, Paul fell in beside Davy McGregor and his wife. Will you and Margaret and Will be traveling to Concilium Orb on the CSS Kung's home with us, by any chance? Why, no, Davy said. That ship leaves on the 17th of November, doesn't she? The three of us and Will's wife are leaving day after tomorrow on the Aquatania. The ship's a bunny hopper, though, and we actually arrive at Orb four days after you do on 6th December. Margaret Strayhorn gave a self-deprecating laugh. I'm afraid I can't take ships with a high superluminal displacement factor. Even slow-track translations through the superficies into hyperspace make me feel dreadfully seedy, and now that I'm gravid, I'll probably be even worse. It's a good thing that human magnates don't have to meet an orb more often than twice a year, an Earth year, that is. Otherwise, Davy would have to go along without me. Davy McGregor put a proprietary arm around his wife. Not few can likely. Dennis laughed. Still on the honeymoon, I see. Now on for I, growled Davy. It wasn't the bloody regen tank that rejuvenated me, it was Maggie. And I'll not be separated from her by the concilium or by old Cloody himself. Margaret shook her head in mock exasperation. She was tall and raven-haired, only thirty years old, but already an intendant associate for Europe, like her husband. She had not been nominated to the concilium, which seemed not to bother her in the least. Davy, you are a darling idiot. What am I to do with him, Lucille? Dennis turned the magnate ship down, the older woman said quietly. It's hardly a disgrace. She left unsaid the fact that Paul would now probably be unopposed for first magnate, if Davy had declined. Only the son of Jamie McGregor was deemed to be as fit as Paul Remillard to be humanity's first spokesman in the Galactic Concilium. The dinner guests followed Socorro and Tom into the magnificent formal living room of the President's house, where chairs had been grouped around the great fireplace. A middle-aged woman in a dark dress and white apron was bringing in a coffee urn, and the President's daughter followed with a big tray of cups and saucers. This is Susan O'Brien, who made the Mole de Poblano we enjoyed tonight, Socorro said, and her helper is our daughter, Maria Owl, who has been keeping the trick-or-treaters from storming the fort. The guests all murmured appreciatively as they acknowledged the introduction. The President and First Lady showed Davy and Margaret and the Poltroyans some of the antique treasures that graced the room, including the portrait of the second Mrs. Daniel Webster an exquisite small sculpture by Jadwiga Majewska, and a number of pre-Columbian artworks from Dartmouth's collection that were on loan to the house. The doorbell rang. Drat, said Maria Owl, who was serving the coffee. Won't those kids ever give me a break? Why not let me take care of them this time? Margaret volunteered. She started for the front hall before Socorro or Tom could protest. We have nothing quite like this at home in Scotland. It would be a pleasure. Oh, would you? Maria said. The candy bars are in a basket on the table by the door. One treat for each trickster. And if it's students, don't let them bully you into handing out more. Margaret laughed. No fear. Although the outside porch lights were bright, the hall itself was rather dimly illuminated by a small crystal chandelier. Margaret Strayhorn picked up the basket and opened the heavy door. Five children, who looked to be ten or eleven years old, stood there in an expectant line. 
There was a colonial miss in a domino mask, a Bugs Bunny, a heavily made-up witch, a pirate with an eye patch, and a clown-faced tramp. Margaret was charmed, and simultaneously surprised to note that all of the children were operant and their minds thickly screened. Trick or treat, the youngster said, and Hydra struck. Margaret Strayhorn was a strong-minded woman, especially in the metafaculties of coercion and creativity, and she had the advantage of a split second's worth of guarded surprise just as the Hydra focused its initial drain upon her crown chakra. This saved her life. As her hair burst into flames, Margaret gave a single piercing scream. At the same time, she instinctively mustered her entire creative quotient into a self-preserving barricade. An instant later, she crumpled to the floor. The mental defense had drained all her strength. By that time, the others had come rushing into the entry hall. The front door was wide open on empty blackness. Margaret lay on her side with both arms crossed in front of her face, as if still warding off her attacker. The top of her scalp was scorched and smoking in a peculiar, radially symmetrical pattern, as if some diabolical agent had momentarily impressed upon it an incendiary brand. Stunned with horror, Davy McGregor dropped to his knees beside his wife and lifted her burned head. Maggie! My God, Maggie! Her eyes opened. The pupils were so widely dilated that they seemed black pits. I saw it, she whispered. It would have killed me but I got a wall up and deflected its first strike. And then it went away. What did? Dennis cried. I don't know, Margaret Strayhorn said helplessly. I don't know. Cretan imbecile, you gave her a chance to cry out. Forgive me, forgive me, oh dear fury, I did my best. Yes, all right. Damn, I never thought she'd be that quick. Are you safely away and well hidden? Yes. Panic, regret, anger, yearning. Broken, hearted, weeping. Fool, stop that. Do you want to attract the attention of normals? That's better. Smile, laugh, act ordinary. And now, as quickly as you can, back where you belong. But, Fury, I failed. And she did see me. She saw the Hydra itself? No, just us. She's in shock. She won't remember anything useful. I can reinforce that redactively. She won't be able to make sense of it. She'll only remember opening the door, not what was on the other side of it. Misery, deprivation, insecurity, impending disassembly. No, pull yourself together. Much of the blame for tonight's failure is mine. I underestimated Margaret Strayhorn. I took for granted that her mental assay file was accurate. It doesn't categorize her as a master, but it's only too clear from this fiasco that there must be subjacent masterly components to her mind that were activated in response to your attack. She was so quick. I never thought she'd be able to scream or prevent the insertion of the crown chakra drain. I was going to paralyze her with a first stroke, then pull her into the bushes. Afterward, I would have incinerated her body completely, just as you told me to do. No one would have suspected that I did it. But now... The burn has the lotus pattern. Both Dennis and Paul Remillard will know what that means. Well, there's no helping it. I still believe that my strategy involving Strayhorn is the correct way for us to dispose of the great enemy. Her death would totally devastate him. But how, Fury, how? I'm not strong enough to take her. You need more coaching, that's all. I can take care of it during the trip to Concilium Orb. Those boring weeks in hyperspace can be put to very productive use. And by the time we're there... Sigh. Would it hurt as much as the other lessons, Fury? Oh, yes. More, if you ever hope to become strong enough to subdue master-class minds and take what rightfully belongs to you, what the milieu would rob you of. You'll have to endure a good deal to build up your strength. Unless you've changed your mind. No! Goddamn fuck shit! No! I'll do anything! I want it! All of it! Laughter. That's my sweet Hydra. But remember, you cannot succeed without my help. You must do things my way, even if that way is difficult. I'll do anything. Dearest Fury, you made me, and you made me so very happy. I'll do anything you say. Just let me feed on life force again. Let me grow, please. Go home. Margaret Strayhorn's injury is readily treatable. She won't let this stop her from accompanying her husband to the inauguration. By the time you reach Concilium Orb, you'll be ready to try again. And this time, you won't 
fail. Chapter 19 From the Memoirs of Rogatien Remillard I awoke in the morning of 21 November with a throbbing skull from the hangover of the Western world. But no guilt at all. If ever a man had a good excuse for getting shit-faced, c'est moi. Mark had told me that he would coerce Bill Parmentier to fly him back to Ape Lake between the 1st and 15th of November with more food. But though the weather remained unaccountably perfect, so that supplies could have been dropped to us even if the lake ice would not yet take the weight of the ski-shod beaver, Mark had not come. As the food ran low, we had tried to trap more hares, but Teresa's earlier massacre had exterminated those in our immediate vicinity, as the absence of tracks proved. Ape Lake had very little other accessible winter wildlife aside from mice, our good friend Herman the Ermine, and a few spruce grouse. We had tried one of the latter, and it looked tempting coming out of the Coleman oven, roasted to a turn and accompanied by spicy apple rings. But the meat tasted horrible, permeated through and through by the skunky flavor of the spruce needles the bird had been eating. I suppose we might have gagged it down if we were actually starving to death. But neither of us was that far gone yet, and so the bird was given to a grateful Herman, and we ate our last tin of sardines spread on biscuits, with peanut butter and biscuits for dessert. Later, upon consulting one of the reference flecks, Teresa learned that she should have prepared the bird by parboiling it and dumping out the mal-flavored water several times. The next time she cooked a grouse, she followed the technique, and the result was edible, but just barely. During the week that had just passed, I tried no less than twenty times to bespeak Mark telepathically, and damn the consequences if my feebly powered, imperfectly beamed thoughts slopped out from intimate mode and were overheard. But there had been no answer, which led me to two possible conclusions. Either the boy was far out of range of my far speech, no longer on the planet Earth, or he was dead. My natural Franco-pessimism opted for the latter. I feared that the magistratum had discovered that our canoe accident was faked, and that Mark had been an accomplice in Teresa's disappearance. The Symbiari proctors might never squeeze the whole truth out of that valiant young mind, but that wouldn't stop them from pronouncing him guilty of compounding a felony and accessorizing after the fact. Their meeting out of punishment was customarily swift. The family would have been helpless to save him. Nevertheless, day after day, as my own hope dimmed, I kept on burbling to Teresa that her son was bound to show up tomorrow for sure. I tried to suppress my growing panic, commanding myself to keep up a cheerful front for Teresa's sake, all the while thanking heaven that the one operant trick I was good at was keeping my thoughts well screened. But finally, on November 20th, without my knowing it, she inventoried our remaining supplies. At supper she quietly told me that we had less than three weeks' worth of food reserves left if we ate very sparingly, and we would have to resign ourselves to the fact that Mark was not coming. "'I suspected as much,' said I. We had dined on pasta and velveta with leftover peas porridge on the side. Most of what remained in our larder of staples was simple starches. We did have fair amounts of spices and condiments left, and plenty of tea and freeze-dried coffee and dried fruit, but almost no protein. As she uttered the fateful words, I stared down at my tongue-polished plate in despair. I momentarily considered emulating the noble Captain Oates on Scott's fatal Antarctic expedition. I would take a hike out into the snow, telling Teresa that I might be gone some time and simply never return. But even as the fantasy played itself out in my imagination, I realized that my death wouldn't save her. She would still be out of food before Jack's birth, and what would become of her and the child then? The strongly coercive members of the family, who might be able to penetrate the megapod reserved tracelessly and take her and the baby home and hide them, would by that time be four thousand light-years away, on Concilium Orb, attending the inauguration. Even if they became aware of a need, it would take them two to three weeks to return, and long before then Teresa would have starved in the wilderness, or else she would be compelled to reveal herself to the magistratum. "'It's not hopeless, Roger, she said. "'You have the rifle. You can go hunting.' "'There's nothing left to hunt around the lake but small game, and the high-powered rifle bullets would blast them to shreds.' I could certainly trap what's left of the hares and grouse, but you expend a lot of energy moving around outside when it's very cold. 
I don't think I'd be able to bring in enough small critters to keep us both going. Teresa had leaned across the supper table and bestowed that dazzling smile of hers upon me. Why, then you'll simply have to go off away from the lake and find something large. It was at that point that I decided the only useful thing to do was get drunk. Huddled deep within my sleeping bag on the morning after, with my head on the verge of meltdown, I could hear Teresa moving about the cabin, humming an intricate operatic aria as she whipped up something that was probably flapjack batter. The bacon and powdered eggs were long gone, and breakfast was now usually fried cakes, oatmeal, or cinnamon rice with raisins and a bit of reconstituted milk. The ambrosial smell of coffee seeped through the thick layer of down and bunny fur covering my face. I heard her footsteps approach, ventured to use my broken-down farsight, and saw her with my mind's eye holding a steaming cup. "'Rosie, dear, don't worry,' she said. "'You'll find some kind of big game, and if we have lots of meat, we can eke out the other things.' I sat up, taking the coffee and cradling it in my shaky hands. "'All I have is two boxes of ammo, and I don't know a thing about hunting. My sport is backpacking, and I've always believed in live and let live. In rugged mountain country like this? Dear, 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 I don't know. I'd have to hike down to a lower altitude. Of course, she agreed brightly. You see, you're thinking positively already. Now get up, dear. I've got the plaque reader all loaded with Alan Fry's Wilderness Survival Handbook. It has an excellent chapter on hunting that you can read while you eat breakfast, and I'll find some other books for you, too. I groaned and rolled out of the sack. Books! But they'd helped me to rebuild the cabin and to make snowshoes, and they'd taught Teresa how to snare and skin hairs and cut the skins in a spiral to make the furry yarn for her rugs. And I'd learned from a book that it was necessary to keep the rifle out in the cold to prevent condensation of moisture and rusting when it was brought into the warm cabin. And Teresa had read somewhere that both dry and green firewood would be necessary for cooking and heating, a piece of practical lore I had never heard of. There were scores of other bits of information that we had gleaned from the Fleck Library and made good use of. So I would read, and then I would pray a whole lot, and then tomorrow I would go a-hunting. We had chosen for our refuge one of the most glacier-bound areas in North America. In almost every direction about Ape Lake, precipitous mountains and impassable ice fields hemmed us in. There were only two feasible exploration directions for me to consider. The first was the Ape Creek Corridor, which trended eastward into the deep interior of the Megapod Reserve. The second was a northwestern route, beginning at the opposite end of the lake. It skirted the tongue of the vast Files Glacier, descended to the valley of a fairly large river called the Noek, and eventually reached an arm of the sea. Recalling the cascades of Ape Creek, I thought at first that the other northwestern route would be better. Ape Lake was at an altitude of 1,400 meters. After traveling only 14 kilometers northwest, I would have descended 850 meters to the heavily forested river bottom, where there would certainly be wintering elk. Killing a single one of those large animals would solve our food problem completely, provided I could haul the meat back up to Ape Lake. But a study of the durofilm topographic map we had swiped from Bill Parmentier revealed those crowded-together contour lines that always ring alarm bells in the mind of the cross-country hiker. The route was extremely steep, and there was almost no forest cover that might harbor animals until I reached the river itself. Furthermore, traveling along that exposed and barren way would take me out of the snow shadow of Mount Jacobson and into the teeth of the howling storms that swept in from the Pacific. The other possibility, a route leading from the eastern end of the lake down Ape Creek Canyon, showed the green tint of forest every centimeter of the way into the valley of the north-flowing Talchaco River, some eighteen kilometers distant. In most stretches along the canyon, the contour lines were reasonably far apart. Now that the temperature stayed well below freezing both day and night, the creek would surely have dwindled and frozen just as the other streams had, making it easier for me to descend. On the other hand, the canyon route would not take me down to as low an altitude as the other path would. Nevertheless, I finally decided that I would have a better chance of finding a sizable animal sooner, going that way. What sort of game I would find in the interior was anybody's guess, but the winter was not yet far advanced, and I hoped for a late prowling bear, or perhaps a deer or two. I prepared to leave early on the following morning. 
I transferred a small mountain of firewood to the vicinity of the porch for Teresa's convenience, and ordered her to melt snow for water rather than chancing the steep trail down to the lake. She prepared a dozen fat oatmeal cakes filled with dried fruit for my rations. I also took some packets of soup mix, which had little nourishment, but would provide me with something other than hot water and tea to drink. In my backpack I carried a plast tarpaulin and lots of plast gar bags, a little pot to boil water, the small axe, my biggest knife, the whetstone, a hank of rope, the ammunition, and the dome tent. I lashed my sleeping bag and pad to the pack frame, and put a fire starter and Teresa's Swiss army knife with its saw blade into my pocket. When she wasn't looking, I filled a spare canteen with a high-proof lamb's navy rum. "'How long will you be gone?' she asked. "'As long as it takes. Don't try to far-speak me unless there's an emergency. If they're still searching for us, that might give you away.' She nodded, her face calm. She was wearing an oversized buffalo plaid wool shirt, jeans let out at the waist, and unlaced boots over heavy socks. Her dark hair, once so sleek and shining, was lank now from being washed with soap and pulled back into a ponytail. But otherwise pregnancy had made her bloom, and she looked so beautiful and young and vulnerable that I had to turn away from her quickly so she would not see my eyes brim up. She kissed me on the cheek as I put on my backpack and said, "'You'll succeed, Roger. It can't end this way. Jack is positive that he's going to live and accomplish great things. That means we will, too.' I tried to laugh. Cocksure little beggar, that Jack. Oh, yes, his ego is extremely healthy. I've already had to lecture him about the perils of pride and self-absorption. It's difficult for Jack to understand that I'm a separate person with an independent life, not simply a loving receptacle who exists only for his convenience. The very notion that other people will some day interact closely with him still frightens him. He, he tends to equate non-maternal minds with danger. You can understand why. Well, I'm no threat. I don't know why he's too shy to even say hello to me. While you're gone, I'll try to teach him that it's a human survival trait to socialize. To be friendly, he and I have so much to thank you for. I'll try to get that idea across to him, too. My gloved hand rested on the door latch. If I'm not back in six days, I want you to far speak, Dennis. Her eyes widened. No. You must, I insisted. But you can't wait too long, or he'll be off-world on his way to the inauguration. Dennis might be able to think of some way to save you. He has an incredible mind, Teresa. Because he's such a self-effacing man, people tend to forget that. Even his own children do. But his meta-quotient in some faculties is even higher than Paul's. He's a better coercer, for certain, and I know he strongly disapproves of the more tyrannical aspects of the proctorship. He might be willing to stick his neck out for you and Jack, if you convinced him of the baby's mental superiority. No, she cried, Dennis is too cold. Those eyes of his frightened me. He'd think only of the family, just as Lucille did. I can only trust you and Mark. Mark's not coming back. My tone was bleak, final. And I may fail. Both her hands were clasped tightly over her abdomen, and she had shut her eyes against a sudden flood of tears. You won't fail. Go, Rosie. Go now. I'll be waiting for you. I shrugged, opened the door, and stepped out into the overcast winter morning. It took me a few minutes to put on my snowshoes. Then I took the Winchester down off the wall, loaded it, hung the rifle over my shoulder, and set off. The temperature was somewhere not too far below freezing. The smoke from our chimney rose only a few meters before flattening out, which meant that the atmospheric pressure was low and some kind of bad weather was on its way. The snow was about thirty cents deep, and I mushed along easily over the frozen lake toward the Ape Creek outlet. Dark clouds hid Mount Jacobson completely and seemed to race on ahead of me, but I never thought of turning back. Having the wind at my back seemed a good omen, and if it did begin to snow heavily, I'd simply hole up in my tent and wait for it to stop. Five hours later, after I had managed to descend a couple of very steep kilometers into Ape Creek Canyon, the blizzard started. From the lake I had climbed down step-like terraces of rock that had formed cascades when the creek was high. Now only a little water still flowed beneath the ice crust. The canyon widened abruptly at a point where a nearly frozen waterfall dribbled into a pool. This lay in a brushy clearing with terrain that was much more level than the upper part of the canyon. Scattered around the basin were tumbled rocks, looking like huge sleeping beasts partially mantled with snow. 
thickets of leafless alder mingled with the spires of tall subalpine fir and spruce at the forest's edge. It must have been an idyllic spot in warm weather. With a storm beginning to roar down the canyon, I found it much less appealing. The falling snow thickened rapidly to the point where the landscape began to dissolve into amorphous white. I knew I could go no further until it stopped. The temperature was dropping rapidly, and the wind blew harder and harder. I slogged back among the large trees, found a reasonably sheltered place, and trampled down a spot. Then I took off snowshoes, gun, and pack, and set up the dome tent, which had an integral floor. I heaped loose snow around it so that it would not immediately blow away, and then spent a bad five minutes searching for the snowshoes in the Winchester, which had been completely buried by blowing snow while I worked. Zipped inside my shelter at last, I did what any sensible Canuck would have done. I crept into my sleeping bag, had a good nip of rum, and went to sleep. For some reason, my slumber was as deep and restful as a child's. I don't remember my dreams, but they were innocuous. Every now and then I would half waken to the roaring of the gale in the trees and the sharp hiss of snow against the taut fabric of the tent, then drift back to sleep again. In time the sound of the wind became muffled and the snow hiss stopped, and I knew that the tent was buried. But not to worry. The little screened window at the back was open a little at the top for ventilation, and loose snow has plenty of air in it. So I slept on and on, until utter silence woke me up. It was pitch black inside my shelter, and the storm was over. I had slept with most of my clothes on, and, if anything, I was too warm. The felt liners of my pack boots and my mitts were shoved down in the bottom of the sleeping bag along with my food sack and water canteen. I retrieved the lot, put on my damp parka, ate a soggy oatmeal cake blind, ugh, and drank some water. Then I began to dig myself out, since nature called. The snow had drifted more than a meter and a half deep, but it was so soft it was easily pushed aside. A snowshoe, plied with care, made a good shovel. I stomped and scraped a ramp, peed into a snowy alcove, put the snowshoes on, then moved on to the fresh snow surface. Up there it was bitterly cold. To my surprise, the night sky was bright. The aurora borealis glowed overhead like enormous curtains of green and scarlet light. As I watched, enthralled, they rippled and even seemed to rustle, and then a great expanding lance shape of white radiance thrust up from behind the ridge on the opposite side of the canyon, piercing the colored draperies. It was followed by another beam, and then a third and a fourth, like celestial searchlights. I gave an exclamation of awe. The trees now cast sharp shadows on the new-fallen snow, and the entire little basin was lit up as though a full moon were shining. And not fifteen meters away, on top of a great heap of nearly snow-free rocks, I saw something move, something large. I stood petrified, and then I caught a faint whiff of a pungent animal odor, and the thing on the rocks stood upright on two legs, the aurora silvering its shaggy pelt. It was huge, a good half-meter taller than I, and I knew in an instant what it was. Careful to make no sound, I ducked back down into the tent, seized the rifle, and shook off my right mitt. Flipping off the safety, I crept back up the snow ramp, lifted the weapon to my shoulder, and lined up the sights. The creature was still there, facing away from me, looking as tall and as massive as a grizzly bear. But it wasn't a bear. It was a member of an endangered species, Gigantopithecus, the Bigfoot, the largest primate that had ever lived a creature that was telepathic, as I was, but with a mind still innocent, as mine decidedly was not. As I drew a bead on the megapod, I completely forgot all the high-minded musings that had occupied me when I first came to Ape Lake. I thought only of how much meat that great frame carried, meat that would keep Teresa and Jack and me alive. I would have killed it. At that range, even a duffer like me wouldn't miss and I had no qualms of conscience at all. It was an animal, and I was a desperate human being, the most dangerous species in the universe. But just as my finger was tightening on the icy trigger, the aurora burst into a fantastic display of purple and green and white shapes, like multicolored ghosts gliding about the sky. Then the Bigfoot raised its arms, and my mind heard it utter a formless, telepathic cry of wonderment and joy. Slowly I let the barrel of the Winchester sag. 
The sky phantoms danced above us, and the stars sparkled, and the great creature crooned its silent hymn from the rocky eminence. I tried to lift the rifle again, then gave it up and snapped the safety back on. The small sound echoed in the crisp, cold air like a cracking twig, and the Bigfoot swung around abruptly and looked at me. I waved. It vanished. Sighing, I returned to the tent, had another oat cake and a snort, and went back to sleep. The next morning it was snowing again, but lightly. I shooed over to the rocks where I had seen the giant ape and found nothing, not even tracks. Perhaps the thing had a den deep inside the pile. Snooze in peace, I told it. Reason tells me that your groceries, but my heart says nay, nay. One simply cannot eat a fellow operant. After breakfast I packed up and continued my journey down Ape Canyon. Below the little basin the bed of the creek steepened once again. With the snow much deeper now I had to proceed with greater care and much more slowly. So far I had not encountered any formidable obstacles to travel, but I hadn't seen any game trails either, except for the tracks of something that might have been a mink or a marten in a place where the creek had a small area of open water. It snowed dismally on and off all day long, accumulating another ten cents or so. Ape Creek curved in a northerly direction now, skirting the little peak I had named Mount Jeff. I might have traveled four or five more climbs downstream by the end of the day. I found a place where there were wind-scoured rocks, pitched the tent, and built a fire. The oat cakes were not much more palatable warm than they had been cold, but a pot full of hot chicken soup warmed my belly nicely. I lay in my sleeping bag at the open door of the tent, sipping the rum drop by numbing drop, watching the fire die and the snowflakes sift gently down. As boozy contentment took hold of me, I wondered if I was going to die. Freezing to death is supposed to be an easy way to go, much easier than starvation. Lucky me. Poor Teresa. But then I snapped out of my morbid reverie, remembering that I had not decided to accompany Teresa to this place of my own free will. I was ordered to do so by the Lylemic entity I called the Family Ghost, who had said that my participation in the adventure was necessary. Necessary? To what? To the thing's cosmic chicanes, of course. I was quite certain that Teresa's unborn child was the key factor in my spectral Hassler schemes. This meant that she would live to see Jack born. It was logical that I would probably live as well, so that she would not have to go through her ordeal alone in the dead of winter. Un point, c'est tout, oncle Roger. The luxury of freezing to death was not to be mine, after all. Still, I was getting mighty tired of clambering down this canyon. The farther away from Ape Lake I went, the more trouble I'd have returning. One more goddamn blizzard, and I might not be able to get back at all. Mon fantôme, I called out. Are you there? The last flaming chunk of wood in my campfire subsided into the ashes. Only embers remained, making little sizzling sounds as the snowflakes pelted them. Ghost! I know you can hear me. It's getting colder and colder, and this rock scrambling on snowshoes is pooping me out. I'm only a poor old man, a hundred and six years old. If I go much farther, I'll have big trouble hauling back any game I find. You shag me out some kind of edible critter tomorrow, you hear me? No more fooling around. You want me to do this job you handed me? Then give me a break. Big game. No shit. Tomorrow. Right here. Without fail. Feeling much better, I capped the rum canteen, zipped the tent flap, and slept. In the morning it was very cold and cloudy, but the snow had stopped. When I went down to the creek for water, I discovered that something had been there before me. Tracks led upstream on the opposite bank, and I could see a thin plume of smoke or steam arising from a stand of small fir trees about a hundred meters away. I got the Winchester, crept up my side of the creek, and spotted him browsing among the firs. Aim for the front of the body where the vital organs are, the wilderness survival handbook had said, and the book even included a line drawing of an animal with a bull's eye on it for the sake of idiots like me. I slipped off the safety, took aim at the proper spot, and fired. The young bull moose dropped dead into the snow. It must have weighed upwards of 450 kilos. Even if I made a sled, it was going to take several grueling trips to get all the meat back home. But what the hell? I'd done it. 
Giddy with success, I got out the axe and the knives and the tarp and the plast bags, and tried to remember what the book had said about butchering. I was a little hazy on the details, but I figured I'd manage somehow. Before I started, I chanced one triumphal telepathic shout, imperfectly directed along Teresa's intimate mode. Food, glorious food! And another thought beam pierced my brain like a tiny dart, smack between the eyes. Gotcha, Uncle Roger. Dennis had finally found me. Chapter 20 Sector 15, star 15-000-001, Talonis, Planet 1, Concilium Orb. Galactic Year, La Prime, 1-387-566, 6 December, 2051. On 4 December, by Earth Reckoning, Anne Remillard had requested, no, ordered, that Mark do his family duty by tourist-guiding small groups of his newly arrived cousins about Concilium Orb, orienting them to the legislative center of the galaxy. She had delivered the stunner with, oh, by the way, casualness, as the two of them were leaving the human polity office block on Monday, heading for the tube station along with a great mob of operant human bureaucrats. But what about my real work? Mark had protested. I'm not finished with the research correlating GPPs of the Cosmop worlds with their crime rates. Junko can finish it. But I'm supposed to be acting as a legislative page, doing important work for you and the other family magnates, not wet-nursing gangs of gawking juvenile relatives. Anne was adamant. Young man, until your father or someone else requests your inestimable services, you are still my page, and you will do as I say. After two days of rest, your cousins are all recovered from limbo lag and spoiling for something to do, especially the young ones. There's no reason why they should waste time sailboarding and lying on the beach in Paliuli when they could be furthering their education. Why me? There are regular tours for the families and friends of the new human magnates. I know you've been spending every spare minute prowling this exotic beehive. Make some good use of what you've learned. Your uncles and aunts and your father and I are going to be much too busy with the inauguration preliminaries and other concilium affairs to spend much time with the children, and your cousins will learn much more from you than they would from a canned tour. Most of the Ramayars had arrived on the CSS Kungsholm, which had docked two days earlier, and all of the families except Paul's had settled in at Tropical Paliuli. Only Dennis and Adrian remained behind on Earth to take care of last-minute business. They would be joining the others just before Christmas. Lucille had insisted upon taking charge of Mark's motherless younger siblings during the space voyage, and was still supervising them in Paul's big apartment in Golden Gate, bossing the nanny and the housekeeper about. She had also appointed herself Paul's official hostess, to his well-concealed chagrin, and had arranged for herself and Dennis to take an apartment right next to Paul's. "'Show your cousins around in small groups,' Anne said, as she and Mark descended the escalator into the tube station. Not more than six or seven kids at a crack. Five days with each bunch ought to give them a useful overview of the human and exotic enclaves, especially the latter. Do an especially good job showing them how our non-human compares behave in simulated natural settings. And don't forget to take the youngsters to the visitors' gallery in the concilium chambers, so that they can experience legislative procedures. Mark groaned. I'll be running fifty pence tours from now until New Year's. The galactic year is a thousand days long, and we are now, Anne allowed herself a small smile as she paused to consult her wrist calm, only on day 566. You'll be back home on Earth long before then. Mark looked at her with a startled expression, his annoyance wiped away by a sudden new thought. Back home. Anne, Anne, do you know what Papa and the others are planning to do? "'About what?' Anne inquired blandly. She had turned aside into a refreshment bar once they reached the lower level. "'Buy you a ginger ale?' She fed her credit card into the small machine on the bar and punched up an anchor steam beer for herself. Mark nodded to the drink invitation, but otherwise kept his mind well guarded. He did not reply out loud, but projected to her, on her intimate mode, twin portraits of his mother and Uncle Roger. "'We've not yet held a family memorial service, or a requiem,' Anne said, pressing her right thumb on one corner of the tab display, and then scanning it swiftly with her wallet for a receipt. 
You can have masses said for them yourself if you want to do something special. You know very well that's not what I mean. The two cold beverages popped out of a hatch in front of them. Mark picked his up and began to drink in apparent unconcern. The bar was crowded with humans and exotics, and Mark and Anne were squeezed in between a tall gi, daintily sipping a cocktail of frangipani nectar, and a stout little poltroian, chug-lugging a stein of creme de menthe. Anne said to Mark on intimate, If you have questions about Teresa and Roger, ask your father if you dare, but do it very adroitly, because this entire orb is supposedly bugged by Lyalmic surveillance machinery. I can't ask, Papa. I haven't been able to get him alone since he arrived. All he's interested in is scrounging for votes and fooling around with Laura Tremblay, the damned hypocrite. He's supposed to be such a high and mighty great leader and statesman, and he's going to be first magnate, for Christ's sake. And he doesn't even care about his wife and unborn child. Shut up! You know I'm right. You hate that part of him, too. You're mistaken. I'm not. Why are you lying? Tell me. Why do you all stick up for him? To survive. What the hell's that supposed to mean? You'll find out soon enough. I want to know what the family is planning to do about Mama. Well, we'd better be getting along, said Anne, smiling sweetly at Mark as she finished the last of her beer. I'm going to the theatre tonight with Ilya and Katie, and you, my lad, are going to spend the evening preparing a tour schedule for my inspection first thing tomorrow. You can start the tours immediately. Mark leaned toward her with apparent casualness, still sipping his drink. Then, without warning, his gray eyes locked onto hers, and Anne felt the initial grip of a near-indomitable coercion. Jesus, when had he mastered this maneuver? Before the boy could insert the redactive component of the mind ream and peel her open like a tangerine, she lashed back at him with a stunning mental repost. It rocked him physically, as well as cutting him loose from her. Mark was flung against the Voltroyan standing next to him and began to choke on his ginger ale. Oh, dear, Anne exclaimed, reaching out to her nephew with an air of anxious solicitude. Did I jostle you? Did some of your drink go down the wrong pipe? Shall I slap you on the back? Don't you ever try to ream me again, you arrogant young shit. Here, take my handkerchief, dear. I'm so sorry. Of course I know what you did with Teresa and Roger. We all do. We know everything except where you stashed them, and we're going to do our best to salvage the situation, but you stay out of it, do you understand? Mark apologized to the exotic he had bumped, then said to Anne, "'It's okay. I'm just fine now. And what about the attack on Margaret Strayhorn? What's the family going to do about that? You know one of us had to be responsible. How did you find out about that?' Grandmère was leaking like a sieve the day she arrived. It must have been preying on her mind during the trip out. Davy McGregor's wife had one of those weird, psycho-creative drain burns, exactly like the ones that killed Brett of Victor Byrne. You will discuss the matter with no one. You will undertake no investigations whatsoever. I am deadly serious, Mark. Do you understand me? The adults in the family will deal with it, and it's not certain that one of us was responsible. Don't make me laugh. It could even be Papa, and Strayhorn and McGregor are due to arrive in orb day after tomorrow. What if the damned Victor-tainted mind goes for her again? If it does, and if the magistrate of investigating team decides that a remiard is behind both attacks, then we might all find ourselves for the chop, at least as far as membership in the concilium goes. We're doing our best to cope with the matter. Ha! Huh. Damn you, Mark! Do you want me to sling you on to the slowest bunny-hopping crate I can find? One that'll get you back to earth in time for Dartmouth summer break? If you don't keep your nose out of this affair, I'll do it, so help me God. We can't have ham-handed adolescents messing around. This matter is too important and too dangerous for all of us. I'll lay off. Affirmation. Now, about the guided tours for your cousins. Anne took Mark's arm and steered him out of the bar and onto the tube platform. Would you like to take the youngest children first? I won't ask you to cope with anyone under the age of nine. We'll let their parents decide what to show them, but you can have a free hand with the older kids. What do you think? Whatever you say, Anne. A minute later... The inertialist capsule for Golden Gate arrived, and he got on without saying another word to her. He performed his duty with perfect efficiency. Tuesday he papa goosed seven peewees around the human enclaves, enduring their puerile questions and their imperfectly screened dumb remarks about the way so many people native to one part of Earth always thought some other part was more desirable and wanted to live there. Today he was trying to keep his temper as the same group argued about which exotic enclave they wanted to see first. He should never have offered them a choice. The roster of juveniles included Uncle Phil's third son, Richard, who was ten, 
two of Uncle Maury's brood, nine-year-old Roger and prim eleven-year-old Celine, and four others who are also eleven, Uncle Sebby's youngest, Quentin, Aunt Cat's blustery son, Gordon, Parnell, the second-born of Uncle Adrian and Aunt Sherry, and Mark's own younger sister, Madeline, his frail little brother, Luke, who still hadn't recovered from the painful Upsilon field translations of the trip out, would be joining a later group. Gordo had sneered when Mark suggested that they begin the exotic itinerary with a symbiari enclave. Who cares about how the green leaky freakies live? They've been treating us like dog shit for forty years. Watch your mouth, Gordo, Celine said. They could be listening. Oh, mercy, I'm scared poopless. Come on, Mark, pleaded Cousin Parney. We'd rather see those crazy lagoon islands where the geese exify. Better yet, the big tankfuls of gunk where the Krondok monsters do it, Quint added, his eyes glittering. Do what? inquired innocent little Roger. His big sister Celine said succinctly, Copulate. That sounds nifty, said ten-year-old Dickie. I bet it'd beat those elephant seals we saw mating one time in Argentina. Krondaku must weigh twice as much, and they have tentacles. Boys, Maddie sighed, rolling her eyes heavenward, I want to see a Poltroian winter grove with the cute little houses nestled among the giant tree roots, half buried in snow. I want to go inside a Poltroian home and see if they really have jewels all over everything. Their houses are supposed to be the most gorgeous things in the universe. Let's go there first, Marco. The three older boys jeered. Gora said, Sure, we'll go there first, Maddie. Anything for Marco's darling little baby sister. We've all seen Poltroy and stuff a million times in the Tri-D, Parney put in scornfully, but they hardly ever show anything about the way the Krondaku live. Probably don't want to scare us poor earthworms to death. I vote for the Krondaku, too, said Quint. I've heard that sometimes even real people screw in their aphrodisiac goo pools right alongside the exotic blowboids. Gordo's eyes bugged out. You're kidding, he turned to Mark. Humans would be poisoned wallowing in that stuff, wouldn't they? No, said Mark austerely. The liquid in the Krondok canubial vats is mostly glycerin, with a small amount of imidazolidinol urea and traces of isoyohimbine, tetrahydroharmine, nicotine, and other psychoactive alkaloids. Son of a bitch, breathed Gordo. How many of you guys want to start with the Krondok octopussy's enclave? Parney demanded. All of the boys raised their hands, while the two girls scowled. Mark sighed. He won't like it much. Krondok domicilia are great big clinkery black things made out of lava, like a dark coral reef, with holes in the rock for the family dwelling units. The Krondok gravity preferendum is half ours, so you keep bouncing around, scraping your head on the rough passageway ceilings. And they like their atmosphere cold and damp, and so high in oxygen partial pressure it makes you giddy. We want to see a Krondok enclave first anyway, the boys chorused. Especially the Wuvat, Gordo said. All right, said Mark, but you runs better be polite and tactful. We're not visiting a zoo, you know. The Krondaku are the most influential race in the milieu, aside from the Lyalmic. They're not just big, ugly brutes. They're smarter than we are, and they'll be forming judgments about humanity from observing the behavior of you filthy-minded little puny prongs. We never asked, Madeline said sweetly, to be dragged into their precious galactic milieu. If they don't like us, it's just too bad for them. Shall we get started, big brother? When they stepped out of the transport capsule into the Krondok enclave of Lurakal, the youngsters gasped and instinctively huddled together. The place was crowded with huge, many-armed creatures of nightmarish form, and Mark and his charges were the only non-Krondaku there. The tube station had pocked and pitted black walls that seemed roughly carved from substance resembling coal or obsidian. All of the surfaces gleamed with beads of moisture, and there was a peculiar tangy odor resembling that of machine oil in the chilly, vapor-laden air. The reddish tinge to the ambient illumination made the children think of evening light filtered through storm clouds. Mark's young cousins had seen members of this awesome exotic race in person before, but always in a human setting, where the impact of the horrifying, supremely intelligent entities could be mollified by the presence of friendly adults of the children's own species. Back on Earth, 
a young human mind could easily dismiss the Krondaku as a frightful aberration that would soon be gone. But here, in their own enclave, the monsters lived and moved and went about their business in a world where only they could be at home, where human beings were the exotic interlopers, yearning desperately to be somewhere else. The group bounded along awkwardly after Mark in the low gravity, ascending the station ramp, shivering from the abrupt drop in temperature, and too overawed even to speak. They emerged upon what appeared to be a raw volcanic shore, where an artificial lake of some thick transparent liquid rippled sluggishly. The landforms round about it featured sharp promontories, looming rock pinnacles, and scattered inshore stacks and jagged islets of some dark mineral like basalt. The Krondok enclave had a twilit crimson sky, full of swift-moving black clouds. The odor of volatile hydrocarbons was pronounced, and a biting wind blew, raising sullen wavelets on the lake whose boundaries were lost in mist. Tendrils of vapor streamed and roiled from each small island's summit and from the eminences on shore. The rough rocky flanks had myriad openings that glowed green, blue, or vermilion within. Only gradually did the young earthlings become aware that what appeared to be barren volcanic formations were actually amorphous apartment structures inhabited by the Krondaku. The cousins gaped as they watched the commuting exotics. Some surged out of the lake and descended into the tube station, while others flowed up from the tunnel to vanish sedately into the waters, evidently swimming to the island of their choice. Except for the wind whistling softly among the crags and the lapping of the waves, it was very quiet. The Krondaku were capable of vocal speech, but long eons ago they had chosen to communicate mostly by telepathy. None of the great invertebrates acknowledged the presence of the visitors by so much as the twitch of an accessory eyeball. The etheric charge of the enclave was entirely benevolent, but every one of Mark's young companions still felt vaguely threatened. After about five minutes, a Krondok individual of exceptionally large size came gliding up to them, swiveling bright blue primary optics from one young face to another. The being transmitted a grave, far-spoken speech of welcome, introducing herself as their hostess, Logaitu Tilkai. She carried a satchel, which she opened after concluding her telepathic remarks. Plucking forth Abercrombie and Fitch hooded jackets with this tentacle and that, she distributed them among the chilled earthlings. I have summoned a surface vessel, Loga Itu Tilkai said aloud in a peculiar voice reminiscent of a talking kettle drum, which will convey us to my personal domicilium, located less than a kilometer offshore. There, for the next three hours, you will receive a superficial but rewarding introduction to Krondok domestic life. It will be our pleasure, said Mark. The younger boys were trying valiantly to conceal their despair, while the girls wore superior smiles. My own three beloved larvae have done careful research on human dietary needs, and will prepare luncheon for you as an educational exercise, Loga Itu continued, expanding her befanged buckle orifice in the Krondok equivalent of a smile. I know you will be forbearing if their efforts show occasional amateurish lapses in culinary technique. I will make quite sure that none of the food served to you is poisonous or completely unfit for human consumption. I'm quite certain it will be delicious, Mark said, administering coercive prods to the petrified cousins. Delicious, they parroted. Loga Itu indicated her approval. After the meal, I will conduct you to the Lorakal Exhibition Hall of Krondok Science and Natural History, which you may already have discerned a few hundred meters further along this attractive esplanade. There you may improve yourselves amongst full-sensory experiential analogues of Krondok anatomical evolution, planetary morphology and ecology, and overviews of our technological progress covering the past 250,000 Earth orbits. Can, can we see a connubial vat? Little Roger asked timidly. Certainly. There is one just adjacent to this tube station. Would you care to visit it before we embark for my domicilium? Yes, please, the other cousins chorused, their faces brightening. None of their minds showed any trace of the earlier prurient fatuity. However, even Parney, Gordo, and Quint were subdued. This way, then, Loga Itu said. 
Do be cautious in your ambulation. Our diminished gravity is usually perceived by humans as pleasurable, but it may also be unexpectedly hazardous in more restricted interior spaces. She moved off with surprising speed. In an environment that artificially simulated their own, the Krondaku displayed none of the ponderous lethargy that afflicted them on strong gravity worlds. The children bounded and leapt along after their exotic hostess, who led them to what looked like a large hole in a raw lava cliff. It was actually the entrance to a Krondok house of worship, and they had to endure a tour of the eerie sanctuary, which seemed to be little more than a bare cavern illuminated by flickering orange grease lamps, before she finally conducted them to an open shaft in one alcove of the temple, where a cage elevator waited. They plunged downward into utter darkness, coming to an abrupt stop in a dimly lit little cave. Leaving the elevator, Mark and his cousins followed the Krondok female as she slithered down a dank tunnel with many side branches. In addition to signs written in exotic languages, there were occasional notices in standard English that read, To the Canubiovat, also known as the Pool of the Monsters. Since coming to Orb, Mark had visited the Krondaku fairly often, but he never had any desire to see one of their trysting spots, and he felt increasingly ill at ease as he bounced cautiously along behind Logaitu. That men and women would experience an enhancement of their erotic response as they cavorted with lascivious invertebrates was a notion he found as repellent and incomprehensible as the other irrational aspects of human sexuality. The cousins, on the other hand, were quickly recovering their earlier high spirits. Mark was aware of secret mental exchanges going on among the eleven-year-olds, and he supposed that the silly little fools were once again giggling and indulging in callow vulgarity. Finally, the group reached a cul-de-sac with two doors. The sign on one said, Viewing Chamber. The other said, Canubial Vat Entry at Attention, non Krondok Entities. Please do not enter without the appropriate respiratory equipment in place. All activity is undertaken at the risk of the participants. Loga Itu opened the door to the viewing chamber and gestured with a tentacle for the children to go in. They found themselves in a black rock grotto, almost entirely filled by a dark pool. The vibes of the place were strange, scary, and thrilling at the same time, and the air temperature was no longer chilly but pleasantly warm. All of the illumination came from deep within the pool, where indistinct large shapes that glowed with shifting, throbbing colors were languidly adrift. Racing swiftly and erratically among the great shining masses were a few smaller ones. Loga Itu's mind spoke. We will move to a place where we will be able to survey the scene beneath the surface. Please do not speak. Many Krondaku hold their sexual congress to be sacred, as do certain humans. Mark trailed after the others as they descended a narrow ramp. At the bottom was a great transparent window, similar to that found in some earthside aquariums. Now it was possible to see more clearly the Krondok couples conjoined at the ventral surfaces and suspended in the dense liquid. Their huge bodies, so shapeless and hideous on dry land, had a strange rippling grace when afloat. The tentacles of the mated exotics curled and uncurled in rhythmic mutual motion, and what had once been mere ugly warts on the blotchy Krondok integument were transformed into multicolored luminescent organs pulsating in slow synchrony to the sexual tempo. And the other, smaller lovers, the bright conjoined darters weaving in and out of the slower dance of the mated Krondaku like writhing double flames, were human. Mark caught his breath as one golden glowing pair soared in close to the window. He found himself fighting for self-control as the corona of their ecstatic aura momentarily touched his mind and aroused him. The younger children, all prepubertal, felt only a fleeting sense of joy. The lovers were nude their bodies glorified by an intricate pattern of yellow light that overlay a deeper blue glow. They were beautiful, and at the same time grotesque, for their faces were entirely hidden by breathing masks, with bulging eye lenses that blazed with blood-red radiance. They carried no air tanks, nor any other apparatus that would inhibit their freedom of movement. There were three human couples sharing the canubial vat with the Krondaku. The psychoactive alkaloids in which they swam were absorbed through the skin, stripping them of their mind screens along with all the rest of their inhibitions, so that their mental signatures were readily accessible. One man and woman were Ilya Goris and his wife, Katie McGregor. 
The second pair were Katie's brother, Davy McGregor, and his wife, Margaret Strayhorn. The third pair glowed with more intensity than the others, and their movements were more frenzied and complex. The man was Mark's father, Paul Remillard, and the woman was Laura Tremblay. Thank you, Logger E2 Tilkai, for this interesting experience. Mark Whip snapped his coercion at the mesmerized minds of his cousins and sister and forced them to turn away from the window. But we'd better be moving along now. The children have so much to learn about your race and so little time. Yes, my sweet Hydra. They're here, Fury. They must have come in on a starship today. Excellent. She must still be semi-convalescent from your attack on Halloween, and hyperspatial translation would have weakened her as well. Take care of her as soon as possible. I'm already making my plans. After you've drained the life force, dispose of the body completely in a solid waste destructor. There should be a farewell message, like this image. You must force her to write it after the crown chakra is drained, destroying her willpower. Is that clear? Gotcha. Oh, God, 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 I can hardly wait. A lot depends upon you, Hydra. I'll be watching, but you must do this important job. Don't fail me again. If you do, I may have to find another helper. No, 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 no. You'll do it tonight? Tonight, without fail? Davy had been right, as usual. All of the lingering traces of her trauma, to say nothing of the weariness after that interminable journey from Earth, had been washed away as they made love for hour after fantastic hour in the pool of the monsters. Margaret's erotic tastes had never leaned toward group sex, and at first she had balked when Ilya and Katie proposed the perfect remedy for what ailed her. But there's nothing crass about it, Margaret's sister-in-law had said with gentle seriousness. Katie was a tiny woman with delicate features whose rejuvenated form was as frankly and deliciously plump as that of an archaic Venus. In the pool of the monsters you're so wrapped up in your love that you have no sensation at all of being part of an orgy. The mating Krondaku and whatever humans are there seem only to be dream images made of colored light. The exotics drift around slowly like monstrous star clusters, and the humans are golden meteors, and the only input your mind receives from them is beauty and harmony. And besides... The Saturnine Ilya had put in pragmatically. The humans wear masks. One effectively becomes something else before entering the connubial vat. Davy had urged that they give it a try, and finally she had agreed. There had been another oblivious pair of human lovers already in the pool when the four of them arrived, but to spare Margaret's lingering squeamishness, Davy had blanked out their identities with a psycho-creative screen, so she had no idea who they were. Not that it would have mattered. For nearly eight hours, she and her husband had experienced unflagging bliss. When it was over, Elia and Katie and the anonymous human pair, having long since departed, and he led her out of the pool, they took off their masks and together showered off the last traces of the psychoactive liquid. Margaret was surprised to discover that she was not exhausted at all, but invigorated and, yes, almost unable to believe that the amazing experience had been real. Davy had taken her then to their new apartment in the human enclave called Ponte di Rialto. There were some formalities of arrival to be taken care of, so Davy went off to deal with them, leaving her to do a leisurely unpacking of the luggage they had abandoned so precipitately at the spaceport earlier in the day, when Elia and Katie, who had welcomed them to Orb, had hatched their therapeutic scheme. Margaret pottered around, still in a state of post coital languor. After she had put their things away, she found out who their neighbors in Rialto were and admired the view of the so-called Grand Canal from their balcony window. She was surprised to note that the gondoliers holding along the watercourse were living non-operant humans, not robots. Then it occurred to her to check out the apartment's kitchen, since cookery was one of her minor passions. It was well-equipped, if not very large, Virtually any sort of fresh comestible could be summoned up from the central distributory of goods to the little domestic convenience station built into one of the kitchen walls. There was a solid waste disposal system there as well, much more efficient looking than the complicated ones at their flat in Concord or at the Midlothian country house. The machine evidently recycled nothing but seemed simply to convert all refuse to its elements. 
No doubt the accumulated dust and gases were then reassembled by the arcane creativity of the mysterious lords of the galaxy into tomorrow's fresh muskmelon, rivita, or leg of lamb. To say nothing of lipsticks, pocket handkerchiefs, and other smallish items, which could also be ordered up from the extensive menu of the distributory. Margaret checked the contents of the kitchen cabinet, and was happy to see that they had an ample supply of both Darjeeling and Spider-Leg teas, respectively the favorites of herself and Davy. She put a china teapot full of water into the microwave to boil, and sat down with a note plaque to make a grocery list. And then the back doorbell tinkled. Come in, she said absently, using the declamatory mode. The door opened, and then closed again. Margaret looked up with a puzzled frown, and then burst out laughing as the cloak of invisibility fell away. Well, of all things, whoever are you like a welcoming committee? Yes, said Hydra. This time its attack was swift and efficient. But before her mind was destroyed, she was able to utter a formless, far-spoken scream of agony on her husband's intimate mode, together with one single intelligible word, five. Paul came back to the apartment in Golden Gate very late, long after Mark was in bed and nearly asleep. Lucille was still there, playing five-card draw with Herta, the operant nanny, and Jackie, the non-operant housekeeper. Jackie was ahead by seventeen dollars. The two metas would never have dreamed of using their farsight to view the cards. Mark heard his father dismiss the two employees and ask Grandmère to stay for a moment. His voice had an abnormal timbre. Mark came fully awake, his far senses alert. Paul's composure was so shaken that he neglected to use Lucille's intimate mode, blurting out the terrible news on Claire, in ordinary mental speech. Miss Margaret, the magistratum reached me at Laura's place with the news. I rushed right over to Davy's apartment in Ponte di Rialto, but he wouldn't see me. He wouldn't see me. Paul, for the love of God, what's happened? Margaret, she's dead. Oh, no. There was a suicide note, handwritten. She said she couldn't take the pressure. Davy's nomination to the concilium, his candidacy for first magnate. She also said she couldn't bear to bring up their unborn child in a world dominated by non-humans. And then she evidently shorted out the fail-safe switch on the waste decompositor and climbed in 